The first chapter, Bump, about sea orismas, said Billy Bunter. He got no further. Five fellows, who had been walking and talking in the old quad of Greyfriars, suddenly broke into a run. Harry Wharton and company of the removed did not seem to want to hear about Christmas from Billy Bunter. They scudded. Billy Bunter blinked after them through his big spectacles in surprise and indignation. I say, you fellows, he roared. I say, don't clear off while a fellow's talking to you. I say, stop. But the famous five of the removed did not stop. They accelerated. Billy Bunter grunted angrily. Just before Greyfriars School broke up for the Christmas holidays, the fat owl of the remove was rather anxious to discuss the holes, but never had Billy Bunter's fascinating company been so little sought after. Fellows would turn corners, or slam study doors, or hell Latin grammars, when they saw Bunter coming. Getting fixed up for Christmas was rather difficult in these circumstances. Time was getting short now, and Bunter was anxious to get fixed up. Everybody else seemed to want to leave him unfixed. Beast, grunted Bunter. He rolled after the famous five, as they trotted away by the path through the frosty elms. I say, you fellows, he bawled. Bob Cherry looked back over his shoulder with a cheery grinning face. He's after us, he remarked. Trot on, said Harry Wharton, laughing. The trotfulness is the proper caper. Grinned Harry Jamset Ram Singh. Put it on terrifically, I say, you fellows. Ha ha ha. Billy Bunter put on a spurt. Really, he wanted to speak to these unsociable beasts before the bell went for third school. Put it on, chuckled Frank Nugent. Five sturdy and healthy juniors enjoyed a rapid sprint on a firm, frosty winter's morning. The fat owl of the remove, toiling in the rear, did not enjoy it. He had more weight to carry than any member of the famous five. In fact, as much as any two of them, looking back at the gusping, spluttering owl as they ran, with laughing faces, the chums of the remove trotted rapidly over the carpet of snow on the elm walk. It was because they were looking back just then, as they ran, that the unexpected happened. Certainly they did not suppose that any fellow was loafing about in that rather secluded spot, and if a fellow was there, there was no reason why he should not see them coming and step out of the way. But as it happened, a fellow was there, and he did not see them coming, neither did he hear them, as their footsteps made no sound on the soft snow. It was a senior, a fifth form man, who was there. It was Cedric Hilton, the slim, elegant, handsome dandy of the fifth. He was standing in the middle of the puff, with his back towards the cord, and his whole attention was concentrated on a letter he was reading. From the expression of concentrated thought on Cedric Hilton's face, and the deep wrinkle in his brow, it seemed that the letter contained matters of urgent import. Perhaps he had retired to that quiet spot to read it without danger of interruption. If so, he was rather unlucky, for he was interrupted. Suddenly, unexpectedly, and violently, crush. Before they knew he was there, the running juniors crashed into his back. Hilton of the fifth gave a startled yell and pitched forward on his hands and knees. The letter flew from his hand. The winter wind caught it and blew it a dozen feet away before it dropped into the snow. But Hilton was not thinking of the letter. He sprawled face down in the snow, with five startled and breathless removed fellows sprawling over him. What the thump? Gusped Bob Cherry. Who the dickens? Gurgled Johnny Ball. What the terrific thump? Oh, my hat. He, he, he. Came from Billy Bunter. The fat owl from a distance beheld the sprawling heap and chuckled. He, he, he. I say, you fellows. He, he, he. Bunter seemed amused. Hilton of the fifth was not amused. He turned a red and furious face on the juniors as he struggled in their midst. You young rotters. You, you, Grug. I'll, oog. He spluttered. I'll smash the lot of you. Geralf, oog. The breathless five scrambled up. Hilton dragged himself to his feet more slowly. He was breathless, smothered with snow, 
and seemed in a bad temper. Sorry, Gus Wharton, didn't see you. The sorrowfulness is terrific. What the thump did you stick in the way for? Demanded Johnny Ball. Your own fault. Hilton did not answer. Having recovered a little of his breath, he made a jump at the junior. Hook it. Chuckled Bob. Stop. Roared Hilton furiously as the five scudded on up the path. He rushed in fierce pursuit. Evidently Hilton of the fifth wanted vengeance and wanted it badly. He had had a nasty jar. There was no doubt about that. He was bumped and shaken and in a towering rage. He fairly raced after the removites. They flew. Really, it was rather kind of them to run for it. The five sturdy removites could have handled Hilton and handled him quite easily had they chosen so to do. But having already barged him over, they did not want to damage him any more. So they stamped on the gas, so to speak. Beast, Gus Bunter, at that rate of speed, the front owl of the remove had no chance of overtaking the fellows with whom he was so anxious to discuss the important question of the Christmas holiday. They vanished through the elms, with Hilton of the fifth in hot and fierce pursuit. Bunter could only hope that he would catch them and whop them all round. That would be some consolation. Meanwhile, he picked up the letter. The December wind had landed it within a couple of yards of him. Bunter's idea in picking up the letter was simply that which any fellow might have had of returning it to the owner. But it was like Bunter to look at it and read it, which, it was to be hoped at least, other fellows would not have done. As he blinked at Hilton's letter through his big spectacles, Bunter's little round eyes almost bulged through those big spectacles. Oh, crikey! He gasped. Had Hilton of the Fifth returned at that moment? No doubt Billy Bunter would have handed over the letter, but Hilton did not appear, and the owl of the remove shoved it into his packet and rolled back to the cord with quite an extraordinary expression out his fat face. The second chapter. Just like Coker. Stop them, said Coker of the Fifth. A who? Gasped Potter. Look, said Coker, and he pointed. Five juniors of the remove, rather red, and a little breathless, but apparently in cheery spirits, had burst from the leafless old elms and were sprinting along the gravel path, where Coker and his friends walked in state. After them, snow smothered, his hat gone, and his eyes gleaming with wrath, sprinted Hilton of the fifth. Potter and Green stayed at him. It was very unusual for Hilton, the elegant dandy of the fifth, to be in an excited state. Generally, he was cool and calm, and, in Coker's opinion, lackadaisical. Now he was neither cool nor calm, and anything but lackadaisical. Something evidently had happened to excite his wrath. My hat, Hilton's got his rag out, said Green. Looks as if he's been rolling in the snow. Stop them, repeated Coker. That was Coker all over. He strode into the way of the famous five to stop them. Horace Coker did not think much of Hilton. He considered him a drawling, lazy dandy and slacker, and had, indeed, more than once told him so. Still, he was a fifth for man, and so was Coker. If cheeky juniors had been ragging a fifth for man, Coker was the fellow to step in and see him righted. Coker was, in fact, the fellow to step into any trouble that came his way. I say, begun Potter. Don't jaw, do as I tell you. Snap Coker over his shoulder. Coker did not like argument. Potter and Green of the fifth did not jaw, but they did not do as Coker told them. They right-wheeled and marched off, leaving Coker on his own to deal with any trouble he might collect. It was nearly time for third school, with Mr. Prout anyhow, and they headed for the house. Coker, on his own, planted himself in the way of the running five. Stop, he shouted, holding up his hand. The famous five did not stop. Hilton was close behind, and vengeance spent. They did not want to handle Hilton, but they had no objection to handling Coker, if he wanted them to. Apparently he did. Charge, grinned Bob Cherry. The chargefulness is terrific. Botch him over. 
If Coker thought that his lifted hand and his commanding voice would stop the running removites, it was only one of Horace Coker's many mistakes. Instead of stopping, the chums of the remove rushed right at Coker. They charged in a bunch, and the burly Horace was swept fairly off his feet. Whoop! roared Coker as he went down. He grabbed wildly at the juniors. His grasp closed on Bob Cherry and was dragged down with him. Oh, Lego, you ass, gasped Bob, thump. Holding Bob with one hand, Coker thumped with the other. There was a terrific roar from Bob Cherry. Coker's thump was hard and heavy. Yarrow, rescue. He rolled over in deadly combat with Coker. They mixed with gravel and snow as they rolled. Hold on, rescue, panted Wharton. The famous five had intended to leave Coker for dead, as it were and race on to the house, but Coker had got hold of one, and the other four turned back promptly to the rescue. They held themselves and horse Coker in a body. Hilton was calling up fast, but they had a few moments. They put those few moments to the best use. Coker's grasp was dragged away from Bob. In the grip of five pairs of hands, he was rolled over on the path. Beside the path was a bank of snow recently swept up by Mr. Mimble, the gardener. Coker's head was shoved into it. He gurgled horribly as his features were buried in snow. Johnny Ball caught up a handful of gravel to shove down Coker's back. Bramp Nugent grabbed a handful of snow to shove after it. Hurry jumps at Rum Singh crushed Coker's hat on the back of Coker's head, driving his face yet deeper into the snow. Coker, in his present position, was favorably placed for smacking. Bob Cherry administered a tremendous smack on Coker's trousers that rang like a pistol shot. A gurgling roar came from horse. Harry Wharton grabbed up snow, needed a rapid snowball, and met Hilton as B tore up with a missile that squashed all over his face. The next moment Hilton was jumping at him. Smack! Wow! roared Wharton. Collar him. Hilton had no time for another smack. The whole company turned on him as one man. Owing to Coker's intervention, he had caught them, but it was rather like catching totters. In a few seconds, he wished that he hadn't. He hardly knew what happened in those hectic seconds. The famous five did not want to damage him. They thought they had damaged him enough, budging him over under the elms but he had to be stopped from smacking heads. They collared him, whirled him over, and appended him. If the burly, beefy coker had had little chance in the hands of the five, the slim and elegant Milton had less. Crush. Bump. He landed on coker's back as Horace struggled up out of the snow bank, flattening Horace down again. Arag, gurgled coker as Hilton crashed on him, and his rugged features were buried deep again. Ha ha ha, hook it. Harry Wharton and company resumed their sprint. They headed for the house, laughing breathlessly. Hilton, perhaps, might have pursued them farther, but he had no chance. Coker, twisting round in the snow, grabbed at him blindly and thumped wildly. With his eyes, nose, and mouth full of a mixture of snow and gravel, Coker could see nothing for the moment, but he could feel and he felt somebody bumping on him, and he grasped at that somebody and punched, blindly, but heftily. Wow! yelled Hilton, as he got the punch. Oh! You! I'll smash you! Splotted Coker. You cheeky fags! You young hooligans! I'll spifflicate you! I'll pulverize you! Take that! Oh! You fool! Lego! Oh! And that! You up! And that! Panted Coker, rolling over his adversary, and punching hard and punching often. And that, I'll teach you. I'll, oh, oh, yow, you mad fool, Lego. Yelled Hilton, struggling frantically in the powerful grasp of the hefty horse. And that, why, what, who? Coker blinked at Hilton, realizing that it was not a cheeky fight that he had in his grasp. Let go, you dummy, shrieked Hilton. Where are those fags? You blithering idiot. Coker let go and stayed round for the fags. They had vanished. Cedric Hilton staggered to his feet. 
Coker, still in a state of bewilderment, stayed blankly. He did not seem to expect what happened next, though really he might have expected it. Hilton, boiling with rage, hit out, and Coker went over as if a cannon shot had hit him. Once more Horace plunged headlong in snow. Cedric Hilton walked away to the house. He walked quickly. It had been a satisfaction to knock Coker down. It would not have been so satisfactory to wait for what would happen when Coker got up again. By the time Coker extracted himself from the snow and gathered his scattered wits once more, the dandy of the fifth had gone. The third chapter. The letter from Hilton Hall. Billy Bunter grinned. Third school for the remove that day was mathematics with Mr. Lascelles. Maths, as a rule, did not make remove follows grin. Us, rather made them frown, if not groan. But Bunter was grinning. Bunter was not giving a lot of attention to Larry Lascelles. He was not thinking of maths. He was thinking of the letter in his pocket. He had not seen Hilton of the fifth since picking up that lost letter. That letter interested Billy Bunter deeply. It was the cause of the grin that overspread his fat visage. Several fellows, observing that fat grin, grinned themselves, wondering whether it meant that the owl of the remove had succeeded at long last in fixing up for the Christmas holidays. If so, they did not envy the fellow he had fixed on. Mr. Lascelles, having turned his back on his class to chalk a diagram on the blackboard, Billy Bunter drew the letter from his pocket. Under the cover of his desk, surreptitiously, he read it through again. He wondered whether Cedric Hilton had missed that letter. Hilton, of course, was now in the fifth form with Prout. He could hardly have searched for the lost letter yet. When he searched for it, he was not likely to find it. Unless Billy Bunter chose, Bunter could imagine his feelings when he missed it and failed to locate it. It was not such a letter as the dandy of the fifth would have cared or dared to let anyone at Greyfriars see if he could have helped it. Serve him jolly well right, was Bunter's opinion. If a fellow chose to be a shady, blackguard and play ducks and drakes with the rules of the school and run the risk of getting the sack, serve him jolly well right to have a scare. Certainly, if that letter had fallen into the hands of Dr. Locke, it would have made the head open his eyes wide. Certainly it would have been followed by Hilton of the Fifth being called into the headmaster's study, and if the head went into the matter, as doubtless he would, it could hardly fail to be followed by certain facts coming to light with regard to the Fifth Form sportsman's manners and customs, which in turn would be followed, almost certainly, by the order of the boot for Cedric Hilton. Undoubtedly, it was a very remarkable and unusual letter for a Greyfriars fellow to receive. It ran, Hilton Hall, Blackmore, Devon. Dear Master Cedric, I regret to say that it is not in my power to accede to your request for a further loan of fifteen pounds. I doubt whether Sir Gilbert would ever forgive me if he became aware that I have advanced any sums to his son. He would, I am assured, be greatly incensed at an action which he would regard, and rightly, as unbecoming in his butler. I am bound to say that it has weighed on my mind. I suggest, sir, that you write direct to your father and explain to him your difficulties. Surely, sir, your debts are of such a nature that you can explain them to your father. Yours respectfully, Francis Walsingham. It was a dignified letter, with a sort of staid, respectable, upper servant dignity. Billy Bunter could picture the butler of Hilton Hall solid, portly, probably with a port wine complexion. He grinned. Then he gave a jump as Peter Todd wrapped him on a fat shoulder. He crumpled the letter hastily in his hand. Invitation for Christmas, old fat bean. Ask Toddy. Eh? Oh, yes. No. Stammered Bunter. Yes and no. Ask Peter. I mean yes. One of my many invitations, said Bunter. I've been fairly snowed under with them, Toddy, as you know. I don't know. Pointed out, Toddy, why? I've told you. That's why I don't know, Beast. Well, if somebody's asked you for the holes, perhaps you'll give us a rest in the remove.
grinned Peter. Molliver is looking quite weary and worn. Oh, really, Toddy? And Smithy's sworn to brain you with golf club if you put your head into his study again to speak about Christmas, beast. Who's the happy man? Asked Toddy. One of those St. Jim's fellows who are so fond of you. I don't think. Exactly, said Bunter. You know how pally I am with Dossie of St. Jim's. He's written to ask me for Christmas, and... And this is his letter. I'm not sure I shall go, though. The fact is, Toddy, that humble as your home is compared with Dossie's, I'd rather come home with an old pal. Mr. Lascelles glanced round from the blackboard. Are you talking in class, Bunter? Oh no, sir. Gus Bunter, I never open my lips, sir. I was only telling Toddy about a letter I've had from Tom Mary. Silence. Billy Bunter was silent. Mr. Lascelles turned to the blackboard again. Bob Cherry, who had caught Tom Mary's name, leaned over and tucked Bunter. You've heard from Tom Mary at St. Jim's? He asked. Yes, invitation for Christmas, you know. Said Bunter, blinking at him. We're rather pally, of course. It was Dossie a minute ago. Murmured Peter Todd. Billy Bunter started. I? I mean Dossie, he stammered. It's from Tom Dossie. I mean Arthur Augustus Dossie. My old pal at St. Jim's, you know. He's fearfully keen for me to come for Christmas. But I'm not going, Bob. I'm coming with you to Wharton Lodge. There'll be a fat porpoise found dead there, if you do. Remarked Bob, beast. Mr. Lascelles glanced round again. If there is any more talking, the class will be detained half an hour. He remarked. There was no more talking. Third school was over at last, and the remove were dismissed. Several fellows, as they went out, had a wary eye on Bunter, especially Lord Morliverer, who was leading quite a hunted life now that break-up was so near at hand. But Bunter, for once, did not seem keen on discussing the important and urgent question of the Christmas holes. In the remove, he rolled away towards the fifth form room. Mr. Prout was a few minutes later dismissing the fifth, and Bunter waited for them to come out. When they came he made a grab at Cedric Hilton's sleeve, as the dandy of the fifth passed him. I say, Hilton. He squeaked. Don't bother. Snapped Hilton. He was not looking in a good temper. Bunter can guess why. That letter from the butler of Hilton Hall was not calculated to make its recipient good-tempered. But I say, take your grubby paw off my sleeve, you sticky little cheeky tick. Exclaimed Hilton angrily. But I say, look here. Without waiting to hear what Bunter had to say, Hilton jerked his arm loose, grabbed Bunter by the collar, twirled him round, and planted a foot behind him. Yaru! roared Bunter as he flew. Hilton, with an angry grunt, walked on and left him to roar. The fourth chapter. Missing. Stephen Price of the fifth form followed Hilton into the quadrangle. There had been another fall of snow during third school, and the whole quad was a sheet of white. A number of juniors, with cheery shouts, were disporting themselves there, and snowballs were whizzing. A crowd of the removed doing battle with Temple, Dabney, and Co. the Fourth. Hilton frowned, and dodged whizzing snowballs, as he walked quickly across toward the old elms. Price, following him, had to hurry. He caught Hilton by the arm, as the dandy of the fifth turned into the elm walk. Hold on, said Price. What's the hurry, Cedric? I've dropped something along here. Don't delay me now, muttered Hilton. Well, I'll help you look for it, said Price. Look here, you haven't told me yet whether you've raised the wind. Hilton gave an angry laugh. No, he answered. We're both rather in a hole, then, said Price. And we've got to stay in it, said Hilton, shrugging his shoulders. I've tried my last resource and failed. The butler at home, yes, Hilton compressed his lips. The stodgy old ass. I've borrowed off him a dozen times at home in the holidays, and I thought, well, he sprung a fiver when I wrote a week or two ago. 
and I suppose it fed him up. I owe him some money, of course. Look here, muttered Price. Walsingham must get a good salary from your father, and there's Pickings too. In such a place as Hilton Hall, one of the wealthiest country houses in Devonshire, I'd bet a good deal that your father's butler has a nice little pile stacked away in the bank. I've seen him, and he looks a quite saving sort of man. Hilton shrugged his shoulders again impatiently. Well, he won't shell it out to me, he said. I asked him to lend me fifteen quids, that would have seen both of us through, and he's coughed up nothing but advice. He says it's on his mind that he's lent me money at all, without my father's knowledge. Price sneered. Bit late in the day for him to begin that, he said. He's done it, and a good many times too. Look here, Cedric, he can do it again. He's refused, said Hilton curtly. Do you think I'm going to ask a servant a favor twice? Make him, said Price. How can I make him, you ask? Sir Gilbert Hilton would sack him, ten to one, if he knew he'd been lending you money. I shouldn't wonder. I fancy that's what's worrying poor old Walsingham a little. Well, his place is worth fifteen pounds to him, said Price coolly. Give him a hint that Sir Gilbert will hear about it if he doesn't squeeze out the loan you want. Hilton stopped and stayed at his friend. He was deeply under Price's influence. Indeed, but for that precious Paul probably Hilton never would have doubled in blackguardism at all. But though Hilton could be led into reckless follies, for which he would have been expelled if found out, there was a limit. He stayed at Price, at first as if unable to believe that he was in earnest. Then, as he realized that the cad of the fifth meant what he said, Hilton's brows darkened blackly. You rotter, Price, he muttered. Look here, oh, shut up. Hilton tramped on through the coppet of snow towards the spot under the elms where the famous five had barged him over more than an hour ago. Price, scowling, followed him. Look here. Let me see the butler's letter, he muttered. It mayn't be as final as you think. You can see it when we find it, said Hilton. Help me to look for it. It's about here somewhere. Price gave a jump. Is that what you've lost? Yes. Why, you utter ass, said Price aghast. Suppose it was found, and seen. Is there anything in it to put a beak on the track? Lots, a lot about debt sand. Well, my hat, you must be a fool to let a thing like that lie about where anybody could pick it up. How could I help it, snapped Hilton. I was reading it here. I came here to be quiet. When a mob of removed kids rushed me over, and I must have dropped it. I forgot it for a minute while I cut after the young ruffians. Then that fool coker had to budge in, and then it was the bell, and I had to go into third school. But the letter must be here. We're the first out of the house to come across in this direction. For goodness sake, look for it. The wind may have blown it anywhere. Oh, rot, it's about here somewhere. The two fifth formers searched up and down the walk for the lost letter. More snow having fallen, it was rather difficult to trace the exact spot where Hilton had been barged over. But he found it at last. And they searched up and down and round about. The December wind, blowing up from the sea, was whistling among the old frosty trunks. Certainly so light an object as a letter might have been blown almost anywhere. At the same time, it might have been covered from sight by the fresh snowflakes. Hilton began to realize that finding that letter was not so simple a matter as he had supposed. Nothing being found on the path, they extended the search among the trees. But it was in vain, and after a quarter of an hour of vain stooping and peering and groping they met on the elm walk again, tired and peevish. Gone, said Price, covered up by the snow most likely, said Hilton. His face was pale and troubled. By God, if that letter is seen, tell me what's in it so near as you remember. I remember it pretty well. I'd read it three or four times, growled Hilton and he explained the contents of the letter from Francis Walsingham almost word for word. Price whistled. 
If that gets to the head, Cedric, you're as good as bunked, he said. How are you going to explain debts that you can't mention to your father? The head will want to know every single detail. You'll be up before him, and he'll get it all out of you from start to finish. Do you think I don't know that? Asked Hilton savagely. Don't tell me what I know better than you do. The letter's got to be found. If it had been in the envelope, it would have been different. Butted Price. Most fellows, picking it up and seeing your name on the envelope, would bring it to you without looking into it but an open letter. Oh, rot. Most fellows wouldn't read it. Some inquisitive fag might, perhaps, but a muster, I wonder. This is the spot where Prout takes his trot every day as regular as clockwork. If Prout found it, we've got to get hold of it, muttered Hilton. It must be here somewhere, right under our noses very likely. You say some thugs barged you over? Did one of them? No, they ran on, and I ran after them. They couldn't even have seen that I had a letter at all. Who were they? Orton and his gang in the remove. Oh. They cheeky young scoundrels, but they are not the sort to bag a fellow's letter. Certainly not to read it. That's all right. Was anyone else near? Hilton made an effort to remember. No. I don't think so. Oh yes, there was some fag cackling when they were rolling over me. That fat young ass bunter, I think. Bunter, repeated Price. Bunter of the remove. Sneaking little beast. I know he's been kicked a hundred times for spying into fellows' letters. If he spotted it, you can bet he's read it. Still, I don't see why he should walk off with it. Hilton uttered a startled exclamation. Oh, God. Bunter spoke to me when Prout let us out, grabbed at my arm when I came out of the form room. He wanted to speak to me. I, I wonder if he had the letter and was going to give it to me. If so, why didn't he? Well, how was I to know? I kicked him, sticking his grubby paw on my sleeve. Well, some fellows do hunt for all the trouble they can find. And no mistake, said Price, in disgust. Ten to one he picked up the letter and had it in his pocket for you. You can bet he's read it. He's that sort. But it looks as if he wanted to give it back to you. You'd better hunt up Bunter and Hilton did not need telling that. Without waiting for Stephen Price to finish, he ran down the path through the elms and cut across the quad towards the house. Here, look out, roared a dozen voices, Jer out of the way, yelled Bob Cherry, give that fifth form tick a few, shouted Johnny Ball, Hilton, in his hurry, rushed through the crowd of juniors who were snowballing in the quad. Two or three of them staggered as he rushed by and barged them. Harry Wharton slipped in the snow and fell, and Temple of the Fourth pitched over with a roar. Give him a few, yelled Frank Nugent. Cheeky tick. Fifth form swanking us, pelled him. Removeites and fourth formers who had been pelting one another with one accord ceased to do so and devoted all their attention to Hilton of the Fifth. A volley of snowballs crashed and smashed on him from all sides. Give him beans, shouted Harry Wharton, scrambling up. Give him jip. Gusp Temple of the Fourth, go it. Ha ha ha. Hilton staggered as he received the volleying. He slipped and sat down, and there was a roar of laughter. Snowballs pelted on him from all sides as he sat. Crush, smush, squash. Oh God. You young ruffians, I, I, I'll, gasped Hilton, give him some more. Go it. Ha, ha, ha. Hilton scrambled up, red with fury. The juniors, roaring with laughter, crowded round him, whizzing snowballs. Herbert Fernand Smith landed one on his chin. Peter Todd one in his eye. All over him snowballs smashed and squashed. He gave the merry juniors a fierce glare and cut away to the house. After him, shouted the bounder, ha ha ha, and laughing juniors and whizzing snowballs followed Hilton of the fifth till he dodged into the house and escaped. He was rather glad to get inside, the fifth chapter, bunter's backup, cheeky card, 
Said Billy Bunter in tones of deep and intense indignation. Say, what's biting you? Inquired Fisher T. Fish. They were the only fellows in the rug. Cold and frosty as it was, most of the removed preferred to be open spaces after class. But there was a big fire in the rug, and Billy Bunter gravitated to the fireside as a matter of course. Frousting over a fire appealed to the owl of the remove much more than snowballing in the quad. Fisher T. Fish, the junior from New York, had also sought the warmth of the fireside in the rug. He was seated at the table, with a sheet of paper covered with figures before him, a stump of pencil in his bony fingers and a thoughtful wrinkle in his bony brow. Fishy was making up his terms accounts, a process that Fishy generally enjoyed. On this occasion, however, the joy of that happy occupation was rather dashed. The sum of threepence seemed to be missing somehow. Fisher T. Fish prided himself on knowing where his money went and on being able to account for all his expenditure to the last halfpenny. So it was quite a worry to find that gap in his accounts. He must have spent that threepence, but he could not recall when and why. He could not, of course, have given it away. Giving anything away was against Fish's nature and training. Tracking down that elusive three pence Fisher T. Fish was very busy, and he had not even observed Bunter till that fat and fatuous youth broke the silence. Swanking cad, went on Bunter, or can it, grunted Fisher T. Fish, as he was the only person present, he supposed that Bunter was addressing him. What's biting you, you pie-faced geck? Kicking a fellow, said Bunter, rotten cad, I ain't kicked you yet that I know of, but I guess I soon will if you don't pack it up, grunted Fishy, eh? I wasn't talking to you, Fishy, said Bunter, blinking at the American junior through his big spectacles. I say, Fishy, what do you think of a fellow kicking a fellow, when a fellow had taken the trouble to pick up a fellow's letter and was going to give it back to a fellow? Fishy did not answer that question. He bent his bony brows over his accounts again. Cheeky card, said Bunter, swanking ass, you know. Well, he jolly well won't get it in a hurry now. He can whistle for it, see. Can't you quit chewing the rag when a guy's doing figures? Asked Fisher T. Fish. Hilton of the Fifth looked into the rag. He was in search of William George Bunter. As he spotted the fat figure in the armchair by the fire he came into the room, crossing over quickly to Bunter. Bunter sat upright in the armchair and blinked at him with a cold, disdainful blink. Bunter was wrathy. Really, he had some cause to be indignant. It was true that he had read Hilton's letter, which he had no business to do, but Hilton did not know that. Did not know that he had the letter at all. Hilton had kicked him for grabbing his spotless sleeve with a grubby, sticky paw, as no doubt any other fifth form senior might have done. Still, considering why Bunter had stopped him coming away from the fifth form room, it was rather unfortunate. Bunter had been going to return that letter. Now he wasn't going to. He would, as he elegantly expressed it to himself. See Hilton blowed first. Oh, here you are, Bunter, said Hilton. I've been looking for you. Did you pick up a letter of mine in the quad this morning? Bunter did not answer. He blinked at Hilton through his spectacles, first at his feet, then at his face, then at his feet again, then once more at his astonished face. This was what Bunter called looking the fellow up and down. It expressed withering contempt and disdain. Deaf, snapped Hilton. You needn't speak to me, said Bunter. What do you mean, you young ass? exclaimed Hilton angrily. I mean exactly what I say answered Bunter coolly. You can go and oak coke, Hilton. If you've lost a letter, go and look for it. I suppose you don't expect remove fellows to pick up your letters for you. I asked you if you picked it up. Snapped Hilton. Did you? Find out. Answered Bunter. What? Roared Hilton. Billy Bunter heaved himself out of the armchair. He stood prepared to dodge round that chair if Hilton proceeded to active measures. I said find out. He answered, if you're asking for a thrashing bunter, all right. Said bunter, 
You lay your finger on me, that's all. You've kicked me. Well, you kick me again. I'll kick you all round the room. Do, said Bunter defiantly, but at the same time preparing to dodge. Do, you rotter. I dare say you'd like your foremaster to see that letter. He, he, he. Prout would be interested. Hilton, who was about to grasp at the fat junior, dropped his hand suddenly. Then you've got the letter. He breathed. Find out. You've read it. I hope I'm not the fellow to read a fellow's letter, said Bunter with dignity. That's an insult, Hilton. If you've come here to insult me, you'd better go. I'm not going to be insulted by a fellow who borrows money from his father's butler, Hilton panted. Those words, of course, were a proof that Bunter had picked up the letter and that he had read it. Hilton had no father to seek. Obviously, Bunter had the letter. Give me my letter. He breathed. What letter? Asked Bunter calmly. You know you picked up my letter in the quad. A fellow may have picked up a letter, and a fellow may not. Said Bunter cheerfully. A fellow may have come to give it to you, and you may have kicked him. Like a cheeky, swanking fifth form card. Well, if a fellow kicks a fellow, he can't expect a fellow to do him favors, finding letters for him and all that. If you've lost a letter, you'd better go and look for it. I'm jolly well not going to bother about it for you. You've got it. Roared Hilton. Yeah. Retorted Bunter. Will you give me my letter? Hissed Hilton. If a fellow found a letter, a fellow would want to make sure whose letter it was before he gave it to anybody. Said Bunter. Well, suppose I found a letter about a fellow borrowing money from his father's butler. Is that the sort of letter you mean? Wall, I swow. Ejaculated Fisher T. Fish, looking on and listening with the keenest interest. His interest in this extraordinary interview was so keen that Fish even forgot the threepence he had been trailing down through his accounts. Hilton glared round at him. Get out. He snapped. He did not want Fish's long, keen ears to lap up this sort of information. Hey, what? Ejaculated Fish at E. Fish. This here is our room, ain't it? I guess I ain't famousing the ranch, nunk. Fishy was indignant. Really? It was hardly reasonable for a senior to butt into the junior room and order a junior to get out of it. But Hilton of the Fifth was angry, excited, apprehensive and in no mood to be reasonable, he turned on Fisher T. Fish and grabbed him by the collar. Here, you let up, yelled the indignant Fishy. Wake snakes, I'll say this is the limit. I'll say it's the bee's knee. I'll say Yarub. Fisher T. Fish roared as he spun out of the rug and sat down with a bump in the passage outside. Hilton slammed the door on him and then strode back to Bunter with clenched fists and gleaming eyes. You've got my letter. You've read it. He punted. Give it to me at once, at once, or I'll smash you. At the sixth chapter, Rathy. Billy Bunter quaked. He was scared. Hilton of the fifth was generally good-tempered and easygoing. Too lazy and callous, in fact, to get into violent tempers. But like most weak and irresolute characters, he was capable of sudden bursts of passionate anger. At the present moment his face was pale with rage, his eyes glinting. The fear of that telltale letter falling into Dr. Locke's hands and causing an inquiry into his debts and difficulties was bad enough. But to a proud fellow like Hilton, it was even worse for his discreditable transactions to be known to the school especially to the juniors. He could imagine the surprise, the mockery, the derision if it became known that he had been borrowing money of his father's butler, and Bunter, the tattler and chatterbox of Greyfriars, had read the letter and knew it all, and he was keeping the letter. Hilton was in a mood and a temper to give the fat owl of the remove such a handling as he had never had before in all his fat career. His look was so terrifying that Bunter squeaked with alarm and bolted round the long table in the rug. The fifth form man rushed after him. As a rule, Bunter would have had no more chance in a foot race with a slim, 
a Chow Hilton than a tortoise in race with a hare, but fear lent bunter wings, so to speak. He fairly flew. Hilton pursued him fiercely round one end of the table, bunter raced round the other end. Such speed did the terrified Fudal put on that he kept his distance, and Hilton halted, panting, with the long oaken table still between them. He glared at Bunter across it. I, I say, keep off, you beast, gasped Bunter. I say, I haven't got that letter. I never picked it up in the cord. I wasn't on the spot at all when I was there. I mean, when I wasn't there. And I came to give you the beastly letter back. You know I did. Keep off, you beast. Give it me now. Hilton leaned over the table. He could not reach Bunter, but he was preparing to clamber across and bag him. It was a fearfully undignified proceeding for a fifth form man, especially so proud and haughty a fifth form man as Cedric Hilton, but he had forgotten all about dignity now. At any moment a crowd of juniors might come swarming into the rack. It was unusual for the room to be deserted. Only the snowball battle was keeping all the fellows out of the house. Hilton was wild with impatience to get hold of the lost letter while he had Bunter to himself. Bunter watched him warily. He dared not bolt for the door. Hilton would have overtaken him before he reached it, but he was ready to dodge. Well, you beast, you kicked me, he gasped. I was going to give you the letter, wasn't I? I spoke to you, and beast... Hilton came sprawling across the table. Billy Bunter popped down, dodged under, and shot through under the table with wonderful activity. By the time Hilton landed, on one side Bunter popped up on the other, spluttering for breath and crimson with exertion. The long oak table was still between them. I, I, ow. Panted Hilton, beast. You keep off, Gus Bunter, you young scoundrel, roared Hilton. I'll take you to your form master for keeping my letter. Yes, you'd like a beat to see it, wouldn't you? Grinned Bunter. I don't think. Let's go to the head about it. What? He he he. The doors of the rag opened. The angry, bony face of Fisher T. Fish glade in. You mudwomp. The old Fisher T. Fish. You figure that you can boost a guy out of his own quarters. What? You figure, oh, jumping Jess, I thought. Fishy backed out and slammed the door hastily, as Hilton made a stride at him, with a furious face. The fifth former turned back, panting, to Bunter. That fat youth retreated along the farther side of the long table, watching him warily through his big spectacles. Will you give me that letter? Panted Hilton. No, I won't, said Bunter, watchful and wary. In the first place, I haven't got at it. I don't know anything about it. What should I know about your rotten letters from men servants? You blithering fat idiot. You've admitted that you've got it. You said you came to give it back to me. So I did. Said Bunter, and what thanks did I get? You kicked me. I never knew you had the letter. If you'd given it to me, well, I was going to give it to you, wasn't I? Said Bunter, I was going to speak to you first. That's all. One good turn deserves another. Hilton made a move to circumnavigate the table. Bunter made a corresponding move. Never had the fat owl been so wary. The fifth form man paused again. So did Bunter. You couldn't let a fellow speak. Went on Bunter, kicking a fellow before he could open his mouth. I, I'm sorry I kicked you. Now give me the letter. Throw it across the table. That's all very well, said Bunter. But I've got a pain. You kicked me. You wouldn't let a fellow speak. You won't let a fellow speak now. What do you mean, you fat idiot? Well, one good turn deserves another, said Bunter. I pick up letters for you. Letters that would get you sacked if the head saw them, as you know jolly well. I do it out of sheer good nature. This is the thanks I get. Suppose the head had bagged it, or your beak, Prout. Where would be? Well, I think one good turn deserves another. I've been disappointed about a postal order. What? Postal order? I was expecting it from one of my titled relations, explained Bunter. It hasn't come. Will you give me that letter? Do let a fellow speak. 
The postal order was for five shillings, said Bunter. I think you might lend me the five shillings. One good ten deserves another, as I said. That's what I was going to say to you when you came out of the form room, and instead of letting a chap speak you kicked me. You, you, you young scoundrel, I, gusped Hilton. He understood now. You want me to tip you five bob for picking up my letter? Oh, really, Hilton? I hope I'm not a fellow to be tipped, exclaimed Bunter indignantly. If that's the rotten way you're going to put it, you may as well drop the subject. You, you, you. I don't see why a fellow shouldn't lend a fellow five bob when a fellow does a fellow a favor, finding lost letters for him, and all that, said Bunter. I shall hand you the postal order as soon as it comes. That's understood. If you think I'd take money, Bunter broke off with a gasp of alarm as Hilton made a fierce rush round the table. Bunter went round the opposite end like lightning. After him raced Hilton of the fifth. Twice round the tong table they went, like a game of the mulberry bush. The speed that the fat owl of the remove put up was amazing, considering the weight he had to carry. But the active fifth form man gained. His outstretched fingers were almost touching Bunter's fat shoulder, when the owl of the remove, in sheer desperation, made a bolt for the door. The door flew open again as Bunter rushed for it. Fisher T. Fish's indignant howl was heard. I'm telling you, he slung me out. Slung me out on my neck. A fifth form guy stinging a galoot out on his neck. I'll say, rescue. Yelled Bunter. I say, you fellows, help. Hilton was fairly on him, but there was help at hand now. Fisher T. Fish had gathered the clans, so to speak. Six or seven removed fellows had arrived, all in a state of wrath and indignation at the bare idea of a fifth form man throwing his weight about in the junior quarters. Hallo, 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 roared Bob Cherry. Yaro, yelled Bunter as Hilton grabbed him. Help, pile in, shouted the bounder, collar him, shouted Squiff, down with the fifth, kick him out. The removites did not stay to ask questions. They collared Hilton of the fifth right and left. He was dragged away from Bunter and bundled headlong out of the rug. Billy Bunter leaned on the table and gasped, but he grinned as he gasped. Hilton, perhaps, was not anxious to explain how matters stood, considering what was in that letter. But if he had wanted to explain, he had no chance. The removites handled him promptly effectively, and thoroughly. He went rolling along the passage, in a disheveled heap, panting and gasping, gurgling and spluttering, his collar torn, his tie streaming, his hair a tousled mop. If any man in the fifth fancied that he could throw his weight about in the rug, the remove were quite keen to demonstrate to him that he couldn't. They made that abundantly clear to Cedric Hilton. He was deposited at the end of the passage in a gurgling heap. There was an elephantine tread as Mr. Prout, the master of the fifth, rolled up. What, what, what? Boom Prout, with a rapid pattering of feet. The juniors bolted back to the rug. Hilton was in no state to bolt. He rolled at Prout's feet, gurgling. Prout stayed down at him. Hilton, Gorg, this is disgraceful, Hilton, and paralleled. A fifth form boy indulging in horseplay in the passages with a crowd of lower boys. I'm shocked. I am ashamed. Hilton, are you not ashamed of yourself? Wag, rise, hooted Prout. Take two hundred lines of Virgil, Hilton. Go, sir, go and make yourself more presentable. You are in a disgraceful state. Upon my word, a boy of my form, a senior form, go. And Hilton, gasping, went. The seventh chapter. What about Christmas? Christmas. Billy Bunter paused as he heard that. Bunter was coming along the removed passage, heading for the stays, at tea time. The door of study now. One was half open, and the voice from within came clearly to Bunter's fat ears. Bunter was interested, deeply interested, in any discussion in that study referring to Christmas. And he had no objection, none whatever, to hearing what was not intended for his fat ears. So he paused and listened. The famous five were all there. 
They generally teed together in that study. Apparently, they were discussing the holes. A very interesting question, indeed, to Billy Bunter. Bunter was still unfixed for the holes. Lord Molivera, driven to plain English, had told him that if he mentioned Christmas to him again, he would kick him from one end of the removed passage to the other. Regretfully, Bunter had had to give up the idea of passing the festive season at Molivera Towers. It was doubtful whether even Peter Todd's humbler abode in Bloomsbury would be open to him. According to Toddy, it wouldn't be. Bunter had told Ogilvy that he rather liked the idea of a Christmas up in Scotland. He had told Morgan that he rather liked the idea of a Christmas in Wales. But the answers of Ogilvy and Morgan had been far from encouraging. In fact, those answers had decided Bunter not to honour either Scotland or Wales. It was all the more annoying, because everybody else seemed to share that extraordinary lack of enthusiasm for Bunter's company. Bunter knew that his presence was enough to make any Christmas party a success, but nobody shared that knowledge with him. It really looked as if it would have to be Bunter Court. A nothing, Bunter Court, of course, would have been all right. As right as rain, if it had been anything like Bunter's descriptions of it. Unfortunately, on close inspection Bunter Court dwindled into Bunter Villa. Bunter did not yearn for home, sweet home. Harry Wharton and company were his last resource. And these beasts, after all Bunter had done for them, did not seem keen. In fact, they would rush off if Bunter rolled up and mentioned Christmas. It's rather rotten, you men, went on Wharton's voice. My uncle and aunt fully intended to be home for Christmas, but Aunt Amy isn't so well, and my uncle's written that he doesn't think she'd better travel in winter, and so that's that. Oh, law, murmured Bunter in the passage. He was aware that Wharton's aunt had been abroad for her health, and that her brother, the old colonel, was with her. If they were not returning to Wharton Lodge before Christmas, evidently the usual festivities would not take place there, and Bunter was dished. The rottenfulness is terrific, my esteemed Wharton, remarked Harry Jamset Ram Singh, and Bob's father, being away over the car race business, said Nugent, he won't be back for weeks, said Bob Cherry, and the mate is going to stay with her people, otherwise it... Oh, law, murmured Bunter again. Cherry Place, it seemed, was no more available than Wharton Lodge. Harry Wharton laughed. We are rather at a loose end, he said. Of course, I thought it was all clear when I asked you fellows to Wharton Lodge. We could all land on Johnny, if his uncle wasn't laid up. But I'd be glad, of course, said Johnny Ball. But it would be a bit dismal, with illness in the house. Well, there's little me left, said Frank Nugent. The only thing is, you'll have to come to me. I'll make Dicky behave himself. Somehow, you people have a crowd anyhow, and they don't want to be landed with such a mob, said Harry doubtfully. It's too thick. It's all right, said Frank. Oh, crikey, murmured Bunter. Bunter knew that it was close quarters at Nugent's home at Christmas, with his brothers and his sisters, his uncles and his aunts. No doubt his hospitable parents would squeeze in his school friends if he asked them, but it was pretty certain that Bunter would never be squeezed in. Billy Bunter saw his last chance vanishing. Look here, all you fellows will have to come home with me, declared Frank. I can fix it. All right. I don't say it won't be a crush. It will. But the more the merrier. Billy Bunter blinked in at the door. I say, you fellows. Hello, hello, hello. How did Bunter know we had mince pies? Asked Bob. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, really, Cherry? Where will you have it? Asked Bob, picking up a mince pie and taking aim. You say the word Christmas, and you get it in the eye. Bunter gave a disdainful sniff. After what he had heard outside the door, he had no further desire to discuss the Christmas holidays with the famous five. Evidently there was nothing doing. I've just looked in to tell you that I can't come with you for Christmas, Wharton. That's all, he said loftily. Thanks, said Harry, laughing. 
sorry, and all that. But it can't be done, said Bunter. I'd stretch a point and give you some of my time, if I could. But dash it all, you can't expect it from a fellow who simply rushed with invitations. If you've been counting on me, I'm sorry, but you'll have to wash it out. Harry Wharton and company stayed blankly at the fat owl of the remove. This was quite unexpected. Well, my hat, said Bob. Hurry, jump set, rum, sing, chuckled. The esteemed bunter has been eavesdropping dolefully and knows that the absurd festivities are off, he remarked. Oh, really? In kai oh, exclaimed Wharton, as he understood. You fat, fudgeous fat head, oh, really, Wharton? I never heard a word you fellows were saying in the study, said Bunter. I hope I'm not the fellow to listen out a door. I merely want you to understand, quite clearly, that you can't have me for Christmas. I was thinking of it, but it won't do. You can cram in at Nugent's little place, if you like, added Bunter, with a sneer. Hardly good enough for me. Kick him, somebody, said the captain of the remove, beast. I'd ask you to bunt a court. Went on the owl of the remove thoughtfully, but it would hardly do. We shall have some rather distinguished company there, a lot of titled people, and probably one or two of the princes. I could hardly ask you fellows, ha ha ha. Blessed if I see anything to cackle at. Snorted Bunter, I say, those mince pies look all right. I've got one for you, said Bob. Stand steady. Bunter kept a wary eye on the mince pie in Bob's hand. I haven't come to tea, he said with dignity. As it happens, I'm going to tea in the fifth. Some fellows can go to tea in senior studies. Still, I'll have one of those mince pies. Here you are, said Bob. Whiz. Bunter was wary, but not quite wary enough. A fat and flaky mince pie squashed on his fat little nose. Yup, roared Bunter. Goal. Ha ha ha. Oh. Beast. Wow. Gorog. Have another, asked Bob. Billy Bunter made a backward jump out of the study. Apparently he did not want another. Beast. Roared Bunter. You come out here, Bob Cherry, and I'll jolly well mop up the passage with you. Coming. Bob rose from his chair. There was a patter of retreating feet in the removed passage. By the time Bob reached the door, Bunter had reached the stays, having apparently changed his mind about mopping up the passage with Bob. Bob grinned and kicked the door shut. He was resumed in study now. One, and the discussion of the question of the Christmas holidays, a question that was rather a problem, and that was to be solved in a way of which the famous five, as yet, had not the remotest idea. It was the unexpected, the very unexpected, that was going to happen that Christmas. At the eighth chapter, a case of conscience, he's coming, muttered Price of the fifth. Stephen Price glanced out of his study doorway along the fifth form passage. Coming along by the game study was a fat figure. Price stepped back. It's all serene, he said, with a half-contemptuous glance at Cedric Hilton's clouded face. He'll be here in a minute. We'll have that letter off him in a few ticks after he's in the study. I'm dashed if I like the idea of asking a sneaking fag to tea to grab him when he gets into the study, grunted Hilton. Price sneered. Well, you didn't ask him to tea. I did. The fat scoundrel would go anywhere for a feed. I don't think we need be very particular in dealing with a young rotter who reads other fellows' letters and pinches them. Well, now, that's so, agreed Hilton. Anyhow, we've got to have it. If he shows that letter about among the other fags, I shall be cackled to death. Borrowing money of a butler, by gad, it would be a standing joke all over the school. Other worse than a joke if Prout or the head got hold of it, said Price. You'd be bunked so quick, it would make your head swim. There was a fat grunt outside the study. Billy Bunter had arrived. Price opened the door wide, and the fat junior rolled in. Stephen Price closed the door as soon as he was in the study and put his back to it. Hilton grinned faintly. If Bunter meant to keep that letter, as it seemed that he did, his obtuseness in accepting an invitation to tea in Hilton's study was rather remarkable. 
It was true that, as Price said, Bunter would go anywhere for a feed. Still, even the Fatal might have realized that Hilton's study was a dangerous quarter for him in the circumstances. He seemed quite assured and at ease, however. Taking no notice of Price's action in backing against the door, he nodded cheerily to the fifth formers. Not late. What? asked Bunter. That's all right, said Price grimly. I can't really get away at tea time, you know, said Bunter. Fellows want me to tea with them, the men in study know. One were pressing me to stay and help them with a lot of mince pies they've got. But I told them I couldn't stop, as I was teeing in the fifth. I say, like me to help to get it. I'm rather a dab at cooking and all that. He blinked at the study table. There was no sign of tea. That will do, said Price gruffly. I've asked you here. To tea, said Bunter. For Hilton's letter, hand it over. What letter? No good beating about the bush. You've got Hilton's letter, and you're going to hand it over, here and now, or I'm going to whop you with a fives bat till you do, said Price coolly. He picked up a fives bat from the bookcase. His expression showed that he was quite ready to suit the action to the word. Somewhat to the surprise of the fifth four men, Billy Bunter did not seem alarmed. He kept a wary eye on the fives butt, but a wide grin overspread his fat face. Think I've got the letter on me? He asked. What? Ejaculated Price and Hilton together. He he he. Bunter chuckled. He was an ass. More fool than rogue. But he was not quite ass enough to bring that letter into Hilton's study when he did not intend to hand it over to its owner. Bunter, to do him justice, had fully intended to give Hilton back the letter. He had considered that Hilton might lend him five bob in return for that service. Little enough, too, Bunter thought, when that letter was enough to get the fellow sucked from Greyfriars and into a fearful row with his pater at home if it came to light. But Billy Bunter's ideas and views had changed since then. Hilton had kicked him, and he was hurt and Hilton's almost frantic anxiety to regain possession of that dangerous letter had made it more and more clear to Bunter's fat mind now how very dangerous that letter was. Bunter was not going to be kicked for nothing, if he could help it, and he was not going to be in a hurry to part with the power that chance had placed in his hands. If Hilton didn't like it, he could lump it. He shouldn't be in such a hurry to kick a chap who was doing him a good turn. That was how Bunter argued it out. He grinned cheerfully as the two fifth formers glared at him as if they could have eaten him. It dawned upon them that Bunter, fool as he undoubtedly was, was not such a fool as he looked. Price had asked him to tea in the study, without a doubt, that the letter would be in his pocket. Evidently he had taken too much for granted. Oh God, muttered Hilton, you young rascal. Price's grip closed almost convulsively on the handle of the fives bat. Where's that letter? If Hilton's lost a letter, said Bunter calmly, all he's got to do is to put a notice on the board. That's what a fellow does when he loses anything. If he thinks I've got it, he can take me to the head. I'm willing to go. Hilton drew a deep breath. I'll give you five shillings for that letter, Bunter. He said, keep it said Bunter. You told me in the rug. I told you nothing of the sort. I said that I would be willing to accept a loan of five shillings, as I'd been disappointed about a postal order. That's quite different. Hilton breathed hard. Well, put it like that, he said. Bring me the letter, and I'll lend you five shillings. After kicking a chap, sneered Bunter. You're too jolly handy with your boot, Hilton. If you think you can kick a chap just as you like, because you're in the fifth, you're jolly well mistaken. See, Price made a movement. You can keep that fives butt to yourself. Price, said Bunter coolly, you won't get the letter. You touch me with that fives butt. And that letter goes straight to Dr. Locke. Price looked as if he were going to touch Bunter with a fives butt and touch him hard. All the same, Hilton hastily interposed. Chuck it, Pricey. That's no good. Look here, Bunter, don't be a dishonorable little beast. Well, I like that. 
said Bunter derisively. I haven't borrowed money of a butler anyhow. I don't owe a lot of money I can't pay and chance it. If I owe a few little amounts here and there, I shouldn't mind the head knowing. Would you like him to know what you owe and where you owe it? He, he, he. I'll smash him, breathed Price. Do, jeered Bunter. You'll be up before the head along with Hilton. You're pretty well known to be hand in glove. You and Hilton and Walker and Con of the sixth and loader too. Once the head gets on the track, I dare say he'll root out the whole gang. He, he, he. Don't touch him, muttered Hilton. Price laid down the fives, but his face was bit unvicious. But, in point of fact, he dared not touch the fat and fatuous junior who held the whip hand. That fatal letter spelled danger for Price, as well as his comrade. What might come out if Hilton was once up before the beak? Grimly and closely questioned about those mysterious debts that he could not tell his father about. In his mind's eye, Price saw the whole story of dingy black godism coming to light. The sack for Hilton, probably for himself, perhaps for their friends in the sixth. Billy Bunter chuckled. The mere fact that he was not thrashed on the spot, as he richly deserved, showed him how strong was the power in his hands. He was not the fellow to pot with it now that he realized it clearly. What do you want? Bunter, asked Hilton at last. I've come here to tea, answered Bunter calmly. Naturally, I want tea. I've refused a lot of fellows in the remove to come here to tea with you. I suppose you're going to stand a fellow tea after asking him. Price clenched his hands almost wildly. Hilton gave him a bitter, sarcastic look. This is what's come of your precious cleverness. He said we're as far as ever from getting the letter. That young scoundrel means to stick to it if he can. Where is it, Bunter? In my study. Answered Bunter coolly. Hocked in a safe place, too. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that letter. I've got my conscience to consider. What? Some fellows are conscientious, said Bunter. Not in the fifth, I dare say. I've always been a bit particular in such things. The head would bunk you if he knew. You can't expect an honorable chap to stand between you and what you've asked for. It's practically making me as bad as yourself. Hilton gazed at him. Certainly it had not occurred to him that Bunter was acting conscientiously in this matter. He was unaware of the mysterious way in which Bunter's fat intellect moved its wonders to perform. A fellow has to have his duty clear before he can decide, went on the conscientious Bunter. What worries me is that I think it's my duty to place that letter before the head and let him judge for himself. At the same time, I want to be as easy as I can with you, Hilton. You're not a bad chap, and I've heard the fellows say that it's Price who's led you into being a rotter like himself. I shall have to think the matter over. I can say, at least, that I'll go as easy with you as I can. Hilton almost choked. The look on his face warned the conscientious bunter that he had better not pile it on further. But never mind that now, said Bunter briskly. I've come here to tea. Let's have tea and talk it over like, like pals. What? The expressions on the faces of Hilton and Price indicated exactly how pally they felt. But there was no help for it. And they had tea. Bunter, at least, enjoyed the tea. It was quite a nice tea. And Bunter disposed of the lion's share and enjoyed it. He charted cheerily over tea. The fact that his hosts had little or nothing to say did not worry Bunter. He talked enough for three. After tea, however, the chilly atmosphere of the study did not tempt Bunter to linger. Having cast a final blink over the table and ascertained that there was nothing more to eat, he rose to go. Thanks for the feed, he said airily. I'll drop in again to tea, Hilton, if I can find an opportunity. I'll try to find one tomorrow. Ta-ta, old beans. Bunter rolled away, happy and sticky and grinning. Hilton kicked the door shut after him and looked at Price. What are we going to do? He muttered. Stephen Price shrugged his shoulders. He did not see that there was anything that could be done. At the ninth chapter, Bunter makes up his mind. Hilton Hall, eh?
Decent sort of show, said Bunter. Hardly up to Bunter Court, I dare say, but fairly decent. Peter Todd looked at him. A fellow might do worse, argued Bunter. It was the following day, with breakup so close at hand. All the fellows were thinking of the Christmas holidays, and Billy Bunter's thoughts were concentrated on that subject more than any other fellows, for Billy Bunter was still unfixed. What he had heard in study now, one had rendered him more unfixed than ever, for that resource was quite cut off now. When he joined Peter in the quad after morning classes, Peter was quite prepared to hear that Bunter had decided on Bloomsbury. He was also prepared to disabuse Bunter's mind of that idea in the plainest of plain English. But other thoughts, it seemed, were in Bunter's mind. Ever been to Devonshire, Peter? He asked. Ever seen Blackmore? Yes, I've seen it, answered Peter. Got friends there? Well, yes, said Bunter. What are they in for, eh? Bunter blinked at him. What do you mean, you ask? I suppose they're in for something or they wouldn't be in Blackmore, said Peter. It's a prison, isn't it, you silly ass? hooted Bunter. I don't mean Blackmore prison, I say. Is Hilton Hall near the convict prison at Blackmore? Blessed if I know. It can't be many miles from it. If it's at Blackmore, answered Peter. If you've got friends there, can't you tell a fellow what they're in for? Oh, don't be a goat, grunted Bunter. I was speaking of Hilton Hall at Blackmore. I believe it's a decent sort of show. Hilton's father is a baronet and keeps up some style. I've heard fellows say they have a big time there at Christmas. Hilton's one of the wealthiest fellows in the fifth, though he happens to be hard up just now. How do you know? Oh, we've got rather pally, said Bunter. I think a fellow might have a decent time at Hilton Hall for the holes. What do you think, Toddy? Toddy could only stare. You don't mean that you're trying to stick Hilton of the fifth for Christmas? He ejaculated. Oh, really, Toddy? Hilton's a bit of an ass, said Toddy. He lets that worm, Price, sponge on him and land him in scrapes. But he's not ass enough to let you hook onto him for the holes. Old fat man, forget it. Yeah, retorted Bunter. He rolled away leaving Peter chuckling. Bunter's idea was that he had, at long last, solved his difficult problem. He blinked round the quadrangle and spotted Hilton of the fifth, walking by himself near the elms. Hilton's handsome face was clouded. It was not money troubles that worried him now. That morning he had received a handsome Christmas tip by post from one of his many wealthy relatives. That tip had relieved the dandy of the fifth from financial pressure. He was able to clear up his little accounts at the Three Fishers and lend Price a helping hand in doing the same. But there was a more troublesome trouble on his mind. The missing letter. How to get that letter back from Bunter was a problem which the sportsman of Greyfriars had not been able to solve. His face lighted a little as he saw the fat junior rolling up to him. He had a momentary hope that the young rascal had decided to let him have the letter. He restrained his intense desire to kick Bunter across the quad and gave him a nod. Bunter nodded and grinned cheerily. Break up soon now, Hilton, he remarked breezily. Eh? Yes, taking anybody home with you for the holes. What the deuce has that to do with you? Snapped Hilton. I, I mean, yes. Price is coming with me. Price, repeated Bunter, frowning a little. Can't say I like the fellow. Still, I dare say I could stand him, if you make a point of it. Hilton stared at him. What on earth do you mean? He grunted irritably. Look here, Bunter, I want you to give me that letter. Be a decent chap. I hope I'm a decent chap, said Bunter, with dignity. A bit more decent than a fellow who owes money up Hobbs and... Will you give me that letter, breathed Hilton. I was thinking of giving it to you for, for a Christmas present, said Bunter. What about that? Don't be a silly ass. I shan't be seeing you till next term, said Hilton. Give me the letter now. The fact is, old chap, Hilton made a convulsive movement, and Bunter hastily backed away. Old chap, 
From the fat owl of the remove was a little too much for the dandy of the fifth form. The fact is, old chap, repeated Bunter, watching him warily. I'm rather at a loose end for the holes. I've decided not to go with Mowley. He bores a fellow so. Smithies urged me to go with him, but he's a bit of a bounder. Not my class, really. Wharton's people have let him down, so that's washed out. I've got a lot of other invitations, of course. Still, I can give you a few days, if you were keen on it, you fat fool. Oh, all right, said Bunter. If you don't want me, I'd rather you said so. All right. He turned away. Look here, Bunter, you born idiot. I, sorry I can't stop to talk. I've got to go and see the head. Hold on. Look here. I can't ask you home for Christmas. Of course I can't, muttered Hilton. Don't be a silly ass. A remove fag. Don't be a silly idiot. Look here. I'm in funds again, and I'll give you a pound for that letter. Billy Bunter's eyes gleamed behind his spectacles. Even Bunter had his limit, and he was not coming down to that. That's enough, said Bunter cuttingly. I suppose a shady blackguard like you, Hilton, doesn't understand a decent chap. Keep your putrid money. Think I'd touch it. Will you give me that letter? Gusped Hilton. No, I won't. I thought that matter out, and I think that the head ought to see it. Now leave a follow alone. And Bunter turned his back on Hilton of the Fifth and started towards the house with his fat little nose in the air. Hilton stood staring after him. Then, his temper suddenly failing him, he made a rush after the fat junior and grasped him by the collar. Oh! roared Bunter. Lego! Bang! Bunter's fat head banged on the trunk of the nearest elm. It was quite a hard bang. It did not damage the elm, but to judge by Bunter's fearful roar, it damaged Bunter. Yarrow! Bang! Oh crikey! There, you young rascal! panted Hilton. Take that, and that, bang. Whoop, yow oh whoop. I say, yo, roared Bunter. Lego. Oh law, oh crikey, yoop, and that, bang, yop, yoop, oh. Wow, wow. With a swing of his arm, Hilton sent the fat junior rolling under the elms. He stalked away with a black brow and went into the house. The tenth chapter, fixed up. Harry Wharton started and glanced round. You fool. Wharton was coming down the staircase when he heard that remark. In low, concentrated tones, it was not a customary mode of address at Greyfriars. The captain of the remove glanced round in surprise. Two fifth four men were standing by the stays, Hilton and Price. Hilton was scowling. Price looked angry and vicious. It was Price who was speaking. You fool, you've done it now, you. Hem, said Wharton loudly. Price started, stayed up, and broke off suddenly. Wharton laughed and went on his way. He had given Price the hint that there were other ears, as well as Hilton's, to hear him. You silly ass, muttered Hilton. Do you want to tell all Greyfriars? All Greyfriars will know soon enough. At this rate, said Price, but in a very... Subdued voice now. You can't afford to row with that fat freak. And you know it. I can't stand his cheek. I tell you he's had the neck to ask me to take him home for Christmas. What the thump does it matter? If he takes the letter with him, and he's sure to, you can get it off him at home. Yes, but... Don't you want to come back to Greyfriars next term? His price. I can tell you. It depends on that fat freak now. Whether you do or not, me too, very likely. I'm as deep in the mud as you are in the mire, if there's a row. Hilton's lip curled sarcastically. His pal, no doubt, was concerned for him, but was more deeply concerned for himself. You've got to hold a candle to the devil, went on Price. I tell you can't afford to quarrel with the fat little beast. He's got you in the hollow of his hand, and he knows it. Where is he now? I left him in the quad. Look for him coming in. Then, catch him before he goes to the head. If the beak sees that letter. Here he comes. Billy Bunter rolled in as Harry Wharton was going out. 
His fat face was crimson with wrath, and he was rubbing his head. Walton stopped, staring at him. What's the trouble, old fat man? He asked. Banged your napper. Oh, Gus Bunter, I've had it banged. Wow. But I'll make that beast sit up. I'll make him squirm. I'll make him sorry for himself. Banging a fellow's napper. Wow. What do you think of a fellow who borrows money of his father's butler to pay betting men at a pub? What? A hey, what? What the dickens are you burbling about? Asked Harry Wharton blankly. I can jolly well tell you. I'll jolly well tell all Greyfriars. Hunter called out Price of the Fifth, almost in an agony of apprehension. I say, Bunter. Bunter blinked round through his spectacles. Go and eat coke. He upped. Who cares for you? I'd like to know. You can jolly well tell Hilton. Hilton wants to speak to you. He can wait, sneered Bunter. I don't want to speak to him. I, about Christmas, said Price. Oh, said Bunter. Price gave his comrade a look. It was a very expressive look, but Cedric Hilton did not need it. He realized what he had to do if he was to save his skin. I, I wanted to ask you, Bunter. He stammered. Well, what? Said Bunter disdainfully. I, I, I was thinking you might like to come to my place for Christmas. Gust Hilton. I, I, I'd be glad if you would. Bunter was still rubbing his head, but the wrath faded out of his fat face. This was what he wanted. Well, I don't know, Hilton, he said. I might come. I've got rather a lot of engagements for the holes. Still, I'll come. Harry Wharton stayed blankly. Of all the Greyfriars fellows, Hilton of the Fifth would have seemed to him the least likely to be landed with William George Bunter for the holidays. But it was no business of his, of course, though he could not help wondering as he went out into the quad. Bunter rubbed his head tenderly. He had an ache there. Hilton had smitten the elm with that fat head, not wisely but too well, but the fat owl was grinning now. All serene, Hilton, he said, I'll come, I can't promise you the whole of the vac, I'm rather rushed with engagements for Christmas, but I'll give you all the time I can. Hilton seemed on the point of suffocating, that settled then, said Price, his eyes gleaming at the fat junior, oh, quite, said Bunter. I'll let you know exactly when I can come, and how long I can stay, Hilton. We'll talk it over at tea if you like. Shall I come to tea in your study? Hilton seemed hardly able to speak, but he nodded assent, and walked away with Price. Bunter grinned and rolled into the rack. That lingering pain in his napa was a matter of small moment now. He was at long last, fixed up for Christmas. Certainly, plenty of fellows would rather have remained unfixed than have fixed themselves up by such very unusual methods. But William George Bunter did not worry about that. Hilton Hall was rather a catch for Christmas. Sir Gilbert Hilton was a wealthy gentleman, and Bunter had heard a good deal about Hilton's expensive home on the moors of Devonshire. There was no doubt that a fellow could have a good time there. By ordinary methods, Billy Bunter certainly never could have secured an invitation to Hilton Hall, so he had to be satisfied with securing it by extraordinary methods. Anyhow, he had it. That was that. Look here, you fellows, called out Skinner, as Bunter rolled into the rag. Here comes Bunter, who wants Bunter for the holes. Ha ha ha. Billy Bunter blinked round at the juniors in the rag with a disdainful blink. Bunter's unfixed state for the holes was a standing joke in the remove by this time, but that unfixed state was a thing of the past now. Bunter, at last, was fixed. You can cackle, Skinner, he sneered. I fancy you'd be jolly glad to get invited to Hilton Hall. Jolly glad, agreed Skinner, with a chuckle. As glad as you would be, old fat freak. Well, Hilton's asked me. Tell us another, suggested the bounder. Orton heard him ask me, if you don't believe it, said Bunter with a contemptuous sniff. I rather think I shall go. I rather think you will, if you get half a chance, or a quarter of one, said the bounder, staring at him. But what's the good of telling us that? 
that swanking fifth form I'm wouldn't ask a junior, and you least of all, well, he's asked me, gammon, said Skinner, Bunter gave another sniff, you can ask Hilton, he remarked, I'm going home with him when we break up, I'm not specially keen on it, I've got a whole lot of invitations, but Hilton seemed keen, so I said I go, how on earth did you wangle it? Asked the bounder in wonder. Oh, really, Smithy, Hilton's rather soft, said Skinner. He lets Price stick on him like a limpet. But Bunter, how the thump did you work it, Bunter, if it's true? We're rather pally, explained Bunter. Oh, wow. Yeah, said Bunter elegantly. When Harry Wharton came into the rug a little later, two or three fellows called to him. They wanted to know. Bunter says you heard Hilton of the fifth ask him home for the holes, said Skinner, did you? Harry Wharton laughed, I did. He answered, well, my hat, that swanking ass, asking Bunter, said Skinner, what on earth has he asked him for? Because he wants him, I suppose, how could anyone want Bunter? Ha ha ha, ask me another, said Wharton, laughing. Anyhow, he's welcome to him. It caused a good deal of surprise in the remove, and some envy among some of the fellows. There was no doubt that it was rather a catch to be asked to Sir Gilbert Hilton's magnificent abode for Christmas. Plenty of fellows in the fifth and in the sixth would have been pleased by such an invitation, and Bunter, Billy Bunter of the remove, was the lucky man, Skinner and company. Could only wonder how Bunter had wangled it. They were sure that he had wangled it somehow, but how, they were certainly not likely to guess. The eleventh chapter. A pressing invitation. I say, you fellows, don't bother, Bunter. It was the next day in break. Snow was falling in the quad, and the famous five were in the rack, discussing breakup. It was not yet finally decided what the co were going to do about Christmas, and with that unsolved problem on their minds, they did not want to bow bothered by Bunter. So, with a plain language that was customary in the lower fourth, they told him so. But I say, persisted Bunter, Buzz, said Johnny Ball, I've been looking for you fellows. What rotten luck for us that you found us, sighed Bob Cherry. The rottenfulness of the luck is terrific. If that's how you thank a fellow for taking the trouble to fix you up for Christmas, said Bunter. Eh, what? The famous five stayed up Bunter. He had succeeded in astonishing them. I mean it, said Bunter. You're at a loose end for the holes, the lot of you. Well, we're pals, ain't we? Em, I'm asked to a splendid place, went on Bunter. Hilton Hall, you know, on Blackmore in Devonshire. Hunting, shooting, fishing, motoring, all sorts of things. Hilton's pater is fearfully rich. Magnificent butler. Man named Walsingham. He, he, he. Well, I'm going. You know, Hilton's so keen on it that I could hardly refuse. But is there a but? Asked Harry, smiling. Well, you see, Hilton's a senior, and so is Price, said Bunter. I'd like to have some friends of my own there. I thought of you fellows. Oh, my hat. I'd like you to come, said Bunter. I can ask anybody I like. That's all right. You'd enjoy yourselves no end. I hear there's going to be big doings, fancy dress ball, and all that. You can go for rides on the moor, too. Hilton's pay to keeps a lot of horses in his stables, ripping time all round. Will you come? The chums of the remove could only stare. Seldom, and never, had they been so taken by surprise. I'm not pulling your leg, said Bunter reassuringly. I really mean it, old chaps. I fancy Hilton would have something to say about it, said Nugent, laughing. I can see him filling his pater's house with remove fellows. I don't think, grinned Bob Cherry, my dear chaps, bosh. Said Harry Wharton, run away and play, Bunter. But I mean it, does Hilton mean it? Asked Bob, laughing. Oh, he'll be pleased, frightfully pleased, rot. 
grunted Johnny Ball. Look here, will you come? Hooted Bunter. No, cut. Billy Bunter did not cut. He stood and blinked at the chums of the removed through his big spectacles with a wrathful blink. Look here, you're not fixed up for the holes, he exclaimed. And you jolly well like it at Hilton Hall. We'd like it all right, said Harry, but... Well, come, then, said Bunter. Look here, I want you to come. Why? Well, we're pals, said Bunter. I've had some holes with you fellows. Why shouldn't you have one with me? Um, the fact is, I shouldn't care to be there without some friends of my own, said Bunter. I don't know what that cad Price might be getting up to. I don't trust Price. What the thump? Well, he's an awful rotter, you know, said Bunter, shaking his head. With Price there, I should feel safer with some friends round me. Safer? Repeated Wharton blankly. Well, yes, in the circumstances, you know. What circumstances? Oh, nothing. I mean, that is, nothing. I'm not afraid of Price pinching anything, of course. Pinching anything? Well, a letter, for instance, or, or anything, you know. It's not that at all. The fact is, I want my friends with me. I, I've been looking forward to Christmas with my old pals, said Bunter reproachfully. I want you to come. Skinner would jump at it, if I asked him. Ask Skinner, then. I don't want Skinner. Catch Skinner lending a fellow ten bob, if he happened to be short of money. Ha ha ha. Blessed if I can see anything to cackle at. I say, you fellows, you'll have a ripping time at Hilton Hall. And you'll be doing me a favor by coming. There. You fat duffer, said Harry. You can't ask us to Hilton's place. And we're not keen on Hilton, anyhow, even if he wanted us. Oh, he's all right, said Bunter. A bit of an ass, but not a bad chap at all. When Price leaves him alone. Yes, I believe that's so. But, look here, I really want you to come, said Bunter. I'll speak to Hilton and ask him to speak to you, if you like. You'll find that he's fearfully keen on it. What rot? The rotfulness is terrific. Look here, will you come? Hooted Bunter. Thanks now. Beast. Billy Bunter, with a snort of indignation, rolled away. Harry Wharton and company looked at one another. They were puzzled and mystified, and a little compunctious. Having made up their minds that they could not possibly stand Billy Bunter for the holidays, they could not help feeling a little remorseful and finding the owl of the remove so keen to share his invitation to so magnificent an abode as Hilton Hall. No doubt, Bunter wanted fellows with him whom he could touch for small loans. They were well acquainted with his manners and customs, but they realized that there was more in it than that. That, no doubt was a powerful consideration, but that was not all. Blessed if I can quite make the fat duffer out, said Bob Cherry. If he really wants us, I'm sorry, but we can't go. Of course, of course we can't, said Harry. I can't imagine why Hilton's asked him at all, but he certainly can't want a crowd of the remove. Hardly, said Nugent. If Hilton came and asked us nicely, we might go said Bob, with a chuckle. But I can't see Hilton doing it. Not quite, said Harry, laughing, and the chums of the remove dismissed the matter, quite unaware that, as matters were going to turn out, they were booked for Christmas at Hilton Hall. The twelfth chapter, left in the lurch, Billy Bunter blinked into Hilton's study in the fifth the following afternoon with a surprised and startled blink. He had come to tea. He had not been asked so to do, but that, of course, was a trifle light as heir to William George Bunter. In the peculiar circumstances of the case he counted on a welcome, not a hearty one, perhaps, but anything short of being booted out was good enough for Bunter. But he met with a surprise. The study was empty. Not only was it empty, but it had a dismantled and deserted appearance. It looked like a study that was done with for the term, like a study looked when a fellow was gonna break up. There were no books or personal belongings about. No fire in the grate. 
no sign of occupation at all, which was strange, as the term still had a couple of days to run. Well, my hut, said Bunter blankly, fellows sometimes, by special leave, got away a day or two before the end of term. It looked as if Hilton and Price had. Bunter, after a long and indignant blink into the deserted study, looked along the passage. Coker of the Fifth was in his doorway, regarding him with a grin. Every day since he had been so pally with Hilton, Bunter had come to tea in that study, and Coker, observing it, had wondered why on earth Hilton was doing it. It was, in Coker's opinion, letting down the Fifth to have a removed fag to tea every day. So Coker was rather amused now. It was clear that Bunter had come to tea once more, only to find the cupboard, like Mrs. Hubbard's, bare. I say, Coker, where's Hilton? Called out Bunter. Coker chuckled. Didn't you know he was gone? He asked. Gone, repeated Bunter. He got leave from the head to get off today, Hilton and Price. The beast, gasped Bunter. He never told me. Why the thump should he tell you, you fat ass? Grunted Coker. The rotter, Gus Bunter, the cheeky rotter, sneaking off and leaving a fellow in the lurch. Coker stayed at him, but Bunter gave no further heed to Coker. He rolled out of the fifth form passage in a state of great wrath. Hilton was gone, Price was gone, Price did not matter, but Hilton muttered a lot. Bunter breathed wrath. The rotter, of course, had got off early for the holes to dodge Bunter. The fat owl had no doubt about that and he had never said a word. Only that morning, in break, Bunter had spoken to him in the quad and mentioned that he would drop in at tea time. He had mentioned it as a hint to Hilton to have something decent for tea, and the fellow had not let on. Never given Bunter a hint that he would be clearing off while the fellows were in class. Bunter was left in the lurch. Hilton, probably, did not want his company on the long railway journey from Kent to Devonshire. Possibly he fancied that this little trick would relieve him of Bunter altogether. If he fancied that, he was mistaken. The awful card, breathed Bunter. There were reasons, strong reasons, why Bunter had wanted to travel in company with Hilton down to Devonshire. There was the railway fare, which was rather steep. Bunter would have his journey money on break-up day, but that was only sufficient to see him as far as Surrey, where his home was. Devonshire was quite another proposition, even third class, the fare was beyond Bunter's financial resources, and he did not want to travel third, he wanted to travel first class, and he wanted a lunch basket on the train, he wanted all sorts of things that a wealthy fellow could afford and that Bunter couldn't afford, no wonder Bunter was wrathy, obviously, he was not going to travel with Hilton now, Hilton was home by that time. The short-sighted owl of the remove had not noticed that he was absent from the school dinner, but he remembered now that he had not seen him since morning break. He had cleared off with Price while the fellows were in third school, and never said a word to Bunter, never given him a hint. Now he was at home, the beast, Gus Bunter. One thing was certain now. If Bunter was going to Hilton Hall for Christmas, he had to have at least one traveling companion. Somebody had to stand his fare. Hello, hello, hello. What's the trouble, old fat man? Bunter blinked round at Bob Cherry. I say, Hilton's gone. He gasped. Yes, I heard a fellow say he went this morning, said Bob. What about it? Oh, nothing. But I say, I, I mean, of, of course I knew. I had a chat with him this morning. I say, you're coming with me for Christmas, ain't you, Bob? Old chap. Bob chuckled. Hilton forgot to ask me. He answered, oh, that's all right. I'm going, you see, and I can take any friends with me that I like. See, not quite. Look here, you beast, will you come? Look here, you beast, I won't. Grinned Bob, and he walked away. Bunter breathed hard. Hilton Hall was a very attractive place for the holes. The company were at a loose end. They ought to have jumped at the chance. Apparently, they weren't going to jump. In fact, they required something a little more definite in the way of an invitation before they bodged anywhere. 
that, in Bunter's opinion, was rot, utter rot. Still, there it was. He had to take fellows as he found them, idiots as they were. This mutter required some thinking out. Bunter thought it out. Writing to Hilton was no good. It was not exactly a mutter that it was judicious to put into black and white, for one thing, and Devonshire was a long way off, and with the Christmas post in the usual state of delay and confusion very likely an answer would not arrive before breakup. But that wonderful invention, the telephone, was a resource. Bunter had to borrow a telephone for a trunk call. It was impossible to telephone from the post office. Trunk calls had to be paid for at that establishment. In these circumstances, therefore, it was fortunate that Mr. Proud, the muster of the fifth, had gone down to the vicarage at Friedel for tea with Mr. Lamb. Having ascertained that fact, Billy Bunter rolled away to muster studies and dodged into Prout's study. Obviously Hilton Hall would be on the phone. Bunter did not know the number, but the exchange can get it. That was all right. They got it. Bunter had rather a long wait, but he was through at last, and a rather rich, port whiny sort of voice came to his fat ears. Hello. This is Hilton Hall. Is that Walsingham? Asked Bunter, guessing it. Speaking, it was the butler. Tell Hilton that Bunter wants him on the phone, speaking from Greyfriars School. Perhaps I can take a message, sir. Master Cedric is playing billiards at the moment with his friend Mr. Price. Tell him it's about a letter. Very well, sir. Bunter grinned over the phone. He had no doubt that that message would bring Hilton to the other end without delay. He was right. A voice came through very quickly. Is that Bunter? Snap the voice of Hilton of the fifth. What do you want? Just rung you up for a little chat. Old chap, answered Bunter affably. You fat idiot. Oh, really, Hilton? If you've got anything to say. Lots. I shall be coming along when we break up. I know that. I shall be bringing a few friends with me. What? Can't you hear? Look here, Bunter. I'll repeat it. I shall be bringing a few friends with me, you fat rascal. If you're going to call a fellow names Hilton, you may as well ring off. If you're not going to be civil, I shall have to change my mind about coming to you for the vac. Unless you really want me, you, you, you. Do you want me or not? Oh, yes, right ho. Like me to bring a few friends? There was a pause. Look here, Bunter, you can't crowd the place with fags. Don't be a silly young idiot. I can hardly come without my friends. You see, I've asked them. You cheeky little scoundrel. Oh, all right. If that's the way you're going to talk, I, I mean. Well, what do you mean? Look here, what sort of a crew do you want to bring? If they're all decent. Wharton's lot. Oh, that lot. Hilton's tone sounded relieved. I shouldn't mind that very much. They're a decent crowd. My father would like them, I dare say. You haven't told them. There was a note of anxiety in Hilton's voice. Bunter chuckled. I've only told them I want them to come. I shouldn't have thought they'd bodge in on that. But you can bring them if you like. That's not quite good enough, said Bunter calmly. They seem to make out that they can't come on my invitation. Well, you fat idiot, of course they do. They're not the fellows to barge in where they're not wanted. Wash it out, I'm bringing them. But the trouble is, they won't come on my invitation. I want you to ask them. Oh, rot, you can please yourself. Of course, Hilton, I shan't come unless they do. If you don't want me, look here. There's lots of time for you to write to Orton. He will come if you put it really decently. I, I, I don't mind if they come. But if Orton gets a letter from you tomorrow, putting it really nice, it will be all right. Otherwise it won't. They're rather fussy. Bunter heard a laugh along the wires. Blessed if I see anything to cackle at. He snapped. What are you laughing at, Hilton? Fussy, are they? Said Hilton. You mean, they won't barge into a place unless they're decently invited. Is that what you call fussy? Oh, don't jaw. I can tell you this. 
If they're not satisfied and won't come, I won't come. That's that. All right. Mind you catch the post. If anything goes wrong, you won't see me over Christmas. Got that? You fat scoundrel. What? I mean, it's all right. Leave it to me. The pater likes young people about the place at Christmas, and I dare say he'll be pleased. He knows Colonel Wharton. It's all right. I'll see that it's all right. Will you have another three minutes? Came a voice. Bunter generously decided not to let Prout be charged for another three minutes. He rang off. The thirteenth chapter. An invitation to Hilton Hall. Harrowton took down a letter in the rack. In break the following morning, looking at it some surprise, the postmark was Blackmore, and he certainly was not expecting any correspondence from Devonshire. The handwriting on the envelope was not familiar, though he thought he had seen it before. He slit the envelope and took out the letter. If he had been surprised before, he was doubly surprised now. He stared at the letter blankly. My hat, he ejaculated. Hello, hello, hello. No bad news, asked Bob Cherry. Oh no, something jolly surprising, though, said the captain of the remove. Look at it, you men. It concerns you as well as me. Wharton passed the letter to Bob. Standing in a little group by the window, the famous five read it together. Undoubtedly, it was surprising. At the same time, it was rather agreeable. It ran, Hilton Hall, Blackmore, dear Wharton, if you and your friends are not otherwise, but for the holes, I should be very glad if you'd come down here for Christmas. The five of you, the pater, of course, seconds this. He knows your uncle, Colonel Wharton, and would be glad to make your acquaintance. The pater is rather a jolly old bean, and likes young people at Christmas, and there will be some others for you to meet. There's going to be some stunts, a fancy dress dance, and a treasure hunt on the moors, and so on. I think you'd be able to have a good time. I'd be really glad if you'd come. We don't see a lot of one another at school, being in different forms, but, of course, it's different at home. I'll do any best to make it jolly for you. Why reply? No time for letters now. Make it yes. Yours sincerely, Cedric Hilton, Harry Wharton and Company. Read that unexpected letter through, read it through again, and looked at one another. Well, my hat, said Bob. Decent sort of letter, said Nugent. Yes, rather, the rotherfulness is terrific. Blessed if I quite make it out, said Harry. Hilton's a fifth form man, and a bit swanky at that. And only the other day we were snowballing him, but he seems to want us. Well, he wouldn't say he did if he didn't, remarked Johnny Ball. I suppose he knows what he's talking about. I suppose so. His pater knows my uncle, remarked Wharton. They were in the war together, though they don't see much of one another now, living so far away. If the jolly old bean would like to make my acquaintance, I don't see why he shouldn't. Here, here. It's a jolly decent letter, anyhow. That's so. The letter, as a matter of fact, was quite cordial in tone, and its cordiality was genuine. Hilton, undoubtedly, did not want Bunter, and he had been dismayed to hear that Bunter was bringing friends with him, but, on the other hand, he had been greatly relieved to hear who those friends were. Probably he was thankful that matters were no worse, and, though the juniors did not know it, when Hilton had mentioned the matter to his father, he had found Sir Gilbert very pleased to hear that Colonel Wharton's nephew was coming. Hilton, with all his faults, had a strong affection for his father, and was glad to please the old gentleman. So, little as Billy Bunter supposed it, he had written that letter with sincere cordiality, and really did mean what he said in it. I say, you fellows. Billy Bunter rolled up. With a fat grin on his fat face, he had spotted that letter in the rack, and knew. The chums of the remove looked round at him. They had forgotten Bunter and the fact that he also was going to be at Hilton Hall for the holidays. That from Hilton, grinned Bunter. Yes. What does he say? He's asked us for Christmas. He, he, he. Well, where does the cackle come in, 
you fat ass. Ask Johnny Ball gruffly. I say, you fellows, you're coming. Well, we haven't decided yet. Oh, rot, said Bunter. Of course you'll come. We'll travel down together. I shall be glad of your company. More than we shall be of yours, grunted Johnny. Oh, really, Ball? If you can't jolly well be civil, I may change my mind about taking you, said Bunter warmly. You're not taking us, you fat idiot. If we go, we go on Hilton's invitation, not yours. You've got nothing to do with it. Oh, haven't I? Hooted Bunter. Nothing at all. Why, you cheeky ass? Well, what have you got to do with it? Demanded Johnny Ball. Oh, nothing, nothing of course. Said Bunter hastily. Shut up, then, beast. I can jolly well tell you that Hilton's only asked you as friends of mine. Hooted Bunter. What utter rot? Are we friends of yours? Inquired Bob Cherry. Oh, really, Cherry? First I've heard of it, beast. Bunter can't have anything to do with this, said Harry Wharton, staring at the fat junior. He's won golden invitation for himself somehow. Oh, really, Wharton? But he can't have won gold won for us. Hilton's letter is genuine enough. But if I thought, Wharton paused. It, it's all right, exclaimed Bunter hastily. I had nothing to do with it. Not a thing. How, how could I? I say, you fellows, I don't walk away while a fellow's talking to you, you beasts. But the chums of the removed did walk away. They discussed the matter without the assistance of William George Bunter. That fat youth was rather anxious that the famous five would not go if they even dreamed how matters stood was certain. They were rather more fussy in such matters than Bunter. Still, it was quite impossible for them to guess how matters stood. Hilton's letter had a genuine ring. That was not to be doubted, and that kind invitation for the Christmas holidays came at an opportune time. There was no doubt of that, either, except on the grounds of a previous engagement. It would have been rather ungracious to refuse, and there was no other engagement. After third school that morning Billy Bunter's doubts were set at rest when Harry Wharton went down to the post office to send a telegram. The die was cast. Bunter was going to have his friends round him at Hilton Hall. He was going to be safe from Price's knavish tricks. He was going to be able to borrow anything he needed in the way of clothes and collars and shirts. He was going to travel first class and he was going to have his fare paid. And all, so far as Bunter was concerned, was calm and bright. The fourteenth chapter, Blackmore, dark, cold, windy, snowy, but jolly, said Bob Cherry. That was Bob all over. Bob looked on the bright side of things. He could see something jolly in a cold, dark, windy, snowy night on a wild, bleak moor. The jollifulness does not seem to be terrific. Murmured Harry jumps at Rum Singh, shivering as he put up the collar of his overcoat and tucked a warm scoff round his dusky neck. I say, you fellows. Hallo, hallo, hallo. Jolly, ain't it, old fat bean? Roared Bob Cherry, enjoying life. What? Arg. It's cake cold, grunted Bunter, beastly. I say, you fellows, can't you see the car? What car? I suppose Hilton's sent a car. Looks as if he hasn't. The cheeky card. Ash it all, they might have sent something, said Johnny Ball, peering into the December gloom. Not the night for a walk, but there was no car. Not the ghost of one. Harry Wharton Company stood looking out of the little country station at Blackmore. The station was outside the village, a little distance from the nearest houses or cottages. Through the gloom of December, twinkling lights could be seen here and there from windows. It had been rather a long run on the Great Western, and then a short run on a local line to Blackmore. Night had fallen long before the Greyfriars fellows were at the end of their journey. It was a dark, bitter night, with snowflakes swirling on the wind that swept over the moor. There was no sign of a vehicle of any sort outside the station. Bunter had taken it for granted that there would be a cough from Hilton Hall. The other fellows had expected that there would be something, 
or at all events that they can get a conveyance of some kind. There was nothing. Inquiry of the station master had elicited the information that Hilton Hall was a mile away by the lane across the moor. The baggage could be sent on by a local carrier's cot. That was all right, but a boy had to be sent to carry word to the carrier in the village. It meant a long wait if the juniors travelled in the cot along with their bags, even if there was room for so many, which was doubtful, and even if they cared to arrive at a place like Hilton Hall in a carrier's car, which was not an attractive idea. So the chums of the remove looked into the wintry night dubiously. A walk of a mile would not hurt any of them, except Bunter. Bunter did not want to walk a mile. Of the 1,760 yards in a mile, there were 1,759 too many for Bunter. He grumbled loud and he grumbled long. The cheek, he snorted, the neck. I jolly well talked to Hilton about this, leaving us in the lurch like this. Look here, you let him know the train, didn't you, Wharton? Yes. Then what does he mean? Wharton could not answer that question. Probably there was more than one car at an establishment like Hilton Hall. Very likely three or four, or half a dozen. Really, Hilton might have sent something. After all, we can walk, said Nugent. I don't want to walk, hooted Bunter. Well, you can crawl on your hands and knees, if you like that better, suggested Bob Cherry. Beast, I dare say there's some mistake in the matter said Harry. Hilton can't mean to treat us uncivilly after asking us here. Somebody's forgotten, perhaps. Very likely, agreed Bob. Billy Bunter gave a snort. He was not so sure that Hilton did not mean to be uncivil, considering the peculiar circumstances. Certainly, he was not likely to waste civility on Bunter, if he could help it. Well, we can walk, said Harry at last. The carrier will bring on our bags, and a mile won't kill us, even in the dark and the wind. Let's get going. Let's, agreed Nugent. I say, you fellows, come on, Bunter. I'll jolly well talk to him when I see him, growled Bunter, the cheeky ass. More likely Price, though. This is just one of Price's tricks. That cad would dish us if he could. The famous five made no reply to that. They started, and Billy Bunter rolled after them, grunting and snorting. The twinkling lights of the village disappeared behind as they tramped along the dusky lane across the moor. All was darkness, with a ghostly glimmer of snow in the gloom. The lane, like many Devonshire lanes, was rather sunken. There were high banks on either side, with patches of leafless thicket along the summit sprinkled with snow. On either hand the wild... Rugged moor stretched away, bleak and silent and desolate. The wind came almost like a knife. In the sunken lane the darkness was like the inside of a hut. Here and there a wintry star sparkled in a heavy sky. Cheery as the chums of the remove were, the darkness and silence and solitude of the wild moor affected them a little. They tramped and almost in silence for the first half mile. Even Bunter's grousing dying away as his breath grew shorter. Hallo, 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 here's a crossroad, ejaculated Bob Cherry, coming to a stop. They peered about them. The faint glimmer of the star showed that the road forked in front of them, dividing into two. There's a signboard here, said Harry. See what's on it, grinned Bob. H.M. At the potting of the ways was a finger post. The projecting arms were well above the level of a head. No doubt they bore information for wayfarers, but in the darkness they might as well have been blank. Try a match, said Nugent. Not much use in this wind, but I'll try. Match after match was struck, but it was useless. The rough wind blew them instantly out. A matchbox having been half emptied, they gave it up. Bunter, leaning on the post to rest his weary, fat limbs, ground. I say, you fellows, can't you find the way? Looks as if we shall have to chance it. Haven't you got an electric torch? In my bag, said Harry. You silly ass, haven't you got one in your pocket? No. I think you might have thought of it. Have you got one? 
Oh, don't jaw. Look here, what are we going to do? Howled Bunter. I'm cold and tired and hungry, especially hungry. We can't stick here, said Bob. No chance of anybody coming by. We might be in a jolly old desert for all the inhabitants we're likely to see. Hilton's place seems to be rather off the map. Let's get on, said Johnny Ball. Take the right. It's as good as the other, as we don't know which. Look here, let's take the left, said Billy Bunter. I fancy it's the left. That remark from Bunter was dictated by sheer irritable crossness of temper. He had no more idea than the other fellows which way led to Hilton Hall. You silly ass. Began Johnny Ball. Beast, hooted Bunter. Look here, take the left. I'm not going to walk all over this beastly moor all night to please you, see. Oh, take the left, said Harry. It doesn't matter a straw which, as we don't know which to take. And the juniors followed the lane that potted on the left. Certainly, it seemed a matter of little moment, as they had not the faintest idea which was the correct one. They tramped on through the windy darkness, back against the dark sky. A mass of buildings rose dimly at length. Not a light was to be seen, but it was unmistakably a building, and a very large one. I say, you fellows, there it is exclaimed Billy Bunter, in great relief. I jolly well knew that left was right. Blessed if that looks like a country mansion, said Bob. You silly ass, what do you think it is? I say. Halt, came a shop voice from the darkness. Warty, halt. Stand where you are. In utter amazement, the juniors halted. Billy Bunter gave a squeak of startled alarm. A stocky figure in uniform loomed up. And to their further amazement, the juniors caught the gleam of a rifle. A sudden light flashed out on their faces, dazzling them. Who are you? What are you doing here? Came the shop. Hush voice from behind the dazzling light. I say, you fellows. Shut up, Bunter. We're trying to find Hilton Hall, answered Wharton. Is that building yonder Hilton Hall? There was a curt laugh. Hardly. Then what? It's Blackmore Prison, the fifteenth chapter, the man in the dock, Blackmore Prison, the schoolboys repeated the words. They peered through the darkness at the great wall and circled building, black against the dark sky, Blackmore Prison. They had, of course, heard of the great convict prison on the moors. They had not been thinking of it, however, and it was startling to find themselves almost under its massive walls. They could guess now who had challenged them. It was a warder, and his round outside the prison. The light which shone in their faces, dazzling them, hid him from their sight. But they knew that he was scanning them keenly. His scrutiny, however, satisfied him. H.W. could hardly have taken the party of schoolboys for friends or confederates of the desperate men imprisoned behind those high walls. If you're looking for Hilton Hall... The voice was less shot now, and the light, suddenly shut off, left the juniors in the darkness again. Yes, answered Harry. You can tell us. You've taken the wrong road if you came up from the station. Go back to the crossroads and take the road on the right. Thanks. The Greyfriars potty turned to retrace their footsteps. Billy Bunter groaned dismally, by insisting on taking the left instead of the right. He had put in an extra quarter of a mile for nothing. That quarter of a mile had to be negotiated again, back to the corner. Blackmore Prison vanished in the darkness behind. The wind blew more sharply than ever, and the flakes were falling thicker. Oh, the beast, groaned Bunter, as they reached the signpost at last. I'll make him sit up for this. Fathead, said Bob. Beast, come on, said Harry. We know where we are now. And it's only half a mile from here. Only, groaned Bunter, on the right road at last, the Greyfriars fellows tramped on. They were all rather tired, and not in their usual cheery temper. This, really, was not how they had expected to reach Hilton Hall. If Hilton had carelessly landed them in a dark and dismal tramp like this, it was not the sort of hospitality they had looked for. Hunter was not surprised, but the famous five were surprised and not pleased. 
Hallo, 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 ejaculated Bob Cherry suddenly. Who? What? Began Harry. There was somebody. Bob stayed round in the thick gloom. I saw somebody. He's gone. I saw nothing, said Johnny Ball. Listen. Through the howl of the bitter wind, a faint sound came from the dark lane ahead. It sounded like the pattering of running feet. Somebody else walking to Hilton Hall in the dark, said Bob. We startled him. Blessed if I can see why he should bolt like that, though. I suppose he didn't take us for a mob of escaped convicts. Might have, in the dock, said Harry Wharton, laughing. Anyhow, he's hooked it. Let's get on. The pattering of hurried feet had died away in a moment or two. The juniors trumped up, keeping their eyes about them as they went. Somebody was ahead of them on the dock road. Though he seemed anxious to keep his distance, in so solitary a place, it was perhaps natural that a single wayfarer should not desire to run into a party of strangers in the dock. Still, the incident startled them a little, but nothing more was seen or heard of the dock figure that Bob had glimpsed for a second before it fled. Hello, 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 there's a light, exclaimed Bob, lifting his hand to point. Hilton Hall at last, said Nugent, in great relief. Oh, law, groaned Bunter. My legs are nearly dropping off. I'm fearfully hungry. Oh, crikey, not for now, old fat bean, as we can see a light, said Wharton encouragingly. Ten minutes, and we'll be in. Ten minutes, groaned Bunter. Oh, law, here's the place. The road ran by a high pot wall. A great gateway appeared in the wall, the gate standing wide open. Over the stone arch of the gateway burned a light. Now that they were close at hand, the juniors could see a glimmer of lights also from the blinded windows of the lodge within. Thus the larger great drive curved between lines of ancient oaks and beaches in the direction of the still unseen mansion. Better make sure we're at the right shop, said Bob. It looks like a bit of a walk to the house from here. Harry Wharton nodded and knocked at the lodge door. It was opened by a plump, red-faced man, evidently the lodge keeper. He stayed at the schoolboys in surprise. This is Hilton Hall, I suppose, asked Harry. Yes, sir, you'll be the young gentleman from the school that Master Cedric's expecting. I suppose we are, said Harry with a smile. We're from Greyfriars, anyhow. You haven't walked from Blackmore Station, sir. Yes. Answered Harry. We had to. Didn't you find the car there, sir? There wasn't any car there. Hooted Bunter. And I'll jolly well tell Hilton what I think of him, too. Shut up, Bunter. Yeah. The Hilton Hall Lodge Keeper blinked at Bunter. Then he addressed Wharton again. The car went. Sir. Mr. Price drove it. Price. Repeated Harry. Yes, sir. He stopped to ask me about the shortcut to the station as he was going. Can't understand how you didn't find the car there, said the lodge keeper, scratching a puzzled head. Oh, the beast, gasped Bunter. I know this was one of Price's tricks. He missed us on purpose, of course. Let's get on, said Harry abruptly. The juniors looked rather grim as they went on. Price of the fifth, apparently, had offered to drive to the station for them and had somehow missed them. Hilton might want them at the hall, but it was very probable that his pal, Price, didn't. Bunter was not the only one of the party who suspected that Price of the Fifth had deliberately missed them at the station, and given them that long and weary walk. I suppose a fellow couldn't punch a fellow's head, when a fellow is a fellow's guest, remarked Johnny Ball thoughtfully, and the other fellows a guest too. Hardly said Harry. It may have been a mistake, too. Fat lot of mistake about it. Catch Pricey offering to fetch us from the station if he didn't mean to play some dirty trick. Well, we can't say anything. Can't we? Hooted Bunter. I can jolly well tell you. Oh, dry up, Bunter. Beast. Glimmering windows in a long facade of an extensive mansion loom through the gloom. A welcome sight to the weary juniors. They tramped on up the drive, their feet making no sound on the carpet of snow. Billy Bunter, weary and worn, 
rolled on behind the other fellows. The glimmer from the distance only made the darkness denser under the leafless branches. Suddenly, unexpectedly, Bob Cherry bumped into an unseen figure in the blackness ahead of him. Hello, 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 what? ejaculated Bob. For the moment he fancied that one of his comrades had passed him in the dark, and that he had bumped into him. The next moment he staggered back, with a loud cry. He had an instant's glimpse of a dim, white face, and a pair of glittering eyes in the gloom, and then a savage fist crashed fairly into his face, sending him spinning back. Crush! Bob Cherry went down heavily on his back in the snow. He yelled as he went down. What the thump is, exclaimed Harry Wharton. Oh. Bob sat up, dazed and dizzy. His hand went to his nose, which used red. His comrades ran up with startled exclamations, but his assailant was gone. The instant that savage blow had been struck, the half-seen figure had darted away and was swallowed up in the darkness. The sixteenth chapter. Guests at Hilton Hall. Bob. What the thump? Run into a tree. No. No. Gasped Bob Cherry, staggering to his feet, with a helping hand from Wharton. Oh, crumbs. Somebody hit me. Warty. I ran into somebody, and he hit me. Knocked me over. Gasped Bob. He glared round in the thick gloom, pulled out his handkerchief, and dabbed his nose. Oh. My boku's nearly busted. Wow. I say, you fellows, let's get on came Bunter's peevish voice. I'm fearfully hungry. You shouldn't run into a tree, Cherry. I didn't run into a tree, roared Bob. Well, you must have, if you've banged your nose. There's nobody here. Look here, come on, yapped Bunter impatiently. I'm going on anyhow. And the fat owl rolled, and towards the glimmering windows, Bob dabbed his nose, breathing hard. His comrades blinked at him in the gloom with rather doubtful looks. It was clear that Bob had had rather a bang on his nose, but there was no sign or sound of anyone but themselves on the Oak Avenue. And it was amazing, inexplicable, that if anyone was there, he had knocked one of the Greyfriars fellows down and bolted. You, you sure, Bob, said Harry dubiously. Bob gave an angry snort. He knew that he had seen a pair of startled eyes glittering at him and he knew that he had been hit, and hit hard, and that hard knock had rather ruffled his temper. You silly ass, of course I'm sure, he snapped. Look at my nose. You might have barged into a tree in this darkness. I tell you he hit me right in the face, whoever he was, roared Bob. I jolly well like to lay hands on him, too. I dare say it's the fellow we came on in the lane, ahead of us all the time and I ran into him again here. Must be going to Hilton Hall. In that case, same as we are, said Frank Nugent. I don't see why he should biff you. I don't either, but he did. Well, he's gone anyhow, said Johnny Ball. I jolly well smash him. If he wasn't, growled Bob. Who the thump can it have been? And why did he punch me, blow him? The other fellows made no answer to that. If it had happened... They could not explain it, and they were not quite sure that it had happened. Really, it seemed more probable that Bob had barged into a tree trunk, or a trailing branch in the dark, and fancied the rest. Oh, let's get on, said Bob gruffly. He restored a rather stained handkerchief to his pocket, and they got on. Ahead of them now light streamed out into the night from a great doorway, wide open. Bunter had arrived first. He was already in the spacious old oak hall of Sir Gilbert Hilton's mansion when the famous five resumed their way. Bright and hospitable that old oak hall looked, with its bright lights and leaping, blazing lock fire when the cold and weary juniors reached it. Cedric Hilton, looking very handsome and elegant in evening clothes, was regarding the fat owl of the remove with a faint smile. He had his hands in the pockets of his trousers, which was perhaps the reason why he did not shake hands with that distinguished guest. Up from the station, Bunter was saying, in tones of deep and thrilling indignation, as the famous five came up to the doorway, tramping through the snow and wind, 
Why didn't you hop into the car? There wasn't any car, roared Bunter. That cab price let us down on purpose. See, dear me, said Hilton, with a yawn. So you've walked? Yes, and I can jolly well tell you that. Help Mr. Bunter off with his coat, waltzing him, a portly man with plump cheeks, and a complexion like rich old port wine, I'd bunter with as much disapproval as a well-trained butler could permit himself to reveal. He helped bunter off with his coat. The fat junior proceeded to warm himself at the blazing log fire. It was grateful and comforting. After that long walk in December cold and darkness, Hilton turned to the open doorway as the chums of the remove arrived there. His greeting of Billy Bunter had been far from cordial or flattering, but his manner changed as he met the famous five. His hands came out of his trousers' pockets at once, and a pleasant smile came over his face. Oh, here you are, young uns, he said. Bunter says that you've had to walk. I'm awfully sorry. Price took the car for you, but he must have missed you somehow. It's a rotten night for a drive, and I fancy he missed his way. He hasn't got back yet anyhow. Snort from Bunter. Bunter was quite sure that the cad of the fifth had intentionally let the party down at the station. The other fellows had very little doubt about it either, but they were not disposed to say so. Hilton, at all events, was not to blame for what Price might have done, and his greeting of the chums of the remove left nothing to be desired. He shook hands with them very cordially, and made them very welcome, and seemed, in fact, genuinely glad to see them, aware that they knew nothing, and suspected nothing, of Billy Bunter's knavish tricks, and that they had accepted his invitation in good faith. The dandy of the fifth made himself as agreeable as he could, and Cedric Hilton could be very agreeable when he liked. Walsingham, who had eyed Bunter very dubiously, had quite a different expression as he gave his stately attention to the famous five. Apparently Walsingham was pleased to approve of them. That man price is an ass, said Hilton as the juniors warmed their hands at the fire. I told him to let a chauffeur take the car but he wanted to go. Where's the pater, Walsingham? In the library, Master Cedric. Come in and see the pater, you men, said Hilton. I'm hungry, said Bunter. Eh? I'm hungry. Walsingham, will you see that Mr. Bunter has some supper immediately, said Hilton gravely. You men come with me, Harry Wharton and company were taken into the library to make the acquaintance of Hilton's father, whom they found to be a hospitable, stout gentleman with a red face and white whiskers. Billy Bunter gave his attention to the more important matter of supper. The seventeenth chapter. The face at the window. Boom, boom, boom. It was a deep, clanging note of a bell wafted on the wild December wind across the snowy moor. It rang and echoed over banks of snow, frosty thickets, and frozen streams, through darkness and gloom, and penetrated into the brightly lighted and cheery apartment where the Greyfriars' party sat at supper. Harry Wharton and company were looking very merry and bright. Hilton Hall was a magnificent place, and its hospitality seemed unbounded. They liked the place. They liked old Sir Gilbert and his lady. They liked and were secretly amused by the stately Walsingham, and they liked Hilton himself more than they had ever supposed at Greyfriars that they would like the dandified sportsman of the fifth form. The only fly in the ointment was Stephen Price, Hilton's fifth form pal, who hardly made a secret of the fact that he regarded the junior party as quite superfluous at the hall. Price had come in with the car, and explained that he had lost his way on the short cut the large keeper had told him about. The juniors had their own opinion about that, which they kept to themselves. Price was not present now. Hilton was. Dinner was over long ago at Hilton Hall, and Hilton had dined, but he graced the supper board with his elegant presence. Walsingham waited on the supper party. Billy Bunter blinked at him several times through his big spectacles and grinned. This was the butler who had lent Hilton money, 
and whose dignified communication on the subject had fallen into Bunter's fat hands. Bunter wondered what the stately Walsingham would have thought if he had known what Bunter knew. Boom, 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 came suddenly the deep, echoing note of the heavy bell in the distance, and the cheery buzz of voices died away as the juniors started and listened. Boom, boom, hello, 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 what the thump? Ejaculated Bob Cherry. By God, said Hilton, that's the alarm bell at Blackmore. He started to his feet and listened. The juniors all rose, except Bunter. Bunter was dealing with mince pies, which were going down like oysters. The alarm hell, repeated Wharton. Listen, what does it mean? asked Nugent. I fancy it means that one of the convicts has got loose, answered Hilton. They ring it to give the alarm if a prisoner gets away. I suppose they found that a man is missing. Boom, boom, came the deep echoing note. The juniors felt a thrill. An escaped convict, breathed Bob Cherry. He remembered the running man in the lane and the blow that had been struck when in the Dock Avenue. He gave his comrades a startled look. You kids haven't seen anything of a man about the moor, exclaimed Hilton, in surprise. We jolly well have, answered Bob and he related what had happened on the avenue. Hilton whistled. By gum, said Johnny Ball. It looks, it does, said Harry. You'd better let the servants know. Walsingham, said Hilton. They've only just missed him and started the alarm bell, but he may have got away hours ago. Certainly, Master Cedric. I say, you fellows, is that window fastened? I say, lock the door, fathead, beast. Roared Bunter, if you think I'm going to be murdered in my bed by escaping convicts. Us, shut up. Hilton crossed to the tall windows and pulled aside the curtains. Outside was black darkness with a glimmer of snowflakes swirling on the wind. From the distance came the steady, unceasing booming clang of the alarm bell at Blackmore Prison. The Greyfriars fellows looked out into the December night. Somewhere out and the wild moor a hunted man was desperately skulking and dodging, with pursuit hot on his track. Whoever he was and whatever he had done, they could not help feeling an impulse of compassion for him. They turned away from the window. Poor beggar, muttered Johnny Ball. What a Christmas for him, I say, you fellows. Oh, dry up, bunter. But was the escaped convict skulking out on the wild moor? Who was it that had struck Rob Cherry down under the leafless oaks on the avenue? Bob remembered the glittering eyes that had flashed from the darkness for a split second, and he had no doubts. Likely enough the desperate man was lurking round the nearest inhabited spot in the hope of laying his hands on food, a change of clothes, money, and he was likely to hesitate a little to obtain what he needed to help his escape. Boom, boom, boom came the hoarse clang of the bell across the moor. Bob Cherry gave a sudden shout. Look, he pointed to the window. Every eye turned, on it again. A face was pressed to the frosty pane. Spellbound, the schoolboys stayed at it. It was a white, haggard face with gaunt features and burning eyes that glittered into the room under the convict cup. The Greyfriars fellows stood rooted to the floor, gazing, Walsingham, with a tray of refreshments in his plump hands, stood transfixed like the rest. His eyes almost bulged from his plump face at the white, desperate face pressed to the window. Harry Wharton found his voice. The convict, Hilton, rushed to the window. The face vanished. In an instant, it was lost in the December darkness. They might almost have believed that it had been a vision of fancy, crush, clatter, Tinkle, what? Oh, crikey, gasped Bunter, the butler. Walsingham, gasped Hilton. They ran to him. The butler of Hilton Hall had fallen to the floor in a faint. The tray had fallen to the ground, and every glass was smashed. And Walsingham lay unconscious on the polished floor. What the deuce, gasped Hilton, what? He lifted the butler's unconscious head on his knee. The junior stayed in amazement. They had been startled by the sudden face at the window, the white, desperate face of the hunted convict. No doubt Walsingham had been startled also. 
but why he should have fainted was another matter. Water, said Hilton. Harry Wharton snatched a carafe from the table. Hilton dashed the water on the unconscious face. Walsingham's eyes opened wildly. His face, the juniors, in wonder, caught the muttered words that fell from his lips. A convict, a blackmore. Pull yourself together, Walsingham, said Hilton rather gruffly. It was a bit of a shock, but dash it all, man. The butler gazed at him for a moment. Then, remembering, he staggered to his feet, his face flooded with crimson. I, I'm sorry, sir, he stammered. I, I regret, I, I, if you will excuse me, sir, I, I will go to my room. You'd better, I think, said Hilton dryly. Walsingham almost tottered from the room. There was a howl from under the table. Billy Bunter had taken refuge there. I say, you fellows, keep him off. I say, yelled Bunter. Ha ha ha. I say, yelled Bunter. I say, you fellows, lock all the doors, bar all the windows, but nobody heeded Bunter. Hilton Hall was in a state of excitement now from end to end at the news that the escaped convict had been seen. Men with lanterns searched the grounds, keepers armed with guns hunted high and low, joined before long by warders from Blackmore Prison, but no trace was found of convict 33, and Harry Wharton and company wondered whether they would see or hear anything more of the hunted man during Christmas at Hilton Hall. The End By Frank Richards The First Chapter A Change in the Dock Bob MMMMM Wake up, you ass. Eh? Wake up, you dummy, grunted Billy Bunter. Bob Cherry woke up. Bob was a fairly sound sleeper, but he could not help waking up when a fat hand was clawing over his face in the dock. He woke up in great astonishment. He turned his face up from the pillow and blinked in the darkness. A chilly draft told him that the door of his room was open. A whispering voice and a fat clawing hand told that Billy Bunter was at his bedside. But he could see nothing. The hour was late. But the Greyfriars party at Hilton Hall had not been long in bed. An alarm of an escaped convict from Blackmore Prison... A mile away across the moor had kept the household astir to a very late hour. Bob's eyes had closed almost the moment his head was on the pillow. Now they were open again. A fat thumb had poked into one of them. What the thump? Asked Bob Cherry. Don't make a row, you fat head. Is that you, Bunter, you blithering idiot? What the dickens are you doing out of bed, you benighted burbler? The fat paw was withdrawn from Bob's startled face. There was a faint glimmer of a big pair of spectacles in the gloom. Billy Bunter bent over the awakened junior. I say, he whispered, you howling ass, hissed Bob, what have you woke me up for? Don't yell, whispered Bunter. Bob Cherry sat up, bang, yarrow, awed Billy Bunter. Bob, naturally, could not see a fat face bending over him in the darkness. As he sat up his head established sudden contact with a fat little nose, he jumped. Oh, gasped Bob. I've knocked my head on something. Oh, wow, it was my nose, you beast, howled Bunter. Wow, you've smashed it. Yeah, wow, you've banged it right through my napper. Wow, Bob Cherry chuckled. Sitting up in bed he pulled the blankets round him. The December night was bitterly cold. Now that he was wide awake he had a faint glimpse of the fat figure at his bedside. Billy Bunter was clasping both hands to his injured nose and spluttering with anguish. Oh, wow, beast, wow, hurt, asked Bob cheerfully. Oh, yes, wow, fearfully, oh, good, beast, wow, oh, I'll hurt you some more if you don't clear off and let a fellow go to sleep said Bob, groping for his pillow. It's past midnight, you blithering bandsnatch. What's this game, you shrieking ass? After a tiring day and bed at a late hour, it was not pleasant to be jerked suddenly out of bomby slumber. Bob Cherry was wrathy, but he was more surprised than wrathy. In the adjoining rooms, the other Greyfriars fellows, Harry Wharton and Frank Nugent, Johnny Ball and Harry Singh, were fast asleep. Bob had been fast asleep, as a rule, 
Billy Bunter would have been fastest asleep of all, instead of which, the foot owl of Greyfriars was awake, up and stirring, probably the only fellow who was stirring in all the great establishment of Hilton Hall. Outside the wild December wind whirled snowflakes on the moor and whistled round roofs and chimney pots. It moaned and echoed in nooks and crannies of the ancient building. Certainly it was not a night to tempt any fellow out of a warm bed, least of all Billy Bunter. Yet here was Bunter, awakened up. What is it, nightmare? Asked Bob. Too many mince pies. I want you to stop at three dozen, beast. Look here, Bob. Wait a minute till I get my pillow. You don't want your pillow. I do. What for, you fathead? To bash you and your silly napper. Billy Bunter jumped back from the bedside. I say, Bob, old chap, get out and let a fellow go to sleep. But I want. You want this pillow? No, you idiot, hissed Bunter. I want you to change rooms with me. Warrity, ejaculated Bob. He stayed up Bunter in the thick gloom. He could see little of him but a glimmer of spectacles, but he could make out that the fat owl of the remove was dressed. Apparently, Bunter had not been to bed yet. Change rooms, repeated Bob in sheer amazement. Yes, old fellow, why, hooted Bob. Well, mine's a better one than this, said Bunter. There's a fire in it, too. I've kept up the fire. You'll be more comfortable there. My only hut, said Bob Cherry. Whatever might be Billy Bunter's mysterious reason for awakening him, that reason was not a regard for his comfort. Bunter, as usual, was provocating. You'll do it, won't you, old chap? whispered Bunter. No, you ass. No, you fathead. Leave off trying to pull my leg and go back to bed, growled Bob. Oh, really, Cherry? Bunk. What I mean is, I'd rather have this room. You see, Hilton fixed up the rooms for us, and Price knows which is which, of course. Price, repeated Bob in wonder. That cad Price of the fifth, you know. Are you off your rocker? demanded Bob. He really began to wonder whether the fat owl of the remove was wandering in his podgy mind. Harry Wharton and company were at Hilton Hall as the guests of Cedric Hilton of the fifth form at Greyfriars. Price of the Fifth was Hilton's chum at school, and he also was a guest at the hall. Hilton, it was to be supposed, wanted the famous five as he had asked them for Christmas. Price, they knew, did not, but what Price wanted was a matter of very little moment to the cheery chums of the remove. But both Hilton and Price, doubtless, were fast asleep in bed. What was worrying Bunter was a deep mystery unless he was going off his rocker. You are to us, said Bob. What do you mean? Price doesn't want us here, I know that. But do you think a fifth form man would come ragging a fellow in the middle of the night? Is that it? Yes, I mean, no. You fancy that Price is up to some luck, and you want me to get it instead of you, demanded Bob. Oh, no, nothing of the sort. Mean, well, what do you mean? you howling us. If you're afraid of price, why can't you lock your door? The key's gone. Oh, said Bob, and, and it's not price, murmured Bunter. I, I'm not afraid of price. I, I mean I, I want you to change because, because. Afraid of that escape convict, grinned Bob. Yes, that's it. I, I'm rather nervous of that, that convict. You know, he was seen near the house. We saw him looking in at the window at supper. And you remember Walsingham, the butler, fainted he was so funky. I wasn't funky, of course. You crawled under the table because you weren't funky, asked Bob. Beast, I, I mean I, I want you to change rooms, old chap. You see, as there's no key in my lock. Oh, rot, growled Bob. As if the convict can get into the house, you ask. If he did, he would make for the grub. He wouldn't want to come to your room. Go back and go to sleep. East, clear off and don't be an ass. Shant, look here, let me have the bedclothes, and I'll turn in in the armchair here. You can keep one blanket. Bob Cherry drew a deep breath. He wanted to go to sleep, 
and he did not want to turn out of bed on a bitter winter night. But it was clear that Billy Bunter was afraid to sleep in his own room, whether he feared a jape from Price of the Fifth or a visit from Convict No. 33, or both. Bob was always good-natured, and though changing rooms in the middle of the night was not a comfortable proceeding, it was undoubtedly more comfortable than having Bunter in the same room. Fat head, ass. Fat foozling frump, growled Bob. You can have my bed. Turn on the light. I, I say, he might see the light and, and guess. Who might? That cad price. I mean, the convict. That is, nobody. Gus Bunter, I say, you don't want a light. The room's next to this. You're not afraid of the dock, are you, idiot? Bob Cherry turned out of bed. He groped for a dressing gown and slippers and put them on in the dock. Then, with an expressive grunt, he groped out of the room. Click. The key turned in the door behind him. Billy Bunter gave a gasp of relief. He was cold and sleepy, and he wanted to slumber, but he wanted to slumber behind a locked door. Once the door was locked, the fat owl of the remove lost no time. His fat head was on the pillow, and Lie was beginning to snore almost before Bob had reached the other room. The second chapter. Stephen Price means business. No, said Hilton of the fifth. Yes, said Price coolly. Cedric Hilton gave a grunt of annoyance. At home, under his father's roof, Hilton was not, perhaps, so much under Price's influence as at school, but his easy nature generally followed the line of least resistance. Late as the hour was, the dandy of the fifth and his friend had not yet gone to bed. They were sitting up late in Hilton's den, a very handsomely appointed room. Hilton, leaning back in the easiest of easy chairs, with one elegantly trousered leg crossed over the other, held a smoking cigarette between finger and thumb. He was in evening clothes, and the electric light gleamed on his spotless shirt front and diamond stud. Very handsome and elegant he looked, and was no doubt conscious of the same. Stephen Price also was in evening clothes, but he looked neither handsome nor elegant in them. In any clothes, Price always looked a bit of a bounder, and when a fellow looks a bounder, evening clothes generally make him look more so. So Price looked more so than usual. There was a determined expression on his thin, rather foxy face, quite different from the easygoing dandy of the fifth. Price always knew exactly what he wanted, and meant to get it. At the bottom of his heart he knew that Hilton did not care much for him, and would not have missed him if he had not been there. The friendship existed because it suited Price, and Hilton was too lazy and indolent to think for himself. Price had laid his cigarette down on an ashtray, and was sorting over a pile of fancy costumes. There was going to be a fancy dress dance at Hilton Hall on Boxing Night, and Hilton had a rather large and varied assortment of costumes in his den, which he had not yet troubled to look at. Price was looking at them. He grinned as he picked out a suit with broad arrows marked on it and a convict cap. Look at that, Cedric, said Price, holding it up. I told them specially to put that in when we went down to Oakham about the things. Rotten idea, drawled Hilton. Jolly good idea, I think. As there's an escaped convict wandering about the moors, a fellow got up as a convict will make rather a sensation, I think. Shouldn't wonder, but I fancy it will be the only one. Said Price, bet on that. Said Hilton, shouldn't care for it myself. Please yourself, though. He sat up, blew out a little cloud of smoke and stayed at Price. That youth was putting on the convict gob over his own clothes. What's the game? Asked Hilton, puzzled. You're not getting dressed up ready for boxing night, I suppose? I'm getting dressed up ready for tonight, answered Price coolly. What the deuce? I'm dropping in on Bunter, as I told you. I've said no to that, said Hilton, frowning a little, and I've said yes, answered Price. What the thump did you have that fat freak here for, except to get that letter off him? Oh, bother the letter, said Hilton irritably. 
I dare say the fat brute will give it back to me if I give him a good time here. Price sneered. He sat down on the arm of an armchair and looked at his friend and lighted a fresh cigarette. Have a little sense, Cedric, he said quietly. You're in a hole, though in your usual way you'd like to shove it out of your mind and not think about it. That fat brute pinched a letter you dropped at school. A letter from the butler here, Walsingham. You've asked Walsingham to lend you money, as he's done before. That was in the letter, a mention of debts that you'd find it hard to explain, either to your father or to the head. I know all that, grunted Hilton, his handsome face clouding. But what's the good of meeting troubles halfway? This one has got to be met. Bunt has traded on having that letter to make you ask him here for Christmas. He knows that that letter would get you the sack from Greyfriars and land you in a fearful row with your father. He's got you right under his thumb so long as he keeps it. And he's not likely to pot with it. It's going to be taken from him. Hilton made an uncomfortable movement. I don't like the idea. After all, he's a guest here, of sorts. That's rot. Would you have asked that grubby fag here if he hadn't got you under his thumb? Snap Price. Of course not, but... I'm in this as well as you, said Price. If that letter comes to light, your game is up at the school. And very likely mine too. If things come out, I'm done for as well as you. If you don't want to save your skin, I want to save mine. Hilton grunted. I've pinched the key from his room, went on Price. He won't be able to lock his door. He's got the letter with him. In his pockets or in his bag, I'm getting after it. What's the objection? It's not his, is it? He would have given it back to you if he hadn't been a dishonorable young scoundrel. He's more fool than rogue, very likely. But fool or rogue, he's got us both under his thumb because he's pinched that letter Walsingham wrote you at the school. You'll be glad enough when I come back with that letter and you can chuck at the fire here. That's true enough. Jolly glad, admitted Hilton, but look here, Price, it won't do. I tell you no. Suppose that fat idiot wakes up while you're in his room and raises the alarm. How's it to be explained to my father and the mater, yes, and to the servants too? It can't be done. That's why I'm putting on this jolly old fancy dress. Price grinned. Bunter knows there's an escaped convict hanging about. He was scared out of his wits when the man's face was seen at the window at supper. If he wakes up, he's not going to see Price of the Fifth. He's going to see a giddy convict. And you can bet he'll be too scared to raise any alarm. Oh, God! ejaculated Hilton. Is that the game? That's the game, said Price coolly. Everybody's fast asleep now. And nobody will see me in this rig. Only Bunter, if he wakes up. If he spins a yarn of seeing a convict in his room, it will be set down to nightmare and funk. Anyhow, nobody will know that I had a hand in it. Somebody may be up yet. Walsingham was fearfully alarmed about that Johnny from Blackmore staring in at the window. And he may. No goon macking difficulties. I'm going. Hilton grunted again and resumed smoking. Price, standing before a tall glass, proceeded to don the costume. Over his own clothes it made him look larger, and certainly no one would have recognized his rather thin and meager figure in the loose garments. He sorted out a makeup box and opened it. Hilton's clouded face broke into a grin as he watched him dabbing at his face before the glass. Price was rather skillful in private theatricals. His own features and appearance vanished under a few dabs of makeup. In a few minutes he turned a face on Hilton that looked ten years older than his own. His light eyebrows were hidden under thick dark busby ones. His chin looked unshaven and stubbly. The convict cup completely concealed his hair. How's that? Grinned Price. Good God. Hilton stared at him. Your twin brother wouldn't know you, Pricey. If I met you like that I'd swear you were the man who got away from Blackmore Prison. Price chuckled. I fancy Bunter will think so, he remarked. You may frighten the fat duffer out of his wits, said Hilton uneasily. 
A fellow who pinches a letter and holds it over a fellow's head can take his chance of that, said Price coolly. I don't like the idea. Bow wow. Price took a last look in the glass, crossed to the door, and quietly left the den. He closed the door after him, leaving Cedric Hilton to rather unpleasant thoughts. It was true that he was eager, anxiously eager, to recover possession of that letter from his father's butler, which Bunter had snuffled in the Greyfriars quad. It was true that he did not want Billy Bunter at Hilton Hall and would have been glad to boot him out, but he jibbed at this kind of thing under his father's roof. As usual, however, he gave in to Price, and he remained in his den, smoking cigarettes, while that youth crept away by dark passages through a silent, sleeping house. Stephen Price had no scruples and no hesitation. Certainly he did not want Bunter to spot him in his room in his own person, but in this disguise there was no danger of that. His nearest relative could not have recognized Price now. The fact that an escaped convict from Blackmore was known to be lurking near Hilton Hall was a stroke of luck from Price's point of view. It made his disguise plausible. Price crept quietly to the oaken gallery above the hall, along which he had to pass to reach the junior's quarters. The hall below was a well of darkness. Not a light was burning in the great building at that hour, nearly two o'clock in the morning. He knew Bunter's room. He had made a special note of it and had, indeed, removed the key from the door so that the fat owl could not lock himself in. All was plain sailing, so far as Price of the Fifth could see. Suddenly he stopped, his heart beating. Ahead of him in the dark gallery there was a sound. Price felt an uneasy thrill. Someone was moving, moving in the dark. Who could be up at that hour? And without a light, he stopped dead. The thought of the escaped convict, no, five, of Blackmore Prison, flashed uncomfortably into his mind. The man had been seen lurking about the house that evening, and it had been supposed that he was there to watch for some chance of getting food or clothes. Suppose he had found a way into the house in the small hours. Price hardly breathed. Who could it be moving in the darkness, unless, a light, the sudden beam of an electric torch, flashed out into his face, startling and dazzling him. A hand dropped on his shoulder, and he gave a suppressed, startled gasp. Richard, it is you, Richard, you hear. Price gave a panting cry of mingled relief and amazement. The voice was the voice of Francis Walsingham, the butler of Hilton Hall. Ah, the third chapter, in the dead of night, Walsingham, panted Price. He knew the rich, fruity voice of the butler, but he could hardly make out the portly figure behind the glare of the light. Holding the electric torch in hand, Walsingham grasped Price's shoulder with the other. He was staring hard at the made-up face of the Greyfriars Senior. It seemed to Price at the moment that Walsingham was staring at his face in the expectation of recognizing it. If so, he certainly did not recognize it. It's all right, Walsingham. Gasp, Price. Don't be alarmed, it's me, Price. Don't you know my voice? Price. What? It's a fancy costume. Make up. You know my voice. For goodness sake, don't give an alarm. There's nothing to be alarmed about. It's me, Price. Hilton's pal. Price panted out the words hurriedly. He was in dread of the alarmed butler awakening the house. He could only suppose that Walsingham had taken him for the Blackmore convict, though why the butler had addressed him as Richard was beyond his understanding. The grasp fell from his shoulder. Walsingham, no doubt, recognized his voice, but he kept the light on Price's face. Mr. Price, he stammered, yes. Price forced a laugh. It's a joke. Walsingham, I've made myself up in the costume I'm going to wear on Boxing Night. That's all. Oh. Gasped Walsingham. You, you, you gave me a, a dreadful start. Sir, Price. I could never have known you. Indeed, I do not know you now. Only your voice. You startled me terribly, sir. Well, you startled me. I'm surprised. I hadn't the faintest idea that anybody was up. What the thump were you rooting about here in the dark for? 
Walsingham, at two in the morning, the butler did not reply immediately. He kept the light so that Price could not see his face, but the fifth former of Greyfriars knew that he was pale, and he could hear him breathing hard as if with difficulty. It was evident that Walsingham had had a severe shock. Price grinned. You took me for the Blackmore man? He asked. Who else could I take you for, sir, in that outfit? Said Walsingham that the fact is, I feared that the man might still be lingering about the house, and I have remained up to keep watch in case he should make some attempt to break in. I don't see why you should keep watch in the dock, grunted Price. I shouldn't care to. The fact is, I thought you were the convict when I heard you. Look here, you'd better go to bed, Walsingham, and don't say anything about this in the morning. I was about to make the same suggestion to you, sir, said the butler. I cannot imagine why you are playing this extraordinary prank in fancy costume, but I am sure that Sir Gilbert Hilton would not approve. That's my business, Walsingham. Oh, certainly, sir, but it's a jape, said Price. Just a joke on the lower school fellows who are staying here. No harm in it. Really, sir, cut it out, said Price. It's no business of yours, Walsingham, and I'm going to carry on. You'd better go to bed. Price of the fifth moved on. Walsingham stood watching him as he went, his light following the fifth form man. It was clear that the stately butler of Hilton Hall disapproved strongly of Stephen Price's proceedings. The great man as Walsingham was in the servants' hall, revered by the whole household staff. He had no authority above stays, and Master Cedric's guest could carry on exactly as he liked, regardless of the stately Walsingham, and he did. Walsingham shut off the light as Price turned a corner and disappeared. Whether the butler went to his room or not, Price did not know, and cared little. He was annoyed by the chance meeting, which gave his game away if Bunter woke up and found the convict in his room. Still, he had told the butler to hold his tongue about it, and a word from Cedric Hilton would probably be sufficient to ensure Walsingham's silence. Quietly, Price of the Fifth stepped along the corridor, and which opened the rooms tenanted by the Greyfriars Juniors. He reached the door of Bunter's room. Softly he turned the handle and opened it. He grinned as he did so. No doubt the fat owl would have locked his door had there been a key to it, but Price had taken care that there was no key. He stepped into the room and closed the door noiselessly behind him. There was a dim red glow of firelight in the room. Logs had been thrown on the fire at a very late hour and were still smouldering red, shedding a dim illumination. Price had an electric flash lamp in his pocket, but he did not need it. The red glow from the wood fire gave him light enough. He stepped towards the bed soundlessly and stayed at it. The bed was in deep shadow and he could only dimly make out the outline of a figure there, but he could hear the steady breathing of a sleeper. The occupant of the bed was fast asleep. Satisfied of that, Price looked round for Bunter's clothes. Utterly ignorant of the fact that Billy Bunter had changed rooms with Bob Cherry and gone to Bob's room fully. Dressed, he naturally expected to find the clothes at hand. Most likely the letter was in one of the pockets, and if so, his task was easy enough. But there were no clothes to be seen. Bunter had gone dressed to Bob's room and Bob had come to Bunter's room with a dressing gown over his pyjamas. That, of course, could not possibly occur to Price, who had not the remotest idea that it was not Bunter in the bed at all. He gritted his teeth with anger. Likely enough, Bunter had feared a surreptitious nocturnal visit to his room. Likely enough, in that case, he had hidden his clothes so that nobody could go through the pockets while he slept. He would hardly have suspected the proud and haughty Hilton of such a proceeding, but it was very probable indeed that he suspected Price. The cad of the fifth began a search of the room for the clothes. He looked into a wardrobe where he found a coat and ran his fingers through the pockets. He examined a chest of drawers and its sparse contents. 
Billy Bunter, as usual, was travelling light, depending, as usual, and borrowing from the other fellows anything he might happen to want. Price breathed hard. He approached the bed at last. It looked to him as if Bunter must have taken the clothes to bed with him to keep them safe from searching hands. Really, it was difficult to imagine what else could have become of them. He stood for some moments, hesitating. The steady breathing showed that the occupant of the bed was sleeping soundly. Had Price been in the remove at Greyfriars instead of the fifth, he would have been surprised not to hear a deep, rumbling snore as he stood by Bunter's bedside. But a fifth form man was unaware that every night in the town the removed dormitory echoed to Billy Bunter's hefty snore. Not for a second did it cross his mind that it was not Bunter in Bunter's bed in Bunter's room. Still, he hesitated. The soundest sleeper was bound to awaken if a fellow started searching the bed in which he slumbered. He had to chance it. After all, he had taken his precautions. The fat junior's awakening eyes would see only a convict, bearing no resemblance whatever to Price of the Fifth, and it was certain that the sight of the convict in the glimmering firelight would strike the fat owl dumb with terror. There was nothing to be feared. He made up his mind at last, bent over the sleeper hidden in shadow, and grasped his shoulder, and as the sleeper stirred into wakefulness he snapped, in a gruff voice quite unlike his own, silence. Silence, I'm desperate, silence, which from a scowling convict would have been enough, more than enough, for Billy Bunter, but was not quite enough for Bob Cherry. The fourth chapter, a sudden alarm, Harry Wharton started suddenly out of slumber. He sat up in bed, he had been dreaming, and the alarm bell which had rung out that night across the lonely wastes of Blackmore had mingled with his dreams. As he sat up half awake, he seemed to hear it now, but as his mind swiftly cleared he realized that it was some other sound that had awakened him. Sounds of scuffling and bumping echoed in the night, and a shouting, panting voice help. It was Bob Cherry's voice. Rescue, Greyfriars, came Bob's roar. Harry Wharton bounded out of bed. Another bound carried him to his door, and he tore it open. Help, came the roar. Rescue. Other doors opened as Wharton flashed on the corridor light. Frank Nugent, Johnny Ball, and Harry Jumset Rum Singh came running out of their rooms in their pajamas, their faces startled and excited. What's the row? gasped Nugent. That's Bob, exclaimed Johnny Ball. This way, panted Harry. Hold on, it's from Bunter's room, exclaimed Nugent. Bob's there. Help. Back up came Bob's panting roar. Amazing as it was to his friends, it came, plainly enough, from Bunter's room, not from Bob's, and they dashed down the passage to Bunter's door. Wharton reached it first, and held it open. A startling scene met his gaze in the red glow of the wood fire. Two figures were rolling and struggling in desperate combat on the floor. One of them was in pajamas, that was Bob Cherry, but the other... The juniors could hardly believe their eaves as they saw the other. It was a black-browed, stubbly-faced figure in convict gob. Wharton gave a yell. The convict, what, come on? Wharton bounded into the room. The struggle was fierce, but the convict, apparently, was trying only to tear himself loose. He succeeded as Wharton arrived, wrenching himself from Bob's grasp and bounding to the door. He crashed into Wharton, as the captain of the remove rushed in, Wharton staggered back, grasping at him, but the fugitive dodged his grasp and dashed out into the passage. There was a yell from the three juniors there. The convict, Johnny Ball, the nearest, grabbed at him and barely missed. Panting, the figure in convict cob raced away down the passage towards the oak gallery over the hall. It's the convict, the man from Blackmore, panted Nugent. Bob Cherry staggered up, after him, he gasped, after him, it's the escape convict, he leaned on the wall gulping for breath, Wharton stayed round, where's Bunter, he exclaimed, he's not here, we changed rooms, he was funky of the convict, gasped Bob, of course, I never fancied there was anything in it, I went to sleep here, oh my hat, 
He gurgled for breath, and, and I was woke up. He grabbed me by the shoulder and woke me up. He yapped at me to be silent, and I landed out and got him on the nose. Goodness knows what he wanted, but it's the convict, the blackmail man. I knocked him over, and, and, come on, yelled Johnny Ball from the passage. Without waiting to hear more from Bob, Harry Wharton dashed out of the room. Bob, still gasping from the struggle, hurried after him as fast as he could. This way, roared Johnny Ball. He was already in pursuit, and he shouted back from the corner of the passage where it opened and the oak gallery over the hall. Wharton raced after him. Nugent had switched on the light in the gallery. Way, panted Wharton. He cut across, downstairs. Now, up that passage, it leads to Hilton's room. I think, come on, panted Wharton. We'll wake Hilton and Price. The light in the hall below flashed on as they ran along the gallery. From below, Walsingham stayed up with an amazed face. Young gentleman, he called out, that the butler, call the servants, shouted Wharton. It's the convict. He's in the house. What is this? A stout, white-whiskered gentleman, with a red face clad in a voluminous dressing gown, emerged from one of the corridors that opened on the oak gallery. He had a golf club in his hand. What? Evidently the uproar had startled Sir Gilbert Hilton out of the land of dreams. He stayed almost in stupefaction at the juniors. It's the convict, sir. Gasp Nugent, the esteemed and ridiculous Desperado who has escaped from Blackmore Prison, venerable sir, panted Harry Jamset Ramsing. Sir Gilbert jumped, good gad, in the house, yes, you've seen him, gasped Sir Gilbert, yes, yes, he's dodged up that passage, towards your son's room, good heavens, he may. Sir Gilbert Hilton rushed along the gallery, golf club in hand, his plump red face full of alarm. Evidently he was deeply alarmed by the possibility that his son might be in danger. He whisked along at great speed, his dressing gown flying about him like staysails in a wind. Walsingham was coming up the stays, but nobody heeded Walsingham. Sir Gilbert and the famous five rushed up the corridor that led to Cedric Hilton's rooms. Far up the corridor, a door had opened and light streamed out into the dark passage. Into that lighted doorway running, panting figure was seen to whisk. It was a figure in convict gob. The door shut. That is Cedric's den, gasped Sir Gilbert. He has not gone to bed yet, it seems. And the convict, follow me, for heaven's sake, hurry. He fairly raced up the corridor, gripping his golf club and his heels raced the chums of the remove, unarmed, but prepared to handle the disprodo with their bare hands if they got at him. Far in the rear, the portly Walsingham panted after them, the fifth chapter. Only price. Cedric Hilton bounded from his chair. Ash from his cigarette dropped unheeded on his white shirt front. He spun round towards his door as it was held open and price of the fifth. In his convict outfit rushed breathlessly in and slammed the door after him. What the deuce? roared Hilton, startled almost out of his wits. Price panted for breath, but did not answer. He was fumbling with the key in the door. There was a click as he turned it with an unsteady hand. Then he leaned on the door almost sobbing for breath. Hilton stared at him, dumbfounded. Already an echo of footsteps reached him from the passage without. What? He shouted, oh, shut up, panted Price, shut up, oh, crumbs, he gasped and panted, the makeup on his face was badly smudged, crimson that was not part of it, mingled with it now, it proceeded from Price's nose, which seemed to have got damaged, it was plain that Price had been engaged in a struggle, his convict cap was on one side of his ruffled, tousled head, his nose oozed crimson, he was rumpled and disheveled from head to foot. You ass, said Hilton, you utter ass. Have you roused up the whole house with your foolery? Have you let Bunter knock you about like that? It wasn't Bunter, it was that hefty brute. Cherry, hunted Price, you got into the wrong room, snapped Hilton contemptuously. Pretty asinine sort of thing to do. No, 
I can't understand it. But it wasn't Bunter there. It was Bunter's room, but not Bunter. It was that hefty young ruffian. Hurrying footsteps stopped at the door of Hilton's den. The door handle turned, and there was a crashing knock on the panels. Cedric, Cedric. Hilton gritted his teeth as his father's voice called. He gave Price a black and bitter look. Evidently the house was alarmed. Cedric, shouted the old baronet, hammering. Yes, father. Cedric, you're safe. Yes. Quite. What's the matter? Called back Hilton to gain time. Price staggered away from the door. Is he in there? He. Who? T.H.E. convict. Hilton forced a laugh. No convicts here, father. I'm all right. Why do you not open the door, Cedric? I saw him run into the room. You must have seen him. Oh, you fool. You fool. Breathed Hilton, glaring at Price. How are we going to explain this? You fool. He's in there. It was Bob Cherry's voice outside. I saw him run into that room. I saw him, came Wharton's voice. The seafulness was terrific. The whole crew up, breathed Hilton. What are we to do? Open the door, Cedric, shouted Sir Gilbert Hilton. Were you asleep, or what? The man is in your room. Open the door instantly. Coming, called back Hilton. He crossed slowly to the door. Price stood panting. Had he escaped to Hilton's room unseen, his trickery might have been kept secret, but the chase had been too hot at his heels for that. Now that he knew that he had been seen to enter that room, it was obvious that there could be no further concealment. He could have dodged away by another door into Hilton's bedroom, but Hilton would have had to explain. Hilton's eyes were on him savagely as he went to the door. What am I to say? Be breathed. You fool. You've alarmed the house. We've got to explain. You can think of lies easily enough at Greyfriars. Think of one now, shop. Call it a jape on the fags. Muttered Price. Leave it to me. Let him in. Open the door, you ass, before he gets suspicious. Hilton unlocked the door and threw it open. His father strode in with rustling dressing gown, golf club in hand. Behind him were the famous five. Hello, 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 yelled Bob Cherry. There he is. Good God, there stands the villain, gasped Sir Gilbert. And he rushed at Price with golf club uplifted. Surrender, you scoundrel. Lift a finger, and I will strike you to the floor. Price jumped back in great alarm. Hold on, father, gasped Hilton. It's only Price. What? gasped Sir Gilbert. Only Price, it's a joke. Price, roared Bob Cherry, Price of the Fifth. Oh, my hat. Sir Gilbert glared at the skulking convict and then stared at his son. He was astonished and angry. What do you mean, Cedric? He snapped. Are you in your senses? That is the man who escaped from Blackmore Prison. No, no. He attacked one of these boys in his room. No, no. Only a lock. A lock. Roared Sir Hilton, his face purple. Cedric, what? Please forgive me, sir. Panted Price. I'm Price. Really, I am. Cedric knows, sir. I, I was trying on a costume I've got for the fancy dress dance on Boxing Day. Sir, not from Sir Gilbert. He was realizing now that this skulking convict was Stephen Price of the fifth form at Greyfriars, his son's friend. But that did not lessen his anger. Rather, it added their unto. Harry Wharton and company exchanged glances in the doorway. They knew Price's voice and recognized it, though they could not recognize Price himself in his makeup. I, I was trying on this. This convict costume, sir, stammered Price, and, and I thought I, I'd test it, sir. It was rather silly, perhaps, but, but I thought I'd look in on the boys. Sir, and, and see if they took me for a real convict. Are you a fool? Roared Sir Gilbert. Are you not a fool? I, I'm awfully sorry. I, I realize now that, that it was a bit thoughtless. Sir, stammered Price. Thoughtless? Roared Sir Gilbert. That is not the word. Sir, that I should use to describe your conduct in dressing yourself up as a convict when it is known that an escaped convict is in the neighborhood, 
I'm trying to frighten schoolboys in the middle of the night. I, I didn't mean to, too. Is this friend of yours in his right senses, Cedric? I, I think so, father. Gust Hilton, I have never heard of such a thing. Snorted Sir Gilbert, never. The whole house has been alarmed. The servants are up. Lady Hilton is alarmed. Everybody has turned out, and it proves to be a silly practical joke, upon my word, pa. Sir Gilbert seemed to be rather overlooking the fact that the silly practical joker was a guest in the mansion, courteous old gentleman as he was, his courtesy seemed quite forgotten now. The junior stepped quietly away. Now that they knew that the convict was only price of the fifth playing the fool, they were not wanted there. It was a satisfaction to Bob to remember that he had given the practical joker a hefty one on the nose. They returned to their rooms. Sir Gilbert was not in such a hurry to go. He was intensely angry and exasperated. Price's stuttered apologies and regrets were ruthlessly interrupted. Sir Hilton turned to the door where Walsingham was looking in. Walsingham, send the servants back to bed. Go back to bed yourself. Nothing is the matter. Only an insensate practical joke played by a boy old enough to know better. There is no occasion for alarm. Very good, sir, murmured Walsingham. I, I, I'm really awfully sorry, sir, stammered the wretched Price. I should imagine so. Snapped Sir Gilbert such an absurd prank. Such an insensate trick. It's beyond my comprehension. Cedric, why are you up at this hour? Why have you not gone to bed long ago? Sir Gilbert sniffed. The odor of cigarette smoke in the room was plain enough. Sir Gilbert sniffed, and then snorted. You have been sitting up to this hour smoking. Really, Cedric, I have a right to expect you to act more sensibly. Go to bed. Sir Gilbert marched off at last. Hilton did not even say goodnight to Price before he went to his room to bed. He only gave him a black look. Price went off to bed scowling savagely. He was not thinking of any further attempt to get that dangerous letter away from Billy Bunter. The fat and fatuous owl of Greyfriars had beaten him, and for the present Price of the filth had to give it up. The sixth chapter. A strange discovery. Hold on. What footprints, said Bob Cherry. It was the morning of Christmas Eve, and Harry Wharton and co. had been rambling in the keen, frosty air of Blackmore. Snow covered the wide, wild moor like a coppet. Far in the distance the high roofs of Blackmore Prison could be seen against a steely grey sky, and the skyline, several times, the juniors had spotted a horseman riding, or a warder tramping with a rifle under his arm. The hunt for the escaped convict was still going on. Nothing had yet been seen of convict now. Thirty-three from Blackmore since he had so strangely looked in at the window at Hilton Hall. Snow had fallen again while the juniors were on their rumble, but it had stopped. They were coming up the Oak Avenue toward the mansion when Bob Cherry halted and pointed to the tracks in the snow. The track led away from the avenue through the trees in the direction of a lodge plantation that bordered the open moor. The sight of the footprints in that spot, a quarter of a mile from the house, rather interested the Greyfriars fellows. The jolly old convict again, what? asked Johnny Ball. Just what I was thinking, said Bob. Most likely he's far enough off by this time, remarked Frank Nugent. He would find it fearfully pocky, hanging about on the moor. The pockiness is rather terrific, observed Harry Jumset Rumsing, stamping his feet in the snow as the other fellows stood looking at the footprints. The dusky nubbub of Banipur felt the cold of Blackmore very keenly. Well, they're watching for him, said Bob. He won't find it easy to get off the moor. They're still hunting for him, which shows that they think he's still around. That's so, agreed Harry Wharton. If he's hanging about the show, he ought to be rooted out, said Bob. He must be pretty desperate by this time, and he might knock anybody on the head to get a change of clothes. Let's trot along this trail and see where it leads. Won't do any harm, 
the scented hurry, the famous five turned from the avenue into the trees. The earlier trail had been covered by the snowfall, so where it had started they could not tell, but from the avenue it had evidently been made since the snow ceased to fall, for it ran clearly mocked towards the lotch plantation. It was possible, of course, that the tracks had been left by someone belonging to Hilton Hall who had gone for a walk that frosty morning. On the other hand, it was equally possible that they had been left by the desperate man who was known to have been lurking about the place since his escape from prison. In either case, it could do no harm to ascertain where they led. The junior strolled on, following the trail, which led into a path through the larches. Hello, 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 ejaculated Bob suddenly. A figure appeared on the path ahead coming towards them. The juniors burst into a laugh. It was not a convict figure. It was the portly, stately form of Walsingham, the butler, muffled up in a thick greatcoat. Oh, my hat, ejaculated Nugent. It's the jolly old butler we've been tracking. The chums of the removed could not help laughing. It was evident that the footprints they had picked up had been left by the butler of Hilton Hall, who was now coming back from his walk. Walsingham saluted them respectfully and politely as he came up. He seemed a little surprised by their smiling faces, and Harry Wharton explained, We found your footmarks, Mr. Walsingham, and followed them, he said. We thought convict now. Thirty-three might have left them. Walsingham smiled too. What a rotten cell, said Bob. The rottenfulness of the cell is preposterous. Perhaps it is just as well, young gentleman, said Walsingham. The man who escaped from Blackmore the other night would probably be very dangerous for schoolboys to meet. Oh, we shouldn't mind that, said Bob. I fancy the five of us would handle him all right. Walsingham's portly face became very grave. Surely, young gentleman, you would not seriously think of trying to deal with that dangerous man, he said. Wouldn't we just, if we spotted him, answered Bob. I thought I got him in hand the other night, but it turned out to be only that us price playing a joke. Have you any reason to suppose that the man is still in the vicinity, asked Walsingham. Oh no, only he turned up here once, said Bob. I've wondered a lot why he peeped in at the window that time. I should have thought his game would be to keep out of sight. But we all saw him at supper the night we got here. No doubt he's gone long ago. Sir, he's not caught yet. The butler had come to a halt. There was a trace of uneasiness in his manner that the juniors did not quite understand. If he was alarmed for their safety, they were not disposed to share that alarm in the least. Five sturdy Greyfriars fellows felt themselves a match for any convict in Blackmore. Well, come on, you men, said Bob. One moment, sir, said Walsingham. Please excuse the liberty, but it would be as well for you boys to avoid lonely places on the estate while there is a possibility that the convict is still about. Oh, that's all right, said Bob carelessly. I should certainly advise you, sir. Not to go on by such a very solitary path as this, said Walsingham. You think the jolly old convict may be skulking in the plantation, grinned Bob Cherry. There is a possibility, sir. All the better. It's the very spot he would choose to hide. And if he's there, we'll root him out. Please be advised by me, said Walsingham urgently. I'm sure that Sir Gilbert would be far from pleased at the idea of his son's guests going into any danger. Danger be blowed, said Bob. In fact, I'm sure that Sir Gilbert would be displeased. We shall judge for ourselves about that, Walsingham, said Harry Wharton coolly. Come on, you fellows. He spoke civilly, but he intended to give Mr. Walsingham a hint to mind his own business. The five juniors walked on by the path through the frozen larches, leaving the butler standing where he was. He did not go on his way, but stood looking after them until they disappeared among the frosty trees. Hello, 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 exclaimed Bob suddenly. What's this? The footprints in the snow ended at the entrance of a little summer house, standing by the path through the plantation. Apparently Walsingham's walk had extended as far as that spot. And he had then, 
turn back. In the summer, no doubt, it was a very pleasant spot, but in the depth of winter it was cold and dark, dank and cheerless. The interior of the summer house was shadowy and bitterly cold, and a good deal of snow had drifted in on the wind, a lodging for the night. If the convict knew where to find this place, remarked Harry Wharton, perhaps that's why Walsingham came, to see whether he had been camping here. Shouldn't wonder, let's look, whether Walsingham had entered the summer house or not. They did not know, but the famous five entered it, having discovered it. They naturally intended to examine the spot. It was quite possible that it had sheltered the hunted man from Blackmore. Inside the little building was a wooden seat against the back wall, and the seat lay a bundle. Bob Cherry fairly jumped at it. Look, he roared, my hat. The juniors gathered round the bundle in great surprise and interest. How it had come there was a mystery. It could scarcely belong to the convict if he had even been there. It was wrapped in plain brown paper and tied with string. Bob held it up. Something soft inside, he said. Feels like folded clothes. Clothes, repeated Wharton with a start. His eyes gleamed. I say, this is jolly queer. He said, is it possible? He paused. Is what possible? Asked Nugent, with a startled glance at the captain of the remove. The same thought had occurred to his mind. That man from Blackmore needs more than anything else a change of clothes. Said Harry quietly, if there's clothes in that bundle, left here like this. Bob Cherry whistled, somebody lending him a hand. He exclaimed, well, it looks like it. By gum, it does. Bob whistled again. My hat. Is that why he turned up here after making his escape? Does he know somebody in this quarter who might help him out? Looks as if he does, said Johnny Ball. Anyhow, this has got to be jolly well explained, said Harry Wharton. I don't think we'd better open the bundle, but Sir Gilbert Hilton has a right to examine it and pass it on to the police if he thinks fit. We'd better take it to him. That's right, agreed Bob. He put the bundle under his arm, and the famous five left the summer house. Greatly excited by that strange discovery, they started for the distant mansion at a run. Rather to their surprise, they passed Walsingham on the path. He was still there, and his eyes went to the bundle under Bob's arm at once. He called to them, but they trotted on without stopping. They were anxious to get that mysterious bundle into the hands of the master of Hilton Hall, and had no time to waste on Walsingham. The portly butler was a good distance behind them when they arrived at the mansion. The seventh chapter. Mysterious. Sir Gilbert Hilton was standing with his back to the lock fire in the hall. His ruddy face glowed cheerfully. His son lounged by one of the windows. Looking out into the snowy grounds, Price was talking to Sir Gilbert, or rather, listening to him. The red berries of holly branches gleamed on the old oak walls. In the flicker of the firelight, there was a hospitable, cheerful atmosphere of Christmas about Hilton Hall. The old baronet had been particularly courteous to Price of the Fifth since the night of the convict costume incident. No doubt he realized that he had expressed himself rather frankly on that occasion. He was telling Price now about a kill with the hounds, and Price manfully suppressed his desire to yawn. He would have preferred to be in the billiards room with his pal, but he felt that he could not get away till the end of the story. The end seemed a long way off for the old gentleman had a way of going back to some forgotten incident in telling a story, and then telling all over again what he had already told. Price did not like seeing Harry Wharton and company about the place, but he was rather glad when they came in and the Lord of Hilton Hall was interrupted. Bob Cherry laid the bundle on a table, and Sir Gilbert blinked at it. He opened his eyes wide when he was told where the juniors had found it and why they had brought it in. Gad, said Sir Gilbert. Good Gad, cut that string for me, Cedric. Hilton of the fifth, rather interested, came over from the window. He took out a little pearl-handled penknife and cut the string. The bundle was opened. 
All eyes turned very keenly on the contents as they were unrolled. A suit of clothes came to light. A new ready-made suit that evidently had not been worn before. There was a soft hat and a cup, a pair of boots and a pair of socks, a couple of collars and a necktie and several more such articles. It was, in fact, a complete new outfit of clothes, obviously recently purchased at a shop or various shops, for everything was quite new. Well, my hat, said Hilton, not much doubt about it now, said Harry. The doubtfulness is not terrific, by God, said Sir Gilbert, staring at the articles turned out of the bundle. It's clear enough that outfit was put in the summer house to be picked up by the man from Blackmore. He has a friend in this quarter. That's why he came in this direction when he got away. Looks like it, by Jove, said Price. No doubt about it, said Hilton. It can't be anybody connected with the household. Father, eh? What, no? Of course not, said Sir Gilbert. Somebody in the vicinity. Impudence to use a place in my grounds for a rendezvous. The police must know of this, and at once. I'll get Inspector Trevely on the phone. He crossed to the telephone cabinet in the hall. Walsingham entered by the service doorway. Plump and portly man as he was, he had a soft and almost silent tread. Bob Cherry called to him. Look at this little lot, Walsingham. Walsingham was already taking in the articles that lay on the table with the tail of his eye. He faced round as Bob called and looked at them. You'd have found these if you'd gone into the summer house, said Bob with a laugh. In the summer house, sir, said Walsingham. Yes, where you had your walk. We found them in a bundle on the seat. Dear me, did you really, sir? Asked Walsingham. What a very extraordinary thing. To whom can they belong? I dare say the police would like to know that, chuckled Bob, but there's no doubt to whom they were going to belong. They must have been left there for the jolly old convict to pick up. Walsingham started. Impossible, sir. Rot, said Hilton. It's as clear as daylight. Walsingham, what else can an outfit of clothes have been put in that lonely place for? But nothing has been seen of the man, Master Cedric. Something will be seen of him, I fancy, remarked Price. The police are sure to watch the place and nab him when he comes to pick up that bundle. Yes, rather, agreed Bob. And they'll get the fellow who bought those clothes for him too, said Price. Walsingham looked at him. Do you really think so, sir? He asked. Ten to one, said Price. You can see that they are all new. They must have been bought lately, specially to be left for the convict. Ten to one the police will be able to trace the shop where they were bought. Let's see if the name's on them, said Bob. The juniors examined the clothes, but the tabs bearing the name of the makers had been cut off and even on the collars the inscription had been rendered indecipherable by blotches of mocking ink. Evidently, the unknown friend of the convict had done his best to destroy all traces. Dish, said Nugent. Oh, the police will nose it out, said Price. Most likely the things were bought in Oakham. It's the only town near here. And if they take them round to all the shops, they'll soon find out where they came from and get a description of the man who bought them. Yes, I should say it was all UP. With that sportsman, remarked Hilton, Sir Gilbert came back from the telephone. Oh, you're here, Walsingham, he said. Take away that bundle, will you, and lock it up in a safe place. Inspector Trevely will be here very shortly, and the things are to be kept safely till he comes. Very good, sir, said Walsingham. He rolled up the articles in the brown paper and disappeared with the bundle through the service door. The gong sounded for lunch a few minutes later. At lunch Walsingham did not, as usual, wait at table, his place being taken by a footman. The strange discovery in the summer house was the chief topic of a lunch. By the time the meal was over Walsingham appeared to announce that Inspector Trevely from Oakham was waiting in the hall to speak to Sir Gilbert.
You boys had better come with me, as you found the bundle, said the baronet, and the removed fellows followed him. Billy Bunter blinked after them, but did not follow. Bunter had had only one lunch so far, so he was not finished yet. Hilton and Price, however, followed on, curious to hear more of the strange affair. Inspector Trevely, a stocky, thick-set man, with very keen eyes and a dark face, was evidently keen on the discovery that had been made. He listened to what Sir Gilbert had to say and turned to the juniors. He snapped questions at them, in a few minutes drawing from them all they knew. How did you chance to visit the summer house? He said. I understand that the spot is very lonely and uninviting at this time of the year. Bob Cherry chuckled. We picked up some footprints, he said, but it turned out that they were only Walsingham's. I had gone for a walk in that direction, sir, said the butler. I met these young gentlemen on the path. Oh, said Mr. Trevely, disappointed. No other footprints. None that we saw, answered Bob. I saw none, sir, said Walsingham. Only those made by the young gentleman and myself. Someone must have been to the summer house to leave the bundle there, jerked Mr. Trevely. The snow had only ceased to fall a very short time before, sir, said Walsingham. No doubt it covered up the footprints. No doubt, grunted the inspector. Let me see the things that were found. Where are they? I placed them in Walsingham's charge, said Sir Gilbert. Bring them at once, Walsingham. Very good, sir. The butler went out by the service door. Sir Gilbert looked at the stocky inspector, who stood with a grimly thoughtful expression on his face. There can be no doubt, inspector, that the articles were placed there for the convict to find. He asked, scarcely, Sir Gilbert, someone has already been in touch with the man and made this arrangement with him. We knew that he must have been supplied with food or he must have given himself up before this. He has a friend in the locality, and I have no doubt that I shall now be able to trace that friend, and through him, Richard Pike. Richard Pike, repeated Price of the Fifth. He gave a start as he heard the name. Is that the name of the convict? Inspector Trevely turned on him sharply. That is his name. No, 33 at Blackmore. He rapped. Is the name familiar to you, sir? Oh, no. I've never heard of him, answered Price. He turned away as he spoke, his eyes on the doorway by which Walsingham was to return. There was a peculiar glimmer in his eyes. He had not forgotten that strange episode when the butler had caught him in the oak gallery in convict garb and addressed him by name. Price had puzzled over that a good many times. The name the butler had uttered was Richard. Now Price learned that the name of convict no. 33 was Richard Pike. The coincidence was, at least, a very strange one. There were very strange thoughts in Price's mind now. He drew Cedric Hilton to a window. Walsingham's gone for that bundle of clobber, Cedric, he murmured. Hilton stayed at him. Eh, hey, yes. What about it? He asked. I wonder if you'll turn up with it. Why shouldn't he? Price smiled. Might have lost it or something, he drawled. What utter rot, said Hilton. Well, here he comes, and he doesn't seem to have a bundle with him, said Price, with a grin. Walsingham came back by the service doorway. His face was very grave and had a disturbed look, and he came empty-handed. I'm sorry, he faltered. What do you mean? Rapped Inspector Trevely. Where are the clothes? They are gone, sir. Gone, repeated the Oakham inspector blankly. Walsingham, exclaimed Sir Gilbert, in amazement. I'm very sorry, sir. I had, of course, not the remotest idea that they would not be safe in my room, said Walsingham. I laid the bundle on the table by my window. I directed you to lock them up safely, Walsingham, said Sir Gilbert sharply. I regret very much. Sir, that I neglected to do so, said Walsingham humbly, but I presumed, of course, that the bundle would be perfectly safe in my room. I found the window open, sir, and the bundle had disappeared. Some trump. 
Take me to your room at once. Wrapped Inspector Trevely. This way, sir. The Oakham Inspector followed Walsingham. Sir Gilbert followed on, frowning. Bob Cherry gave a whistle. What a sell, he remarked. Price smiled. Hilton looked at him very curiously. How Stephen Price had guessed that the butler would return without the bundle was a mystery to him, but Price did not explain. He avoided the subject that afternoon, and Hilton soon dismissed it carelessly from his mind, but Price of the Fifth did not. The Eighth Chapter The Rocket I say, you fellows, shut up, old fat man, and listen. Oh, really, Cherry? Shut up. Billy Bunter snorted. Shutting up was not in his line. The winter darkness lay thick on Blackmoor. Light flakes of snow whirled on the wind. There was a warm glimmer of light from the window that looked on the terrace, but the terrace itself was dusky, and beyond it the night was black. Bitter as the weather was, there were quite a number of persons outside the house that evening. All of them turned their glances continually in the direction of the distant summer house in the lodge plantation. Sir Gilbert, a massive figure in a fur coat, paced to and fro, the red end of his cigar gleaming through the gloom. Hilton and Price walked together. The famous five were in a group. They were rather surprised when Billy Bunter rolled out and joined them. It was not like the fat owl to face the bitter wind and the frosty air when there was a fire available to frost over. But here he was, with Wharton's warmest overcoat on and Bob Cherry's thickest scoff wound round his neck and Nugent's woolly gloves on his podgy hands and Johnny Ball's woolen pullover keeping him nice and warm under Wharton's overcoat. Billy Bunter had been very keen on the famous five spending Christmas at Hilton Hall with him. He had many reasons. Now he was wearing some of the reasons. The juniors watched and listened. Everybody knew that the police and warders were watching in the lodge plantation, that the bundle of clothing had been placed there for the hunted convict hardly admitted of doubt. It seemed fairly certain that he would come there for it under cover of darkness. There were more than a dozen men on the watch in the darkness among the frozen trees. If convict now. Thirty-three came he could hardly get away again. That he would come nobody doubted. But whether he would come early or late it was impossible to guess. Armed men were watching and waiting. And at any moment a shot might be heard to ring out. They'll get him, Bob Cherry declared. He can't have had a tip to keep clear from the pal who left the clobber for him. For that Johnny can't know that the club has gone. He hasn't been back to the summer house or the bobbies would have nailed him. Unless it's somebody in this household, interrupted Johnny Ball. My dear chap, that's impossible. Will, there are no end of people about the place, said Johnny. And most of the servants must know about the clobber being found and the bundle being pinched from Walsingham's room. Oh, rot, said Bob uneasily. The fact is, it looks a little bit like it, said Johnny, in his slow, argumentative way. What did the convict show up here at all for, unless there's somebody about the place he wanted to get in touch with? Bo oh, wow, said Bob. Fathead, said Johnny, and the chums or the remove stood silent again, listening for a sound through the wintry night, and peering into the dense December darkness. I say, you fellows, Billy Bunter restarted. I say, do listen to a chap. It's rather important. Fifty pounds is a lot of money. That remark drew the attention of the famous five. They stayed at the fat owl of the remove. Fifty pounds, repeated Wharton. Yes, old chap. It's a lot of money, said Bunter. Not so much to me as to you fellows. Perhaps, you silly ass, beast, we can do with it said Bunter. My idea is that I ought to take half. You fellows can whack out the other half. That will be a fiver each. After all, you'd never have been here but for me. What is the blithering ass blethering about? asked Bob Cherry, in wonder. Anybody know? Oh, really, Cherry? The blithering blatherfulness is terrific. Oh, really, in Kai? Well, what do you mean, you fat duffer? If you mean anything, demanded Harry Wharton. I mean the reward. What reward? 
Oh, you fellows never hear of anything, said Bunter peevishly. There's Bill's stock up outside the police station at Oakham, and in a dozen places, about the reward offered for the convict. There's a reward of fifty pounds for anybody giving information leading to his arrest. Well, what about it? Bunter jerked a fat hand towards the distant dockwood. They're watching for him there, he said. If they get him, it will be through you, fellows. You gave the information, so you will be able to claim the reward. Oh, my hat, ejaculated Bob Cherry. Mean to say you hadn't thought of that, demanded Bunter. Not a syllable. Well, you always were a silly ass, old chap. Think of it now, I've pointed it out to you, said the fat junior. What I want to know is, where do I come in? You don't come in at all. Oh, really, you beast? I don't think we should be entitled to the reward. Bunter, said Harry quietly, and I'm quite certain that we shouldn't claim it. Now shut up, you silly ass. Hooted Bunter, if they get him through you fellows giving them the tip, of course you're entitled to the reward, and I want to know where I come in. As I got you asked here for Christmas, I think I ought to have half. Cheese it. Well, look here, if you're going to be mean, ring off. If you're going to be mean, we'll work it out even, said Bunter. I can do with six or seven pounds. I happen to be short of money. What an unusual happening. Ha ha ha. Blessed if I see anything to cackle at. The fact is, coming on here straight from school, I've missed some postal orders I was expecting. You fellows have hardly lent me anything since we've been here, and I can jolly well tell you that I expected to be treated a bit more decently when I got you asked to a magnificent place like this for the holes. You howling us. You had nothing to do with Hilton asking us here, said Harry. He wrote to me asking the lot of us, he, he, he. What are you cackling at, you image? Well, I can jolly well tell you that it was out of friendship for me that Hilton asked you, said Bunter. I told him I'd like you to come. That was how it was. What utter rot. The rotfulness is terrific. Shut up, you gassing fat head. Look here, I don't want any cheek from you fellows, hooted Bunter. I can jolly well tell you that you'd get the cold shoulder here if I chose. I can tell you it all depends on me, and I can jolly well say, Yaru, beast, leg of my neck. Bump, Bunter sat down on the frosty terrace. Now shut up, said Bob. Oh, beast. Wow. The famous five moved father off, leaving Billy Bunter sitting and gasping for breath. More than once already Bunter had given mysterious hints that he had had a hand in Hilton sending them that invitation for Christmas. They did not believe a word of it, but it gave them an uncomfortable feeling. Certainly, had they known how Bunter had wangled that visit to Hilton Hall for the festive season, they would never have been found within a good many miles of Blackmoor. The owl of the remove picked himself up and rolled after them. His fat face was red. With wrath, look here, you beasts, he gasped, go and eat coke, I can jolly well tell you this, I'm coming in on that reward, hissed Bunter, if they get him tonight you'll get the reward, and I'm going to have my whack, you are, said Bob Cherry, and he handed one out on the spot, though it was not the sort of whack that Bunter meant, whoop, Bunter sat down again, hello, 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 what? Shouted Bob suddenly, his eyes caught sparks glittering in the darkness. What the thump, bang, whiz, squish. A trail of brilliant sparks shot in an arc through the blackness of the sky. A rocket, exclaimed Wharton. What the dickens, a rocket. Came Sir Gilbert Hilton's deep boom. A rocket, from somewhere in the grounds. Who can have fired it? I wonder, murmured Price with a grin. What silly ass is letting off fireworks here, exclaimed Hilton. One of the fags, not guilty, my lord, chuckled Bob Cherry. Then who what? It's a signal, said Price of the fifth coolie. 
and the sportsmen who are watching that summer house can go on watching, but they won't catch anybody now. The sparks died away, leaving the sky blacker than before. Was it a signal from the convict's unknown friend warning him of danger? Price of the fifth was sure of it, though he did not tell the other fellows his reasons. Some unseen, unknown hand had sent that rocket soaring skyward from some dock spot in the extensive grounds of Hilton Hall. Whether it was, or was not, a signal to the hunted man lurking in the darkness of the moor, the warders who were watching the summer house under the larches watched in vain. There was no news by the time the Greyfriars fellows went to bed. Through the dock, bitter night the watch went on, but it was in vain, and nothing was seen of convict now. Thirty-three when the grey dawn of Christmas glimmered in the sky. At the ninth chapter, the man hunt on the moor. A deep musical note came faintly across the moor. It echoed eerily among the leafless trees. At the bright and cheery breakfast table at Hilton Hall there was a general stot. The sound floated faintly in, and faint as it was from the distance, all knew it. Bloodhounds, breathed Bob Cherry, out on the wild moor. In the falling flakes, the hunt for the man from Blackmoor was going on on Christmas morning, and that ringing note from the frosty spaces told that a bloodhound was on the trail. Sir Gilbert Hilton rose and stepped to a window. Everyone listened, except Billy Bunter. Bunter was devoting himself to kidneys and bacon, a matter that required and received his whole attention. By God, they are after him with bloodhounds, murmured Cedric Hilton. Poor beggar, price of the fifth glanced at Walsingham. The butler was standing quite still, a dish in his plump hands. He seemed to be petrified by that sound from the moor. They'll get him now, if they've a scent to follow, said Bob Cherry. I don't know, it won't be easy to pick up a scent in the snow, said Harry Wharton. They never got him last night, remarked Nugent. He couldn't have gone to the summer house for that bundle of clothes. After all, I suppose that Rocket was a warning to him, but who the Dickens? Goodness knows, the Greyfriars fellows did not linger over breakfast. They were keen to see something of the manhunt that was going on on the wilds of Blackmoor. Billy Bunter preferred the warm indoors, and Hilton and Price strolled away to the billiards room, but Sir Gilbert trumped out in the snow and the famous five went with him. As they went down the Oak Avenue, the bay of the bloodhound was heard again from the distance. Glancing back, Harry Wharton noticed the portly form of Walsingham on the terrace, following them with his eyes, but the butler's duties kept him to the house. Far away on the moor was a bunch of dock figures against the white of the snow. Sir Gilbert and the juniors tramped over and joined them. The bloodhound, a huge animal, was held in leash by Inspector Trevely. A constable was with him, and two warders from the prison, and a keeper in Sir Gilbert's service. The warders had rifles under their arms. The hound was snuffing at a track in the snow. Slowly, as if in doubt, it pulled on the leash, leading the way, and the potty followed. And the track, do you think, Trevely? asked Sir Gilbert. I hope so, sir, answered the Oakham Inspector briefly. You saw nothing of him last night. Nothing. You noticed the rocket. I did, said Mr. Travelly grimly. It came from a spot very near your house. Sir Gilbert, you think it was a signal? I'm sure of it. The hound gave a sudden pull and started at a greater speed. Inspector Travelly said no more, but followed the hound, gripping the leash. Behind him followed the others. The way led across Blackmore and the high roofs of Hilton Hall dipped and disappeared in the wintry mist. Snowflakes were falling lightly, whirling on the bitter wind. The juniors turned up their coat collars and drew their scarves close. The cold on Blackmore was almost optic. By gum, murmured Bob Cherry, the man must be potty to keep to the open in this weather. Blackmoor prison must be better than this. The betterfulness must be terrific. Said Harry Jomsek Ram Singh, with a shiver. He hopes to get away, of course, said Harry, and he may, if his pal can get him a change of clothes, so that he can run for it. But he's risking his life in the cold and snow. 
and for his own sake, I hope they'll get him. Yes, rather. The dog was loping on steadily. It was clear that, in spite of the snow on the ground, it had picked up a good scent. Whether the convict had left footprints, they could not be told, as the fresh fallen flakes carpeted the ground. But unless the hound was mistaken, it was clear that he had passed that way. The juniors could picture him, in the darkness of the night, stealing towards Hilton Hall to pick up the bundle that had been left for him at the summer house, and then, warned by the rocket, fleeing away into the December night again. Somewhere on the wild, snowy moor he was lurking, waiting for another chance of help from his mysterious confederate. But if the hound was on the right track, it did not seem likely that that confederate, whoever he was, would ever be of help to him again. Poor beggar, muttered Bob. He must be starving, hardly, said Johnny Ball. Why not? asked Bob. There were clothes in that bundle. No food, said Johnny, shaking his head. His pal must have supplied him with food already, or there'd have been some put in the bundle for him. Oh, said Bob. I suppose that's so. Yes, that's likely enough, assented Harry. It looks as if the convict got in touch with the man, whoever he is, and they arranged for the clothes to be bought and placed in the summer house. When they met he would supply him with food. He would have given himself up before now if he'd had nothing to eat. Remark Nugent. Hallo, hallo, hallo. They found something. The hound had come to a stop in a hollow under the shelter of a high tor. He was snuffing and scratching at the snow. At a sign from the inspector his followers cleared the snow away. Signs of a camp were soon revealed. An empty beef tin lay there, and several other traces of a meal. It looked as if the hunted man had camped there for a time, the high tor sheltering him from the wind. Trevely examined the spot with keen eyes. The man had been there, that was certain. The hound was evidently on the right track. The party started once more, the bloodhound straining at the leash. The junior scanned the moor with eager eyes. The winter mist was thick at a little distance, cutting off the view. The man might have been within a hundred yards, and yet unseen. They wondered whether he had sighted the hunters and fled from them, but if so, the falling flakes had already hidden his tracks. The hound pulled and pulled, and its deep bay rang through the frosty silence. With a thrill at their hearts, T.H.E. Juniors followed on. The way now led up the side of a steep tor that rose to a height of three or four hundred feet, rugged and banked with snow. The hound loped on steadily, but several times the man following it slipped in the snow and stumbled over. It was hard going. The schoolboys were panting for breath by the time the summit was reached. In clear weather, there would have been a view of Blackmoor for miles on every side. Now the winter mist hung like a blanket, shutting it off. Visibility not good, murmured Bob Cherry. The sense holding, said Harry. Across the rugged summit of the tall the hound loped on. The juniors were panting. Sir Gilbert Hilton puffed and blew. All the manhunters showed signs of fatigue, but they kept grimly on. They had little doubt that they were close behind the hunted man now. So far he had baffled pursuit, but now that the bloodhound had been put on the track, it looked as if his game was up. Unerring, unswerving, the hound loped on. Bob Cherry uttered a sudden exclamation. Look, it was a footprint in the snow. Evidently it was very recent, for the flakes were falling fast, but had not yet hidden it. Inspector Trevelli's eyes gleamed. He rapped out a word, and the constable loosened his truncheon, and the warders slipped the rifles from under their arms into their hands. It was clear to all that they were close now on Richard Pike, convict now. 33. Trevely glanced round at the juniors. You boys had better keep back. He jerked. Yes, yes, keep back out of danger, my lads, said Sir Gilbert. It was not for the juniors to argue, so they dropped to the rear. But they followed on, with keen eyes and beating hearts. Halfway down the slope from the summit of the tall to the level of the snow-covered moor below, a deep chasm split the earth. It cut across the hillside, barring the way. 
Its depth could not be seen, but it was wide, the edges crumbling with snow. If the hunted man was still on the near side of it, he was cornered, and there was little doubt he was. They've got him, murmured Nugent. There came a shop, yelling bay from the hound, and it leaped at the leash, almost dragging itself loose. From a hollow of the snow, a figure leaped up and ran. There was a shout from the whole party. It was a wild figure in convict gob, with a blanket wrapped round it. The convict, panted Wharton, stop, roared Inspector Trevely. The man did not stop, and did not look round. He bounded away down the steep slope, directly towards the chasm that bought the way. The blanket dropped from him, as he ran. Crack. One of the warders fired over his head. The report of the rifle awoke a thousand echoes, rolling through the mists. The convict ran on. The madman, panted Sit Gilbert. He will be killed. Stop. He roared to the fleeing man. Stop. The convict raced on. Crack. Ran the rifle again, the bullet whizzing belly two inches over the convict's ears. But the warning was unheeded. The fleeing man had almost reached the gap. The manhunters came to a breathless stop. Surely he must have seen that deadly obstacle in his path. Surely he would halt in time. The juniors felt their hearts leap to their mouths as they watched him, spellbound. He did not stop, but he had seen the rift in the rugged side of the tor. As he reached it he rose in a wild and desperate bound. Oh! gasped Bob. They watched, fascinated. For a second that seemed an age the leaping figure of the convict was in the air, over the yawning gulf below. Then he crashed on the farther side, but he had not quite made the jump. It was his chest that crashed on the snowy edge of the chasm, and he was seen to clutch and grasp at the crumbling snow with frantic hands. Long, long seconds passed as they watched, unable to help, unable to approach the desperate man whose life hung in the balance. They panted with relief as they saw him drag himself to safety. He plunged headlong into the snow on the farther side of the rift, and lay there, gasping and panting, but only for a few moments. Then he scrambled up again, and looked back. On the edge of the chasm the bloodhound halted, baying fiercely, but the hound could not leap the space, much less the men. Only utter desperation had enabled the hunted man to make the jump and he had barely escaped with his life. He glared back across the chasm, shook his clenched fist, and dotted away through the falling flakes. Shoot, roared Inspector Trevely. Shoot, crack, crack. The rifles roared, but in a few moments the snow and the mists had swallowed the hunted man from sight. The rift had to be followed a quarter of a mile before a crossing was practicable. By that time there was little hope of getting the hunted man. One small convict now. Thirty-three of Blackmore had escaped. The tenth chapter, Pudding for Price. Billy Bunter awoke. It was Christmas night. Billy Bunter had had a merry Christmas. He had expected the good cheer at Hilton Hall to be very good. It had surpassed his expectations. He had dreamed of the turkey. Mince pies and Christmas pudding had mingled in his dreams, happy dreams. Bunter, fortunately, had the digestion of a ostrich. Otherwise, the good cheer of Hilton Hall might have caused trouble, considering the vast quantities of the same that Bunter had popped within his capacious circumference. Perhaps he was not sleeping so soundly as usual that night. Possibly the turkey and the Christmas pudding were not on the best of terms with the army of mince pies that had followed them on the downward path. He sat up in bed. There was a red glow from the fire, which Bunter had banked up with Lux before turning in. Once awake, Bunter's fat mind naturally turned to food. No one who did not know Bunter would have guessed that he had any available space left. But Billy Bunter knew that he might get hungry in the night and he had taken precautions. He had annexed a Christmas pudding to carry up to his room. Now it lay on a dish on the table beside his bed. If Bunter woke up hungry, there it was, ready for him. He had woke up. Even Bunter was not exactly hungry. Still, the thought of the pudding was attractive. 
He felt that he could dispose of a pound or two before snuggling down to sleep again. He was about to stretch out a fat hand towards the pudding when he stopped and stayed. A dark shadow passed between him and the firelight. Panta felt a thrill of startled alarm. He was not alone in the room. He blinked. The door was locked. With Price of the Fifth in the house, Bunta was not likely to neglect to lock his door before turning in. Price had not ventured to make any attempt to annex his bedroom key again. With the door safely locked on the inside, Bunta had felt quite secure. Yet there, standing between him and the firelight, was the figure of Stephen Price of the Greyfriars Fifth. Bunta hardly breathed. This time Price was not got up in fancy costume. His previous exploit, no doubt, had fed him up with that device. With the firelight gleaming on his hard, set face, he was recognizable at a glance. Bunter knew him at once. How Price had got there was a mystery, but Bunter, as he blinked from the dark shadows of the bed, discerned that a wardrobe door was wide open, and he remembered that Price had gone up to bed before the rest. He understood. Price, when he went up, had not gone to his own room. He had gone to Bunter's room and hidden himself in that big wardrobe. There he had remained concealed, while Bunter locked his door and went to bed. It was quite a simple device, really. Bunter might have looked for something of the kind, had he ever foreseen anything. He was well aware how keen Price was to get hold of that dangerous letter, but it was not the fat owl's way to foresee anything. Oh, law, breathed Bunter. He groped silently under the pillow for his spectacle case and jammed his big spectacles on his fat little nose and blinked at Price. It was an old-fashioned bed with curtains and Bunter was quite hidden from view. Either was Price looking towards him. He was stepping to the chair on which Bunter had laid his clothes. Stooping over the folded clothes, Price went through the pockets. Bunter watched him. He was not uneasy about Price finding the letter in his pockets. The letter was not there. That letter was, in point of fact, hidden inside the lining of Bunter's cup, and his cup was under his pillow. There was a faint rustling as Price searched the pockets, in vain. Billy Bunter watched him with growing uneasiness. Price had remained in his place of concealment till he was certain that Bunter was asleep. Now he is searching for the letter. What was he going to do when he failed to find it? His stealthy caution showed that he did not want another alarm in the night. Bunter thought of giving a yell to awaken the juniors in the adjoining room. That, no doubt, would send Price on the run. But was he likely to punch Bunter before he ran? It was only too likely. Bunter remained silent, blinking at the stealthy cad of the fifth in anxious uneasiness. Price finished with the clothes at last. He stood for some moments in thought, and in the glow of the firelight Bunter could see the savage and bitter expression of disappointment on his hard face. He drew the bed curtains further open, and his eyes gleamed at Bunter. He gave a sudden start as he discerned that the fat junior was sitting up wide awake, with his little round eyes almost bulging through his big round spectacles. Oh, squeaked Bunter, here you keep off you beast. I, I'll yell and wake the house. Price gritted his teeth. Do, he said, and I'll smash you, you fat rotter. Give just one howl, and I'll knock your nose through the back of your head. Beast, gasped Bunter. Price's narrow eyes glittered at him. Where's that letter? He snapped. Warty letter, stuttered Bunter. You know what I mean. The letter Walsingham wrote to Hilton at Greyfriars, and that you pinched. You young scoundrel, you know that that's what I'm here for, and I'm not going without it. I, I say, where is it? I, I left it at Greyfriars, Gus Bunter. I mean, I left it at home. That is, I asked Wharton to mind it for me. You, you'd better go to Wharton's room, and, and ask him, where's that letter? Bob Cherry's got it. I, I asked him to, to take care of it for me. If, if you go and see Bob, ow, gasped Bunter, as Price made a grab at him. I, I say, you beast, I'll wake the house. Give me that letter, or I'll thrash you till you can't squeak. 
said Price in low, concentrated tones that left no doubt that he meant every word that he said. He, I, I, let go. I'll get it, Gus Bunter. Price let go and stood watching him and waiting. Billy Bunter gasped with dismay. Price was in deadly earnest, and the fat owl of the remove did not want to be thrashed till he could not squeak. Very much indeed he didn't. His eyes fell on the Christmas pudding on the dish at the bed head. His eyes gleamed behind his spectacles. I, I, I'll get it. He gasped. Shop. Snap Price. Billy Bunter shifted nearer to the bedside table. His fat brain did not usually work swiftly, but it was working at double pressure now. Bunter had an idea. He disentangled his fat limbs from the back clothes, ready to jump. Then he reached out to the pudding. He grabbed up the pudding hole in both fat hands. What? Began Price. He did not finish the question. Plop. Price gave a muffled gurgle and staggered back with a Christmas pudding squashing over his face. He sat down on the floor with a bump. Bunter made a frantic bound from the bed. The bedside table went over, and the dish cracked on the floor. With a bound, Bunter reached the door, turned back the key, tore the door open, and bounded out. I say, you fellows, he yelled. Arag came in a gurgle from Price of the Fifth as he grabbed at squash pudding on his face. Billy Bunter rushed into the nearest room. Harry Wharton was suddenly awakened by a fat hand clawing at his features. Oh, help. Gust Bunter, that beast, Price. Wharton blinked at him, that silly owl locking again. Oh, yes. He's in my room, I say. Wharton did not wait for Bunter to say any more. If Price of the Fifth was practical joking in the middle of the night again, Price wanted a lesson on the subject of nocturnal practical joking, and Harry Wharton, jumping out of bed, grasped his pillow and rushed along to Bunter's room to give Price of the Fifth the lesson he needed. The eleventh chapter, A Mistake in the Dock. Price of the Fifth clawed wildly at his sticky face. Christmas pudding taken internally was very agreeable, in fact, grateful and comforting. Taken externally, it was hard. The pudding had jammed hard on Price's shop features. Most of it had fallen to the floor, but quite a lot was sticking to his eyes, his nose and the rest of his face. He was masked with pudding. He gurgled and gasped and clawed, but busy as he was with the pudding, he realized that it was time to go. He heard Bunter yelling in the next room, and he did not want the famous five swarming over him. He staggered to the door, and still clawing pudding from his face, ran out, crush, bump. It was dark in the passage, and he did not even see a running figure in pajamas. Autumn crashed into him, and sent him spinning. He bumped heavily on the floor. Oh. He spluttered. Wow. Yorg. Harry Wharton staggered back from the shock. He had hardly a glimpse of Price in the darkness, but he knew whom it must be. And in a moment his pillow was rising and falling. Swipe, swipe, swipe. Ugh. Gurgled Price, wildly, as the pillow smoked. He caught it with his head, then with his nose, then with his neck. Swipe, swipe, take that, you silly ass. Hunted Wharton, and that, and that, and that. You howling fat head, what do you want to come skylarking in the middle of the night for? Take that. Swipe, swipe. Price took them all, he could not help it. Twice he almost got on his feet, and the swiping pillow knocked him down again. He roared and yelled. Swipe, swipe. Hello, hello, hello. A shout came from Bob Cherry's room. What the thump? I say, you fellows, it's Price, squeaked Billy Bunter. That us, Price. It was Nugent's voice. This way, shouted Wharton. Come and give him a few. What how? Stephen Price, dazed and dizzy and panting, struggled somehow to his feet. The swiping pillow missed him as he dodged. He started at a desperate run along the passage. Frank Nugent switched on the passage light. Price was seen to vanish round the corner into the oaken gallery over the hall. After him, shouted Bob, I say, you fellows, give him Jip, give him Toko, give him Beans. 
squeaked Billy Bunter. I say, the juniors rushed down the passage. All the famous five were up now. It was cold, in pyjamas, with bare feet, cold and chilly, but they did not stop to think of that. Why Price, a fifth form man and a senior, was us enough to go about skylarking after midnight they could not guess, little dreaming of what had brought him to Billy Bunter's room, but they were all ready to impress upon him that he had better chuck it, whatever his reason might be. Pillows in hand, they rushed after Price. There was thick darkness in the oak gallery over the hall. Price naturally did not stop to switch on a light as he ran. He was only anxious to escape, and he hoped to get back to his room without the house being alarmed. He did not want another scene such as had happened before. He tore along the gallery. The juniors were all behind him, and had not yet turned the corner, and it did not occur to him for a moment that there was anybody ahead of him in the darkness but there was. He crashed suddenly, headlong, into some unseen form, and there was a startled gasp. The unseen form sprawled over, and Price sprawled upon it. He heard a breathless panting underneath him. Who it was he did not know, and did not stop to inquire. He leaped to his feet, ran on, and dodged into the passage that led to his own room. As he went, he heard a sound of scuffling, bumping, and exclaiming voices behind. Evidently the juniors, rushing after him along the dock gallery, had stumbled over the man he had knocked down. Price did not pause. The delay gave him time to escape, and he made the best use of it. Possibly the man was some servant who had been awakened. Possibly Sir Gilbert Hilton himself. Price neither knew nor cared. He darted into his room, shut the door, and locked it after him. He was safe now, whether the pursuit was continued or not. As a matter of fact, it was not. Harry Wharton, stumbling over the figure sprawling in the dark gallery, came down on it with a crush. And he had no doubt that it was Price. Unaware that anyone else was up at that hour, it was rather a natural mistake in the dark. And the only sound that came from the sprawling figure as he crashed on it was a breathless, anguished gurgle. Dorog, Wharton scrambled up, planting his knee on a face as he did so. His pillow was still in his hands. Up it went, and down it came. Swipe, Dorog, swipe, swipe, swipe. Take that, you silly ass. Warg, got him, panted Bob Cherry, groping up in the dock. He could hear a sound like the beating of Coppet. Yes, here he is, give him a few, panted Wharton. Warg. Let's get at him, exclaimed Johnny Ball. Give him beans, the silly ass. No. Oog, stop it, came a gasping voice. Oh dear, oh. The sprawling figure found its voice. Oh. Stop, oh. That's not Price, gasped Bob. Oh my hat. Who the thump? What the dickens? Wharton ceased to swipe with his pillow. He realized that it was not Price of the Fifth who was getting the swipes. There was a gleam of light in the dark gallery. Frank Nugent had brought a flash lamp from his room. He flashed on the light. The junior stared at the sprawling man as he was revealed to view. Walsingham, exclaimed Wharton blankly. Oh, my hat, gasped Bob Cherry, the jolly old butler, great Pip, the esteemed and venerable Walsingham, ejaculated Harry Jumset Ram Singh. In amazement, Walsingham sat up. He was dizzy and breathless. Probably it was his first experience of a pillowing. It had knocked all the breath out of the portly butler. Oog, he gasped. Woog, Arug, sorry, gasped Wharton. I, I thought it was Price, Arug. That silly ass has been skylarking, and we were after him, stammered the captain of the remove. I, I thought I'd got him when I fell over you, Arug. Bob and Wharton lent the butler a hand to rise. He staggered to his feet and leaned on the polished oaken rail of the gallery, panting for breath. The juniors eyed him. They were sorry for the mistake in the dark and for the pillowing the butler had received, which had been intended for Price of the Fifth. But they could not help wondering what Walsingham was doing up at that hour. The house was in darkness. Everybody was in bed, or supposed to be in bed. 
Walsingham was fully dressed and evidently had not been to bed at all yet. Price, so far as they knew, had been practical joking, but the portly, staid butler of Hilton Hall could hardly be suspected of practical joking. Why he was still out of bed and going about the house in the dock was an utter mystery. Walsingham panted and panted, after being bodged over by Price and pillowed by Harry Wharton, it was not easy for the butler of Hilton Hall to recover his stately calm. Awfully sorry, Walsingham, said Harry. I couldn't see you, of course, and that us Price ran this way. Why hadn't you a light? I, I. Walsingham gasped. I, I. He broke off. Please go back to bed, young gentleman. Sir Gilbert would be very displeased if he were awakened again by such a disturbance. Well, we shan't get price now, said Bob. Sorry, Walsingham, but you should have had a light. Why the Dickens hadn't you? Walsingham did not answer that question. He was gasping for breath and did not seem to hear it. Well, good night, Walsingham, said Harry. Good night, sir, Walsingham gasped. Shall I switch on the light for you? Ask Nugent. No, no. Please go back to bed. The famous five returned to their own quarters. Billy Bunter had already gone back to bed, and a snore could be heard behind a locked door. What the dickens was that butler chap up to, rooting about the house in the dark? Asked Bob, as the juniors reached their quarters. Goodness knows, it's queer. The queerfulness is terrific. Well, it's no Bisney of ours, I suppose, said Bob, and the company agreed that it was not, and went back to bed. Uh, the twelfth chapter, Boxing Night, lights were gleaming from the many windows of Hilton Hall, casting ruddy light into the wintry darkness. It was Boxing Night, and all was merry and bright. A wailing wind shrieked over the old roofs and among the chimney pots, and rattled the creaking branches of leafless trees. Outside all was wintry, but within was light and merriment. Motorcars came continually up the dusky drive and landed guests at the great door. Mingled with the buzz of cheery voices came the strains of the band, already playing a merry tune. Sir Gilbert and Lady Hilton received their guests, with smiling, hospitable faces. Walsingham and his Myrmidons were all very busy. The great door stood open. The night, though bitterly cold, was fine and clear and frosty, and a myriad star spangled. The dark sky over Blackmore, Harry Wharton, as he looked out from the brightly lit hall into the winter night, thought of the wretched man lurking on the moor with a feeling of compassion. Nothing had been seen of the escaped convict since he had leaped the chasm on the rugged slope of the torn escaped. The manhunt was still going on, but without success. Autumn started a little as he looked out and caught sight of a figure in uniform in the starry dusk of the terrace. It was Inspector Trevely. There was a chuckle at his side, and he glanced round at Bob Cherry. That's the jolly old Bobby from Oakham, said Bob. Does he fancy that convict now? Thirty-three is coming to the dance. Harry Wharton laughed. I say it will make him jump if he looks in and sees Price of the Fifth, murmured Bob. Wharton glanced across at Price, who was standing talking to Hilton. Hilton was looking very handsome in a cavalier costume. Price got up in his convict costume looked anything but handsome, but there was no doubt that it was effective, and it made rather a sensation. Price rather liked getting the spotlight, and he was getting it in his convict outfit, with his face skillfully touched up with makeup, bushy eyebrows, and stubbly chin complete, he looked the convict to the life. His own natural appearance had quite disappeared, apart from the half-mask on his face. Tilly asked to get himself up in that costume, remarked Bob. He's done it well, said Harry. Yes, but it's a rotten idea. Still, he's got everybody looking at him, and I suppose that's what he wants. I say, you fellows, hello, hello, hello. What are you, Bunter? Grinned Bob. All the company were in costume, and Billy Bunter was got up fearfully and wonderfully as a brigand. 
He had fastened on a pair of immense and fierce-looking moustaches that curled up almost to his eyes, but he seemed to be having trouble with those moustaches. Banter was going to dance. He fancied himself in that line, but his heart was in the supper room. He had already dropped into that department, and there were traces of mince pies about his capacious mouth. Chomping mince pies had loosened his moustache, and it was coming off. Eh? I'm a brigand, said Bunter, blinking through the eye holes of his mask, with a gleam of spectacles. Rather knobby, what? Oh, ripping, said Harry, with a smile. I say, you fellows, got any gum or anything about you? Asked Bunter. These beastly moustaches are coming off. There's a bottle of fixing gum in my room. Go up and fetch it, old chap. Bow wow. I'll fix it for you, fatty, said Bob. I've got a pin here, warty. Steady while I pin it on. Bunter made a backward jump. Beast. He gasped. Jerway. Ha ha ha. Billy Bunter disappeared. Apparently he did not want that troublesome moustache pinned onto his fat face. Wharton looked out of the door again. A stocky figure appeared for a moment in the starlight and disappeared again. It was a warder from Blackmore Prison. He wondered whether the convict had been seen near Hilton Hall. It seemed to him unlikely that the man would venture to approach the house while it was blazing with lights and crowded with guests. As he stood looking out there was a tap on his arm. He glanced round at Cedric Hilton's smiling face. Come on, said Hilton. They dancing, old bean. What's interest in you outside? Saw a warder. Hilton started. A warder here. Good God, is that jolly old convict about? Shouldn't wonder, said Price, joining him and staring out into the frosty night. Chance for somebody to pick up fifty pounds. Cedric. Hilton shrugged his shoulders disdainfully. What rot? He said. I hope nobody here's thinking of that. Why not? Answered Price coolly. Fifty rounds is worth bagging, and the man's a rotten character and ought to be rounded up. I've been asking questions about him, and I hear that he's up Blackmore, or was rather, for knocking a man down and robbing him. If I can get hold of him I shouldn't turn up my nose at the reward, I can tell you. Hilton's lip curled. Well, you're not likely to have a chance, he said curtly. I can't quite see you handling the man if you spotted him, Pricey. Wharton smiled involuntarily at that remark. Price of the Fifth was anything but a hero, and certainly no one who knew him would have expected him to take an active hand in dealing with a dangerous character. Price gave the junior an angry scowl. Plenty of men about to handle him if a fellow spotted him, he said. I could do with that fifty. He's not likely to let you spot him, grunted Hilton. Forget it. You never know your luck, said Price. Oh, rot, come along and hop. Price shook his head. Later, he said. Hilton shrugged his shoulders again and walked away with Wharton. The orchestra was discussing sweet melody now and the dancing was going on. The company were all going to trip the light fantastic too. Three of them were good dancers, and Bob Cherry and Johnny Ball were willing, if not skillful. There were a good many guests of their own age, both boys and girls, and partners were plentiful. In a very short time, Harry Wharton and company forgot all about the warders outside in the frost and the man they were hunting, but Price of the Fifth was not thinking a present of the dance. He was thinking of convict now. Thirty-three and of the fifty pounds reward offered for his capture, or information leading thereto, price of the fifth was hard up, and he had left more debts unpaid at the end of last term than he cared to think of. Hilton had been in the same difficulty at the term's end, but Christmas tips from wealthy relatives had seen him through. Price had no wealthy relatives to tip him, and the bare possibility of bagging fifty pounds in a lump sum was very attractive to his mind, and Price had his own reasons, good reasons, for believing that he could, if he liked, lay his finger on the unknown confederate who was helping, or trying to help, the escape man from Blackmore.
while the dance was going on, Mary Lee Price slipped quietly sway and tapped at the door of the butler's room. There were many servants to be seen about, but he noticed that Walsingham was no longer visible. He tapped softly at the door of Walsingham's room and opened it. Had the butler been there, he would have made some excuse or other, but he did not expect the butler to be there, and he was right. The room was empty and unlighted, but the window was wide open, and a glimmer of frosty starlight came in. Softly Price of the Fifth stepped into the room, crossed to the window, and looked out. The window looked from the side of the house and a dock terrace. Price's heart was beating rather fast as he peered out into the December night. From the distance came the strains of music, unheeded. Price had forgotten both dance and dancers, forgotten that he was in costume, forgotten everything but his certainty that he had the clue to the escaped convict fairly in his hand. Where was Walsingham? Walsingham had fallen in a faint that night when the haggard face of the escaped convict had been seen pressed to a window pane of Hilton Hall. Had be recognized that face, Price had not thought of it at the time any more than anyone else, but the night the butler had encountered him in his convict garb he had evidently taken him for the blackmail man and had addressed him as Richard. That had only puzzled him till he had learned that the convict's name was Richard Pike. After that he knew, the disappearance of the bundle of clothes front Walsingham's keeping was exactly what he had expected. He knew, at least he was sure, that Walsingham had placed that bundle in the summer house for the convict to find. It was the butler of Hilton Hall who was the secret helper of the escaped man of Blackmore. Price had no doubt about it. And now the police and the prison warders were watching the building while the boxing night festivities were going on. That meant that they knew, or suspected, that convict now. 33 was somewhere near Hilton Hall. They had seen him or picked up some trace of him, and Walsingham had gone out, evidently by the open window from his room. What did it mean? Price could see nothing on the terrace. He stepped over the low sill of the window. Silently he moved along, wary and watchful. There was a sudden step, and a portly figure looked up in the gloom. You are here, came a gasping voice. It was the butler. The next moment he detected the half-mask on Price's face, and knew that it was the Greyfriar's fifth former in costume. He started back, biting his lip hard. Price suppressed a grin. He knew, as well as if Walsingham had told him, that the butler was there to look for convict now, 33, and that he had for the moment taken price for him, but Walsingham recovered his calmness in a moment. You startled me, Mr. Price, he said apologetically. Sorry, said Price, I'm just taking a stroll to smoke a cigarette. Walsingham, very good, sir. Walsingham hesitated, then slowly he went on towards his room, and disappeared into the shadows. Price grinned. Faintly from the distance he heard the sounds of music, but he did not heed. If convict now. Thirty-three came, as Walsingham evidently expected, he would not escape unseen. Price drew into the deep shadow of a buttress, and watched and waited. The thirteenth chapter struck down. Convict now. Thirty-three, shivering in the bitter cold, blotted himself behind the trunk of a tree in the gloom. From where he leapt in the dark grounds he could see many lighted windows, and he could hear the strains of music from the orchestra engaged at Hilton Hall for the boxing night dance. He snarled savagely as he listened. The light and gaiety in the crowded building contrasted bitterly with his own desperate and forlorn condition. There was snow under the trees, though it was no longer falling. The night was clear and frosty, the sky like steel, only dimmed here and there by the drifts of mist overhanging the moor. Footfalls came to the ears of the lurking convict, and every now and then a whispering voice. He was hunted, and knew that he was hunted, almost in the shadow of Hilton Hall. A track, perhaps, had been picked up in the snow by the men who had hunted him for days and nights, 
or perhaps it was suspected that his unknown helper was in the mansion of Sir Gilbert Hilton. That was likely enough. They must guess that he had some motive for lurking in the vicinity of the hall, instead of fleeing to a distance across the wild moors. And the blanket he had dropped in his flight on Christmas morning might have been traced as belonging to the house. Anyhow, they were hunting him as if they knew that he was there and in the bitter cold and gloom he shuddered with the certainty that they were closing in on him. Help he must have food, clothes, money, if he was to escape after days and nights of bitter hardship. But they knew that he was getting help, and that gave them the clue they wanted. Crouching behind the tree, he listened. A voice spoke in a low tone within three yards of him. He caught the muttered words of Inspector Trevely. There's no doubt. None. He is here, and he is close to the buildings. He will not get through to the moor again. He may dodge into some outhouse or into the mansion itself. We faint footfalls moved on, and the voice died into silence. The convict gritted his teeth. He knew that they were closing in on him. His escape to the open moors was cut off now. In the frosty shudders men were watching for him, and others were seeking him, hunting him close to the buildings. He clenched his half-frozen hands with bitter rage. The night would end for him, in his cell once more, within the grim stone walls of Blackmore Prison. There was little doubt of that, but, like a hunted animal, he meant to give all the trouble he could, to fight out the losing struggle to the bitter end. A footfall close at hand, a stocky figure moved through the shadows of the trees and touched him. It was a warder. A startled exclamation came from the man, but before it was fairly uttered, the convict's clenched fist struck, and the man went down heavily. A shouting voice came from a little distance. Another shout followed. The fallen man gave a cry, panting, convict no. Thirty-three dashed away from the spot. Voices sounded and echoed through the shadows behind him, and the terrace at the side of the mansion he crouched close against the wall. Panting, a jutting buttress in the old stone wall was close at hand, and he crept along it to crouch in its shadow. As he did so a figure emerged from the shadow of the buttress, a figure so like his own that even in the gloom he halted amazed as he stayed at it. A convict, no. Thirty-three stood transfixed. A convict, another escaped man of Blackmore. Then he discerned that a black half-mask was over the face, and the truth leaped into his mind. He knew that a fancy dress dance was going on in the mansion. He had had glimpses of figures in costume at doors and windows. The half-mask on the face told its tale. This was one of the company in fancy dress. He stood with throbbing heart, not six feet from Price of the Fifth, who had not seen him. Price was looking towards the trees, listening to the low calling voices from the night. But a second or two later Price became aware of him. Perhaps a panting breath caught his ear. He spun round. Ow! Oh. Rusked Price, falling back a pace hurriedly. His face went pale under the makeup on it. It was a quarter of an hour since Walsingham had left him. He had waited in the shadow of the buttress, watching. He had been certain that, sooner or later, the butler would make some fresh move that he would spot him in communication with a convict. But it was not the butler who had appeared. It was convict now. Thirty-three, and Price backed from him in sheer terror. A second more, and he would he would have been running. But that second was not granted him. Everything was at stake now for the hunted man, and he was on the fifth former of Greyfriars with the leap of a tiger. Crush. His clenched fist struck Price on the temple. Only one faint cry escaped the Greyfriars senior as he fell. He was stunned. Convict now. Thirty-three bent over him, with glittering eyes, ready to strike again. But it was not necessary. Price was unconscious. There was a shout. Keen ears had caught a sound, and running footsteps followed. They were coming. The game was up. In a few moments more, but in those moments the hunted man's brain worked swiftly. He grasped the half-mask from Price's face and fastened it on his own. 
He ran swiftly along the terrace to a spot where a window was open. That was the only way left to him, into the house. There was a chance, a chance, at least, that if he was seen he would be taken for the guest in fancy costume, the fellow who was got up as a convict. It was the only chance left to the hunted man of Blackmore, and he took it. Even as he leaped in at the open window there were footsteps on the terrace behind him. He heard a sound of a stumble. A panting voice followed. Here he is. We've got him. Inside the butler's room, convict now. Thirty-three panted. Pursuit had ceased. Two or three men had gathered round the fallen figure in fancy dress on the terrace. For a moment he did not understand. Then it flashed into his mind that they had taken the fellow in convict gob for him. Softly he closed the window. As he did so he heard voices again from the shadows outside. It's him. Fainted, I suppose. Well, he's been through it hard. Get hold of him. They were carrying the insensible fellow away. Convict now. Thirty-three grinned with savage mockery. It would be some time in the dark before they discovered their mistake. He had a chance. The fourteenth chapter. A change of identity. Pricey old bean. Hilton of the fifth tapped the dapper figure in convict garb on the arm. He was a little startled by the gleam in the eyes that turned on him through the eye holes in Price's mask. I've been looking for you, he said. Convict now. Bertie three muttered something indistinctly. He was cool. Cool as ice. Twenty thirty. Pairs of eyes had turned on him since he had emerged from the room by which he had entered the house but there had been no suspicion in any of them. Outside the warders had taken the unconscious fellow in convict gob for him. Inside, the guests of Hilton Hall were taking him for the fellow he had knocked down and stunned. He had avoided speaking so far, which was easy enough, but he could not avoid it. Now as this handsome fellow in cavalier costume came up and tapped him on the arm and addressed him as pricey, Evidently the fellow he had knocked down was named Price, and this was a friend of his, Bean, out of doors. Asked Hilton puzzled, you're frightfully lucky, Pricey, been out collecting mud, or what? By God, if old Trevely looked in now, he would take you for the man he's hunting for. Convict now. Thirty-three laughed, he thought that very likely, you're going to dance. Asked Hilton. Oh, certainly. The convict spoke in a low, husky tone, coughing as he did so. He knew that this fellow, whoever he was, would know the voice of the person be fancied he was speaking to. He assumed a husky cough for disguise, catching a cold. Asked Hilton, you must be an ass to go out in that rig, Pricey. It's freezing outside. I'm all right. You don't sound all right. Look here, I've been going to introduce you to my cousin Amy. You've never met her, and I've asked her to keep a dance for you. I've told her how you hop, old man. Come on. Hilton dragged him away. I say, you fellows, there's that ass price. A fat voice was heard. He'd get jolly well running in that rig if the bobbies saw him. He, he, he. A few minutes later, convict now. Thirty-three was dancing with a tall, slim girl who found her cousin Cedric's school pal an excellent dancer. Hilton, from a little distance, watched him rather curiously. It struck him that there was some change in price, though he could not quite make out what it was. The figure was much the same, the gob was the same, the general appearance was the same, but there was some sort of difference. Cedric Hilton little dreamed how tremendous that difference was, however. Another pair of eyes was fixed on the dancing convict, from the doorway of a dressing room, eyes that almost bulged from a plump and portly face as they watched. Walsingham stood there, rooted, a fat figure of a brigand with one moustache curling up into his eye and the other curling down under his fat chin, rolled into the room and poked the butler in the ribs with a podgy thumb. I say, stick this on for me, said Billy Bunter. The beastly thing keeps on coming off. Walsingham did not hear. His eyes were on the dancers in the distance, following the convict in a fascinated way. Deaf.
grunted Bunter. He gave Walsingham another jab in the ribs. Where's the sticking gum? Demanded the owl of the remove. Can't you make yourself useful? What the thump are you here for? I'd like to know. I say, Walsingham, don't bother, please. Why at? Billy Bunter blinked at the butler in angry indignation and astonishment. You cheeky ass, what do you mean? Find that fixing gum for me, and look sharp, see. Walsingham breathed hard, but he turned to give the fat owl the assistance he wanted. Fixing gum was dabbed on the troublesome moustache and once more it was righted, and the fat brigand rolled away. As he went out of the room, the convict passed him, coming in. Bunter gave him a blink and a sniff. I say, Price, you look an awful ass in that rig, he said, and rolled on hastily before Price of the Fifth could reply, little guessing that it was very far from being Stephen Price that he had addressed. The convict gave a quick glance round the room. Walsingham's bulging eyes were on him. He stepped towards the butler. I spotted you, he muttered. You know me, Richard, breathed Walsingham. In a suffocated voice, the convict grinned mockingly. Nobody here knows me, except you, he said. But if I'm Snuffle, they will know me. Are you going to help me out? You must be mad to come here, breathed Walsingham. They have taken you for Mr. Price, who is got up as a convict, or you would have been discovered at once. But if he is seen about, and I cannot imagine why he is out of sight all this time. Never mind that. Help me and lose no time. I've got to get out of this. You should not have come in my master's house. Cut that out. I'm as anxious to go as you can be to see the last of me. You're going to help me. Blood's thicker than water. Get me out of sight where I can change. The butler of Hilton Hall stood for a moment as if in doubt. Then he nodded and opened a door into a small adjoining room. The convict passed through, and the butler closed the door after him. There were beads of perspiration on the butler's portly face. He wiped them away with a trembling hand. Walsingham, he started at the sound of Cedric Hilton's voice. Yes, Master Cedric, he stammered. Have you seen Price? Mr. P. Price, stammered the butler. No, sir, he came in here said Hilton, puzzled. He was looking in from the hall. I say, there's something up. Walsingham, Inspector Trevely has come in, and he's speaking to my father, and he wants to see Price. Where the deuce can the fellow have got to? Walsingham caught his breath. I have not seen Mr. Price, sir, for some time. I saw him on the terrace outside quite a long time ago. He came in here. I did not see him, sir. If he did, I say, you fellows, he was in here, came a squeaky voice. I say, what do they want him for? I say, Walsingham, where is he? The music had ceased. Groups stood about with startled faces, and there was a buzz of amazed voices. Among the guests, several police constables in uniform, and several warders from Blackmore Prison were moving about, scanning faces. Evidently something had happened. Sir Gilbert Hilton came up with Inspector Trevely at his side, a startled crowd following. Is he here, Cedric? Rap the baronet. No, father. And Walsingham says he hasn't seen him. Is anything the matter, sir? Asked Walsingham. The matter, spluttered Sir Gilbert. Good God, I should say so. That fellow got up as a convict. It is not Mr. Price at all. It is, it must be, the convict himself. Where is he? Has he escaped? Oh, crikey, gasped Billy Bunter. The convict, exclaimed Harry Wharton. There was a hum of startled voices. All through Hilton Hall, police and warders, guests and men servants, were searching for the man in convict gob, but they did not find him. The 15th chapter, hard pressed. The jolly old convict, Great Pip. The Great Pipfulness is terrific. Confusion and excitement reigned in the great building. It was a strange and dramatic interruption of Boxing Night's festivities. The news spread like wildfire. The convict, the escaped crook from Blackmore, was in the house somewhere. Dozens had seen him, without knowing that they had seen him. They had, of course, mistaken him for Price of the Greyfriars Fifth. 
The price of the fifth was in evidence again now. A crowd surrounded him as he stood with haggard face, a great dark bruise on his temple. Hilton helped him away to his room. The story he told was buzzed up and down the house. He had been knocked down and stunned by the convict, and he had come to his senses to find himself in the hands of the police, who had fancied that they had convict now. 33 and the convict, as the only way of escape open to him, had coolly taken his place among the guests of Hilton Hall. Unless he had escaped since, he was still somewhere in the mansion. The hunt for him went on high and low. Price, lying down on his bed with a racking headache, did not take pot in it, but the famous five did, and many of the other guests. Hilton of the fifth was in a state of great amazement. He knew now that the fellow he had spoken to, and whom he had introduced to his girl cousin, was not Price at all, but convict now. 33. The nerve of the rascal was amazing. It was still more amazing what had become of him. He seemed to have vanished into thin air. Harry Wharton and co., throwing on coats over their costumes, joined a number of others who were watching doors and windows in the frosty air outside. If the man was still in the mansion, he was certain to be found, for the search was going on from room to room, and not a recess was likely to be left unexplored. It could only be a matter of time before he was rooted out. Every door was guarded, and it was probable that he would seek to jump from a window, and the windows were almost innumerable. Hello, 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 called out Bob Cherry as a portly figure loomed in the shadows. See many thing of him waltzing him. The butler glanced round, and the juniors noticed that his plump face was pale. I, I have seen nothing, sir, stammered Walsingham. He was standing by a small window, which the juniors noticed was open. The room within was dark, keeping an eye on that window, asked Harry. Yes, sir, exactly. Perhaps if you young gentlemen went further along, and... Right ho, come on, you men, said Wharton. As the famous five passed along in the shadows, Walsingham put his head in at the open window of the little room. Quick, he breathed. A dark figure leaped from the window to the terrace outside. It was muffled in a thick overcoat, and a soft hat was pulled down over his brows. Without a word to the butler, the dark figure cut across the terrace and leaped away into the frosty night. Walsingham stood panting. He gave a cry as a shout rang along the terrace from the direction taken by the juniors. Hello, hello, hello. Who's that? Bob Cherry had glanced back and caught a glimpse of the vanishing figure in the glimmer of the stars. Who, what? exclaimed Harry. This way, shouted Bob. He rushed back. Walsingham, did you see him? He must have got out of that window. I, I, stammered the hapless butler. I, this way, roared Bob. He rushed after the fleeting shadow in the gloom. His comrades were at his heels in a second. Walsingham stood staring after them, his face like chalk. Cedric Hilton's voice was heard shouting, What's that? Have you seen him? He came running along the terrace. This way, came Bob Cherry's yell. Hilton of the fifth ran in the direction of his voice. Five or six others followed him at a run. Across the dim lawn that stretched for some distance from the terrace a dock, nimble, figure was running desperately. In the frosty gleam of the stars it was clearly visible for some moments, and all the famous five could see it as they sprinted after it. That's the man, panted Wharton, must be, Kate Nugent. The figure vanished under dark trees. It was seen again, running hard. Hilton came racing after the juniors. Seen him, he panted. Look, there he is. The running figure had almost reached a wall that divided the grounds of Hilton Hall from the open moor. He was not recognizable as the convict. All that could be seen was a dark overcoat and a soft dark hat. But the fact that he was running desperately was enough. Off to him, panted Hilton. He put on a spurt and raced ahead of the panting juniors. The running figure reached the wall and made a frantic leap to catch the coping at the top. His hand slipped from an insecure grasp, and he fell back, stumbled, and rolled on the ground almost at Hilton's feet. 
The dandy of the fifth form of Greyfriars pounced on him. Dandy as he was, Hilton had plenty of pluck. In a moment, the escaping man was struggling in his grasp. Got him, yelled Hilton. Help here, come on, panted Bob. The juniors tore up. The struggling man had gained his feet and was wrestling wildly to tear himself loose from Hilton of the fifth. Suddenly he bounded free, leaving the overcoat in Hilton's grasp. He dotted away again, with the outstretched hands of three juniors almost touching him. Oh God, gasped Hilton, staring blankly at the overcoat in his hands out of which the agile convict had slipped. After him, roared Johnny Ball. The desperate figure bounded off ahead. Now that the coat was off, the juniors could see the convict gob that had been hidden under it. The man was convict now. Thirty-three of Blackmore. It's the man, this way, after him, the fugitive was cutting across the lawn again, but the thick-set figure of a warder appeared ahead and headed him off. He spun round, and the juniors had a glimpse of his face, white and desperate, streaming with perspiration in spite of the icy cold, the ice glittering like a hunted animal's. He glared round him and cut off in a fresh direction, escaping the grasp of the juniors almost by a miracle. After him, we've got him now. The convict was heading for the wall again. Inspector Trevely, punting past the juniors and rushed straight at him. Lanterns and electric torches were gleaming now, lighting up the wild figure as it ran. It seemed that the convict was cornered. The burly inspector was hardly a yard behind him, and behind Mr. Trevely came a shouting crowd and in front of the fugitive was a high wall which he had already attempted to leap in vain, but desperation seemed to give him superhuman strength. He sprang at the wall, and this time his hands grasped the coping and he hung. The inspector, springing at him, staggered back from a savage kick that caught him under the chin. The next moment, before another hand could grasp at him, the convict had dragged himself to the top of the wall and rolled over to the ether side. A bump was heard as he fell. It was followed by the sound of running feet. Convict now. 33 was loose on the moor and in full flight. In a very few minutes, pursuit was hot at his heels again, and the sound of shouting voices and the flashing of light died away across the wilds of Blackmore. Walsingham met the Greyfriars juniors as they came back, breathless, to the house. Have they got him? He asked in a husky voice. Harry Wharton shook his head. No. He answered but, but they'll get him, said Bob cheerily. They're right at his heels. They'll get him all right. Don't you worry. Walsingham gave him a strange look and turned away without replying. The 16th chapter. A startling discovery. Rot, said Hilton. Achua, said Price. It was the following morning, and Price of the fifth was sitting up in bed with a muffler round his neck, a pile of pillows behind him, and a hot water bottle at his feet. He alternately sneezed and coughed. Price had caught a bad cold on Boxing Night, which was not surprising. It put him into an extremely bad temper which was not surprising either. His nose was red, his eyes watery, and he scowled. Hilton, who had come in to see him, sat by the bedside smoking a cigarette. Price eyed him viciously. I tell you it's so, he said. I fancy old Trevely suspects it too, since that bundle of clobber was missing from the butler's room. Utter rot, drawled Hilton. The police knew that the convict has a friend in this quarter. It's as clear as daylight that it's somebody in Hilton Hall. And I know who it is. I've told you my reasons. It's your butler, Walsingham. Price almost spat out the words. He had a big bruise on his temple. He was in the grip of a horrible cold. He was laid up for days. Any further attempt to back the fifty pounds reward by watching the butler and getting a clue to the convict was out of the question. Now he had told Hilton what he knew, or rather, what he suspected. To his angry surprise and irritation, the dandy of the fifth laughed at the idea. My dear man, said Hilton soothingly, 
You'll forget this rot when you feel better. Walsingham's the most respectable old stick in Devonshire. I owe him some obligations, too. You know he's lent me money at times. He's been a good friend to me, in one way and another. You've dreamed all this. Then you don't believe it. Hilton laughed. Rot? Of course not. The police ought to know. Cedric Hilton's face became very grave. Cut that out, Pricey. You're a guest here. My father isn't keen on you, but he accepts you as my school pal. I don't know what he would do if you started a yawn like that about his butler, but it would be something pretty drastic, I think. Walsingham's been with him twenty years or more. He used to carry me on his back when I was a little kid. Don't be so mad. I tell you, Hilton rose to his feet and threw away his cigarette. No use telling me. And if you tell anybody else, remember that our friendship's at an end, and you leave as soon as you're well enough to move. And I'll thank you not to speak to me next term at Greyfriars, you're a fool. Possibly, but don't say any more. Hilton walked out of the room, leaving Price scowling savagely. The dandy of Greyfriars went downstairs, put on his coat and hat, and went out into the frosty sunshine. He was quite aware of Price's suspicious and malicious nature, and he had no doubt that that was the only foundation of his startling theory. At the same time, he realized that there were many circumstances in favor of that theory, and he had a vague feeling of uneasiness. There was nothing in it. There could be nothing in it. But he was worried. Hello, 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 came a cheery roar. Like a snowball, Hilton, the fifth form man glanced round with a smile. Harry Wharton and company were snowballing one another in merry spirits that frosty morning. Price's words had left Hilton with a bad taste in his mouth, as it were, and the sight of the cheery schoolboys did him good. But he was not disposed for a snowballing game with the fags and he shook his head and walked away. By God, he ejaculated suddenly. He was thinking of Walsingham and of what Price had said. And he started a little at the sight of the man of whom he was thinking. A portly figure in an overcoat was passing down a path from the house through the leafless, icy trees, and Hilton's glance followed it curiously. Walsingham was walking quickly, unusually quickly for the portly and stately butler, and he carried a bag in his hand. Hilton's eyes lingered strangely on that bag. It was rather large and seemed heavy. Where was the butler of Hilton Hall going, in the morning, bag in hand? Not on a journey, Hilton knew that he was not going away. He stood looking after the butler till the portly figure disappeared among the trees. Many minutes after Walsingham had disappeared from sight, Hilton stood staring at the tracks he had left in the snow, his hands driven deep into his pocket, his brows wrinkled in troubled thought. But for what Stephen Price had said, he would have taken no heed of the butler's proceedings. But he had to take heed now. His brow grew darker. It was impossible, or seemed impossible, at least. Or what could Walsingham's motive be? And yet, Hilton turned at last and walked back to the Oak Avenue where the juniors were still snowballing one another. He called to them. You men like a walk? He asked. They came scampering up with cheery, ruddy faces. Yes, certainly, said Harry Wharton. He glanced rather curiously at Cedric Hilton's grave, clouded face, with a bound. After the jolly old convict, grinned Bob Cherry. Well, if we happened on him, you fellows wouldn't funk lending me a hand to back him, said the fifth former. No fear. But no fearfulness is terrific. Come on, then, said Hilton. He walked away in the direction taken by Walsingham. Harry Wharton and company walked with him wondering a little. They soon discovered that Hilton was keeping to a track left in the snow which made them wonder all the more. However, they asked no questions. They left the grounds by a little wicket gate. Hilton's glance swept the moor, but there was no one in sight. The footprints led away across the moor over an almost spotless expanse of snow. Hilton tramped on grimly. He did not, he could not believe what Price had told him, but he was going to know. Harry Wharton and company followed him in silence. 
They realized that something was up, though they could not guess what it was. But if Hilton fancied that that trail might lead to the escape man of Blackmore, they were quite ready to back him up, ready and keen. It was fairly clear that that was what was in Hilton's mind. He did not speak a word as he tramped on, till suddenly, about a mile from the hall, he uttered a sharp exclamation. The old hut, the witch, inquired Bob. Hilton glanced at him, setting his lips. He waved his hand towards a clump of leafless trees at a distance banked many feet high with snow that had drifted in the winter wind. There's an old shepherd's hut there, he said. You can't see it. It's hidden by snow. But I remember it's there. Just the place for the jolly old convict to hide, said Bob. Hilton compressed his lips. It must have been searched, he said. But since then, anyhow, we shall see. Keep your eyes open, you bet. The footprints led directly towards the clump of frosty, frozen trees. In silence, with a grim face, Hilton trumped, followed by the removed fellows. Walsingham, with a packed bag, had gone direct to that lonely, snow-hidden hut on the moor. Why? The truth was borne in upon Cedric Hilton's mind. Price had been right. The shepherd's hut was a mile and a half from Hilton Hall, two or three miles from any other habitation, and Walsingham was there, he must be inside the hut as he was not to be seen on the moor. Why? There was only one answer to that question, and Hilton set his teeth. The butler of Hilton Hall, his father's trusted servant, a confederate of an escaped crook, if that was the truth. The sooner it was made known, the better. The old hut was almost buried in snow, but as they drew closer, the juniors could make out the doorway. It was open, the trucks led direct to the doorway, and they moved on quietly, their footsteps making no sound on the carpet of snow. Their hearts were beating fast now. A murmur of voices caught their ears. Hilton's eyes gleamed. Walsingham was there and he was not alone. He did not need telling who the other was. He glanced round at the juniors. Keep ready, he breathed. Don't let him cut, you think? Whispered Wharton. I know, said Hilton curtly. We are ready for him. Hilton nodded and stepped on silently to the half-open door and looked in. The juniors behind him looked in also. It was a rather startling sight that met their gaze. They fairly jumped at the sight of Walsingham. The butler of Hilton Hall stood there. A large bag lay open at his feet. It was packed with clothing and other things. On a bench, a few feet from him sat the figure of the escaped man of Blackmore, devouring food with a wolfish greed. Hilton had expected what he saw, but Harry Wharton and company gazed, dumb with amazement. Hilton threw the door wide and stepped in. There was a startled gasp from Walsingham, a snarl of fury and terror from his companion. The butler turned, and his face was like chalk. Well, Walsingham, said Hilton grimly, what does this mean? Walsingham stood dumb. Every vestige of color had drained from his portly face. The convict sprang up, his fierce eyes passing Hilton to the door, to behold there the group of juniors, ready to cut of his escape. He backed to the father wall, snarling like a cornered rat. Walsingham still stood motionless, overwhelmed. Master Cedric, he said at last, and his voice was husky, almost inarticulate. Master Cedric, what does this mean? Walsingham, the butler gave a groan. You, said Hilton, my father's trusted servant. You have helped that scoundrel to escape, a villain who is wanted for robberies. For cracking safes, you, Master Cedric. That's enough, said Hilton contemptuously. You can explain to my father and to the police. As for your friend there, we shall take care of him and take him back where he belongs. Walsingham, with a choked cry, threw himself between the fifth former of Greyfriars and the crouching, desperate convict. Stop, Master Cedric. Stop for mercy's sake. Stand aside. Snapped Hilton. Heaven help me, groaned Walsingham. He is my brother, your brother. Hilton stared at him in incredulous amazement. Are you out of your senses? That man, that thief, that convict, your brother, my young brother, 
my brother Richard, and he was not always what he is now, groaned Walsingham. I, I never knew he was in prison. I never dreamed that he was at Blackmore. Till that night when I saw his face at the window, he shuddered. Then I knew, he knew where to find me, and he came for help. Blood is thicker than water. He is my brother, my own flesh and blood. I could not abandon him, Master Cedric. I have been a good and faithful servant to you and to your father. Spare him for my sake. Hilton stood as if petrified. His glance passed the bowed head of the butler to the crouching figure at the wall. Harry Wharton and company did not speak. Hilton broke the silence. At last, you can give him no more help. Walsingham, promise me that, and I, I promise, anything, if you will spare him now, groaned Walsingham, Hilton picked up the bag, he made a sign to the butler, who, with a last look at the convict, went silently from the hut, convict now, 33 said no word, with glittering eyes he watched the Greyfriars fellows, but he knew now that he was not to be taken, Harry Wharton and company, quietly left the hut. The portly figure of Walsingham, with bowed head, was disappearing across the moor. Hilton followed them out. He did not even look at the convict. It was not till they reached the gate of Hilton Hall that Cedric Hilton spoke. You'll say nothing of this. Nothing, answered Harry Wharton. They'll get him. He's got no chance. Now he can get no further help. But for Walsingham's sake, I understand. We shall say nothing, and nothing was said. Walsingham's secret was safe with the chums of the remove, though their minds were made up that, if another chance came their way, the man from Blackmore would not slip through their fingers. The end. I, Frank Richards. The first chapter, inedible, cheeky rotters, grunted Billy Bunter. Bunter was annoyed. He stood on the terrace at Hilton Hall and blinked through his big spectacles at five fellows who were walking down the Oak Avenue. Harry Wharton and company of the Greyfriars remove were, like Bunter, guests at Hilton Hall, and though they had not the faintest idea of it, it was through Billy Bunter that they had received an invitation for the holes from Cedric Hilton of the fifth form at Greyfriars. It was, in Bunter's opinion, Rather thick for the cheeky rotter to walk off like this on a fine morning regardless of him, indeed, forgetful of his fat and important existence. Bunter had nothing to do that morning. Hilton and Price of the Fifth had gone off somewhere in a car. Sir Gilbert and his lady were somewhere about. But Bunter was not keen on elderly society. There had been a crowd of guests at the hall over Christmas, but they were gone now. Now the famous five were walking off, leaving Bunter to his own company. Billy Bunter knew, what nobody else knew, that his own company was attractive and fascinating. Still, he did not want to be left to it. So he blinked after the juniors on the avenue, and then bawled after them, I say, you fellows. Harry Wharton and co. stopped and glanced round. Hello, 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 roared Bob Cherry. Wait for me, you coming, sighed Bob. Yes, you beast, we're going miles. Bunter, called out Harry Wharton. You'll get tired, yeah. Look here, you silly ass. You know you can't walk. Hooted Johnny Ball. You're too jolly lazy to. Anyhow, I could walk any of you off your legs and chance it, retorted Bunter. You just wait for me, see, while I get my coat. Look here, you fathead, beast. Oh, let's wait, said Frank Nugent resignedly. We'll give you a minute. Bunter, yeah. Bunter rolled in for his coat and the chums of the remove waited on the drive. Really, they did not want to neglect their fellow guest at Hilton Hall, but Billy Bunter was not exactly the fellow for a walk, especially on Blackmore where the going was hard. A quarter of a mile made Bunter puff. Half a mile made him groan. A whole mile made him collapse. Really, they did not want to have to roll the fat owl along like a barrel on a cold and frosty morning. However, they cheerfully resigned themselves to their fate and waited. Walsingham, hooted Bunter, I want my coat. Where's that butler? Where's that silly ass Walsingham? 
your coat, sir, said a quiet voice. Walsingham, the butler of Hilton Hall, was almost at Bunter's elbow. Oh, here you are, grunted Bunter. Hold it for me. Now where's my cup? Here is your hup, sir. I don't want my hut. I want my cup. Where the thump? Oh, it's in my room. Go and fetch it, Walsingham. The stately butler of Hilton Hall looked at Bunter. Sir Gilbert Hilton's butler was far too stately a person to be sent scuttling upstairs after a cup. John called Walsingham calmly. A footman appeared from nowhere. Kindly fetch Mr. Bunter's cup from his room, John. Billy Bunter snorted. He did not mind how long he kept the chums of the remove waiting on the avenue, so far as that went. But they were beasts enough to walk off without him if he kept them waiting too long. Really, he had no time for Walsingham's stately manners and customs. However, John was quickly on the spot. Walsingham ran the big establishment of Hilton Hall-like clockwork, and the innumerable servants were always exactly where they were wanted at exactly the right moment. You'll find the cup in the armchair, snapped Bunter. Yes, sir, it's under the cushion on the chair. Oh, yes, sir, gasped John. Why, a guest at Hilton Hall hid his cup under a cushion, and an armchair in his room was a surprising mystery that neither the footman nor the butler could have elucidated. John blinked at Bunter. Even the stately Walsingham allowed surprise to dawn for a moment, and his impassive portly features. Well, buck up, snapped Bunter. Oh, yes, sir. John disappeared up the stairs. By the time Bunter had tied his scarf and buttoned his coat, John returned with the cup. He had found it in the extraordinary spot described by Bunter. It looked very rumpled and crumpled. Your cup, sir, said John. Bunter took it from him and blinked into it before he jammed it on his bullet head. There was a secret about that cup that only Bunter knew. Inside the lining, a certain document was carefully hidden, a document that Cedric Hilton would have been very glad to get hold of, and which Price of the Fifth had made more than one attempt to snuffle during the Christmas holidays. But it was safe in its hiding place, and Bunter jammed on the cup and rolled out. I say, you fellows, he yelled, apparently tired of waiting, Harry Wharton and co. were strolling away down the avenue. They were going slowly to give the owl of the remove a chance to catch them up. Stop for me, roared Bunter. If they heard they heeded not, they sauntered on, and Billy Bunter broke into a run, his fat little legs twinkling as he flew. He overtook the famous five as they were turning out of a gate that gave on the open moor. East, he gasped. I called to you to wait, dear me. Said Bob Cherry, the hearfulness is not the obeyfulness, my esteemed and idiotic Bunter, remarked Harry Jamsek Ramsing. Bunter snorted and rolled, and with the juniors, far in the distance, in one direction, could be seen the high stone walls and roofs of Blackmoor Prison across the snowy moor. Beyond it the blur of smoke told where the town of Oakham lay, but it was in the other direction that the juniors went where a high tall rose black against the steely blue sky. It was some time since snow had fallen, but there was plenty left on Blackmoor. A cold and frosty wind swept over the bleak moor. Five fellows thoroughly enjoyed a trump in the keen, healthy atmosphere. Even Billy Bunter felt quite merry and bright for a time. But after half a mile, as usual, the fat owl of Greyfriars began to puff and blow. I say, you fellows, where are you going? He asked at last. Harry Wharton pointed to the tour in the distance. That's more than a mile, grunted Bunter. Go on, what the thump are you going up that beastly hill for? Demanded Bunter. Splendid view. Oh, blow the view. Miles and miles on a clear day like this, said Bob Cherry. Might spot that escaped convict from Blackmoor if he's still hanging about. Ot, grunted Bunter. Convict no. Thirty-three's cleared off long ago. He hasn't been caught yet, said Nugent. Blow him, said Bunter. I can jolly well tell you that I'm not clambering up that beastly hill, so you needn't think so, see. If we have to lose your society for a little while, 
Bunter will try to bear it with fortitude, said Bob Cherry gravely. If you fellows want to walk, why can't you walk to Oakham? Grunted Bunter. There's a shop there where you can get jolly good tuck. You walk to Oakham, suggested Johnny Ball. Grunt from Bunter. You would have preferred the pastry cooks at Oakham to the splendid view from the summit of High Tor. But it was not of much use for Billy Bunter to walk to a pastry cook's on his own. Pastries had to be paid for. Well, I'm glad you've had sense enough to bring something to eat, he said, glancing at a rather heavier to shake case that Bob Cherry carried in his hand. Rotten place for a picnic, and rotten cold weather too. But this so makes a fellow jolly hungry. They do us pretty well at Hilton Hall. The grub's good. I will say that, but it's a jolly long time between meals. I say, have you got something good in that bag? Bob Cherry chuckled, quite good. He answered, but you're jolly well not going to eat it. Bunter, it wasn't packed for you to eat, said Nugent. Ha ha ha. Blessed if I see anything to cackle at. Snorted Bunter, if you told me it was a picnic... I'd have ordered Walsingham to pack something for me to carry. I'm going to have my whack of what's in that bag, I can tell you. Not a morsel, said Bob firmly. Well, you greedy beast, exclaimed Bunter and disgust. You fancy you're going to picnic on the tour and leave me out, ha ha ha. Beasts, hooted Bunter. Midway between breakfast and lunch, Bunter, of course, was getting hungry. Walking in the keen frosty air of the moors made him hungrier. The bag in Bob's hand was a fairly good weight, and looked as if it was well packed. If it contained food, it looked as if there was enough for six. It did not even occur to Billy Bunter's fat mind that possibly it did not contain food. Could any fellow, in his sane senses, start out for a long walk across the moors, carrying a heavy bag that contained anything but grub? Not so far as Bunter could guess. He blinked at the famous five in almost speechless indignation. Beasts as they were, they were not, as a rule, greedy beasts. He could hardly believe his fat ears when they told him that he was not to be allowed to eat a morsel of the contents of the attaché case. At that point, however, Bunter was determined he was going to have his whack. And more than his whack. He trumped on after the cheery juniors with a knitted fat brow, and little round eyes gleaming through his big round spectacles. He puffed and he blew, he grunted and he gasped, but the thought of the ample contents of that bag spurred him on. The potty reached the foot of the tour at last. Under a clump of leafless trees, banked round with snow, was a little wooden hut, used as a shelter by a shepherd in the summertime. Now it was as lonely as Robinson Crusoe's dwelling on his island. Bunter blinked into it and was glad to see a bench within. I say, you fellows, come in. Bunter, we're going to the top. I'm stopping here. Hooted Bunter, I'm going to sit down, see. Look here, let's have the picnic here. Ha ha ha, what are you silly asses cackling at? Roared Bunter, look here, if you want to go to the top. I'll wait here for you, and I, I'll mine that bag for you while you're gone. It's too heavy for you to carry up the tour, Bob. You don't want to tire yourself out, old chap. Ha ha ha, yelled the juniors. Oh, do stop cackling, snorted Bunter. Leave the bag here, it will be safe with me. Bob winked at his comrades. You won't scoff what's in it while we're gone, he asked. I hope you can trust me said Bunter, with dignity. Right ho. Bob dropped the bag on the bench in the shepherd's hut. We'll trust Bunter not to eat it. You men? Ha ha ha. The famous five, laughing, went on up the rugged slope of the tour. Billy Bunter was left with the attaché case. He grinned. The footsteps died away on the rugged slope. Bunter waited till the juniors were gone. Then he pounced on the attaché case. It was not locked. It opened under his fat hand. Bunter blinked into it. His fat jaw fell. Oh, law, he gasped. Beasts, rotters. Oh, crikey. Billy Bunter had fully intended to stop gastronomic operations immediately on the contents of that attaché case. 
but he didn't, he couldn't. Billy Bunter could eat almost anything, but even Hilly Bunter could not eat a portable wireless set. The second chapter, The Blackmore Convict, Beast, hissed Billy Bunter. He blinked at the wireless set. He was strongly tempted to land his foot on it and send it flying, so keen was his disappointment. He restrained that impulse. However, it was only too certain that, if Bunter's foot had landed on the wireless, Bob Cherry's foot, later, would have landed on Bunter hard and often. The awful rotter, hissed Bunter. He had walked a mile and a half. The keen, frosty air had sharpened his always excellent appetite. He was hungry, and there was nothing to eat. He had taken it for granted that there was grub in that case. What was a fellow to think? But it was clear that he had taken too much for granted. There was no grub. There was not a vestige of grub. There was the portable. Merely that and nothing more. Bunter rolled to the doorway of the hut again. He blinked after the juniors, but they were out of sight. Very likely the beasts had sandwiches in their pockets. If so, the sandwiches were out of Bunter's reach till they came back from rambling on the tour. He shook a fat fist in the direction the juniors had taken. If they fancied he was going to stick there, looking after that dashed wireless, they were mistaken. Bunter resolved to stop back to Hilton Hall at once, and if some trump came along and pinched Hilton's portable, that was the other fellow's lookout. But the fat owl did not stop. The thought of a possible tramp brought another thought into his fat mind, that of a more than possible convict. Convict no. 33, who had escaped from Blackmoor Prison before Christmas, was still at large. True, it was days since anything had been seen or heard of him. It was known that he had obtained food from some unknown helper since his escape, or he could not have lived on the Barrenmoor. Very likely he had cleared off and was many miles from Blackmore. The police and warders were hunting him. In vain, there had been a treasure hunt got up to entertain the guests of Hilton Hall a day or two ago, and fellows had rumbled far and wide on the moor. But no eye had fallen on Richard Pike, convict now, 33, of Blackmore. Ten to one he was gone for good, but, but Bunter did not want to walk across the lonely moor by himself. All the same, the desperate man was capable of knocking him down, merely to get hold of his overcoat, as protection against the cold, if he happened on him. If he was not, after all, gone, Bunter did not want to risk meeting him alone. He rolled back into the hut. How long those beasts were going to be on top of the tour he did not know. Very likely an hour or more, there was nothing to eat. The view from the door was bleak, even if Bunter had cared for views, which Bunter didn't. He turned to the wireless again. Anyhow, he could pass the time with it, though he could not unfortunately eat it. He began to twiddle the knobs. The machine was in good working order, and a squeak of moss rewarded him. Now that he came to think of it, Bunter realized that he might have guessed what Bob carried in that bag. Hilton of the Fifth was rather keen on wireless, and he had a magnificent electric set in his den at the hall, as well as the portable which he sometimes took out in the car. The famous five, like most schoolboys, were rather keen on the subject too, and Bunter remembered that he had heard Hilton smilingly give Bob permission to take the portable out and try it on the open moor. Bob had an idea that the reception would be jolly good on the wild, open spaces of Blackmore, and no doubt he was right. Billy Bunter was not skillful on the wireless, his fingers were all thumbs, so to speak, at that as at most things. Often, when Bunter proudly announced that he had got Rome or Moscow, the piece would be followed by an announcer's voice in English, demonstrating only too clearly that he hadn't. Twiddling the dials, Bunter listened to Morse and atmospherics, and grunted. He wondered whether there was anything on in the morning worth hearing. Early in the day he was, at last, safe from the prices of fat stock and fat stockbrokers, but he did not want an entertainment consisting wholly of atmospherics. Then he remembered that there was a concert of war veterans somewhere, which was certainly worth hearing. 
if he can get it. It was unfortunate that he'd forgotten the station. However, he twiddled and twiddled. Beastly thing, grunted Bunter. A rousing chorus sung by old soldiers would have been grateful and comforting in that lonely, silent, desolate spot. He would have been glad to hear the voices of the cheery ex-service, men raised in a marching song. Blow it, said Bunter, as nothing came. He left it at last and went to the doorway again, in the hope of seeing something of the famous five. The possibility that they had sandwiches in their pockets made him anxious to see them again, but he could see nothing of them. By that time probably they were on top of the high tour, and the rugged inequalities of the ground and straggling bushes banked with snow hid them from Bunter's eyes and spectacles. But as he glanced over the open moor he gave a sudden start at the sight of a moving figure. It was a rather slight figure, dapper and active, no taller than Price or Hilton of the Fifth, but a man's figure, all the same. Bunter's foot hop gave a sudden jump. His range of vision was limited, even with the aid of his big spectacles, but he could make out that the man was coming swiftly towards the shepherd's hut at the foot of the tall, running bent low as if desirous of avoiding observation, and, though Bunter could not clearly discern his gob, it had a resemblance to the convict gob of Blackmore Prison. Oh, crikey, breathed Bunter. He watched the running, advancing figure, his eyes almost bulging through his spectacles. It was the convict. He was sure of that. The man had not, after all, fled. No doubt he had failed to find a chance of getting clear of the moors, and had lain in hiding somewhere. Now he had shown up. Why? Bunter's first thought was to back into the hut and hunt cover there, but it dawned on his fat mind that that was useless. Wherever the hunted man had lain in hiding, he was taking the risk of being spotted by coming out into the open. He was not taking that risk for nothing. As he came closer, Bunter had a glimpse of a hard-set, stubbly, desperate face. The man was making direct for the shepherd's hut, with a purpose, and Bunter realized that it was useless to hide. The man knew that somebody was there. He was after clothes, food, money, anything, for all was grist that came to his mill in his desperate circumstances. It was clear to Bunter that the hunted, hidden wretch had been on the watch, that he had seen the party of schoolboys arrive at the lonely tour and had seen five of them go on up the hill, leaving one behind with the attaché case. Desperate as he was, he would hardly have ventured to tackle the whole party, but it was easy enough to tackle one, and Bunter was the one. The owl of the remove stood rooted to the ground with terror, his fat knees knocked together. He thought of yelling for help, but there was little chance that the famous five were within hearing, and the man was approaching with terrifying swiftness, it was the convict. There was no doubt about that. Bunter could see now the muddy, tattered prison gob, the convict cup on the cropped head. It was Richard Pike, convict now, 33 of Blackmore, and he was coming straight at Billy Bunter like a hound at a stag. Probably if he had seen the attaché case he supposed, as Bunter had supposed, that there was food in it for a picnic and there was little doubt that he was in a half ummished state. Anyhow, he wanted clothes and money. Money, indeed, he was not likely to got from Bunter, but Bunter shivered at the idea of losing his overcoat and perhaps more on a day when the thermometer was near freezing point. Oh, law, groaned Bunter. What he was to do was rather a mystery to Bunter, but whatever he did, it behoved him to do it quickly instead of which he blinked helplessly at the man from Blackmore, like a fat rabbit, fascinated by a snake. When he made up his terrified, fat mind at last to attempt to run for it, the ruffian was terribly near, but that clearly was all he could do. He jumped out of the doorway of the shepherd's hut and started in the direction the juniors had followed up the hill. He ran hard, a shop voice sparked behind him. It came like the bark of a savage dog. It was not likely to make Bunter stop. It spurred him on. He fairly flew. Pattering on the snow behind him came the racing footsteps of the convict. Oog! Gasped Bunter suddenly. 
He was hardly ten yards from the hut when his foot slipped in the snow on the rugged sonope, and he went over. Arag, he rolled down. No. Help, I say, you fellows. Whoop, splotted Billy Bunter. He scrambled wildly up to resume his flight. As he did so, the convict, with the bound of a tiger, reached him. With a squeak of utter terror, Billy Bunter rolled over again, with the man from Blackmore pinning him down. The third chapter, mysterious voices, silence. The word was savagely hissed up Bunter. He gurgled, crumpled on his back in the snow. He blinked up at the fierce and savage face bent over him. It was a face to terrify a braver follow than Bunter. Convict no. Thirty-three at the best of times, but I'd been a hard case and a tough character. Days and nights of bitter hardship, of being hunted like a wild animal, had turned him into something like a human wolf. His haggard face, sunken cheeks, stubbly chin, and glittering, savage eyes under knitted brows made a hideous picture of mingled suffering and ferocity. Hunter would have yelled for help again, in the hope that the juniors on the tour might hear, but he dared not. One glare from those savage, sunken eyes was enough for him. He gurgled into scared silence. The sunken eyes scanned his face. He could see that the convict recognized him, with a knee planted on Bunter, pinning him down. Convict no. Thirty-three gave a fierce glare round, as if in suspicious search of other enemies, but no one was to be seen and his savage glance returned to Bunter. I know you, he muttered. You're one of the schoolboys staying at Hilton Hall. Yees, stammered Bunter. I saw the others with you. Where have they gone? Up the hill. Will they be back soon? Oh, yes. Any minute, gasped Bunter. The owl of the remove was never a stickler for the truth. And if this fearful villain believed that the five sturdy removites might appear at any moment, Bunter hoped that he would go. A knuckly fist was raised over Bunter's face, and he gave a squeak of fear. The truth, hissed convict now. 33. Do you want me to smash you, you fat fool? Do I look like a man to be trifled with? You dold? I'd twist your neck as soon as a rabbit's. Have they gone for long? Oh crikey. They, they gone to the top, groaned Bunter. Plenty of time. Then, the convict made a gesture towards the shepherd's hut. Is anyone there? Bunter realized that the convict could not know whether there was anyone in the hut or not. It was twenty feet away, and he had not had a chance of looking into it yet. For all he knew, the juniors might have met other ramblers on the moor at that spot. Oh, yes, gasped Bunter. Eh, a lot of people. Who? snarled the convict doubtingly. Policemen and warders and, oh, I, I mean there's nobody there. Gus Bunter, as the knuckly fist was lifted again, is that the truth? Oh, yes. Oh, convict no. Thirty-three gave a swift glance over his shoulder at the narrow, dock doorway of the hut. There was no sound or movement in the little building and he had little doubt that it was unoccupied. He had had to take his chances of that. Get on your feet. He released his grip on Bunter and allowed the fat junior to stagger up, but he watched him like a cut, ready to grasp him again. The hapless owl of the remove stood sagging with terror. Take off that coat. I, I say, it's, it's ceasy cold. I, I mean you can have it. I, I, I want you to have it. Stuttered the wretched owl. He peeled off the overcoat. Slight as the convict was in build, it was likely to be a very tight fit for him, but any sort of a covering was a windfall to the hunted man exposed to wild winter weather and the bleak moors. Now your boots and socks. Oh, law, groaned Bunter. Convict now. Thirty-three had small feet for a man, but it was doubtful whether he would be able to squeeze Bunter's boots on. He was going to try, anyhow. Bunter fairly groaned at the idea of going barefoot in the snow, but the savage glare of the convict prevented hesitation. He sat down dismally on a stone to take off boots and socks. The man watched him savagely and keenly. Bunter guessed that he was considering whether he could possibly squeeze into the schoolboy's other garments. 
Fortunately for Bunter, that was obviously out of the question. Turn out your pockets. There was little to turn out of Bunter's pockets. A penknife with a broken blade, a twist of string sticky with ancient ball size, a stump of pencil with a point broken, a watch that did not go, and had been worth little when it did, and a French penny comprised the whole treasure. Money, hissed the convict. That's all, gusped Bunter. I, I'm rather short of money. I, I've been disappointed about a postal order. What? I, I've only got that French penny left. You can have it. Nobody will take it. I mean, hang you, snarled the disappointed ruffian. Quick with those boots. Now take your jacket off. I, I say, you can't get into my jacket. I know that fool, but it will be of use. Quick. Oh crikey, Bunter was already feeling the cold without his overcoat. When he peeled off his jacket, the bitter wind seemed to go through his fat carcass like a knife. He shivered and shuddered. If convict now, 33, in better days, might have felt some compassion for the wretched fat owl, he felt none now. His own sufferings from the bitter weather and the moors were enough for him to think of. Hunter shivered and trembled as he stood barefoot in snow. Suddenly the convict spun round towards the hut. A sound came from it. It was the sound of a voice. Bunter's overcoat dropped from his hands as he started and listened, with terror in his haggard face. Bunter, as surprised as the convict, stayed through his spectacles. There was nobody in the shepherd's hut. Bunter knew that if convict now. Thirty-three did not. Yet a voice came in muttering tones. A human voice. Who? Hissed the convict. He broke off as a sudden roar of voices came from the hut. It was the roar of a chorus sung by men. Here we are, here we are, here we are again. For a single instant convict now. Thirty-three stood spellbound. Then, with the fleetness of a deer, he dashed away across the moor. The plunder he had taken from Buntelay where it had dropped. He did not give the fat junior a glance. That roar of voices from the lonely hut telling of a crowd inside, was enough, more than enough, for the hunted man. He had, he could have, no doubt that there were a number of men in the hut, that at any instant they might spot him and come rushing out at him. He flew, oh crikey, gusped Bunter, he blinked in wild amazement at the shepherd's hut. That sudden burst of voices had saved him from the convict, but who was there, how anybody could be there? utterly mystified him. Like a hunted deer, the convict was running. When Bunter blinked round after him, he was already vanishing in the distance. From the shepherd's hut still came the merry roar. Bunter, in a dazed state of amazement, but in immense relief, hurriedly put on boots and socks, jacket and coat and scoff. He was already chilled to the bone, and he gurgled with relief at being protected again from the bitter, icy wind. He almost totted towards the hut. Whoever was there, if anybody was there, was still going strong. It was Tipperary now coming out with a tremendous roar. The old familiar words came clear and strong. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. Dizzy with amazement, Bunter blinked into the hut. No one was there. Like a fellow in a dream, Bunter blinked. The hut was empty, but the roar of the chorus was going on. Oh, Gus Bunter, the wireless, he blinked over a fat shoulder. The convict had vanished in the snowy distance. He blinked into the hut again. The portable set was going strong. Evidently Bunter, when he gave up twiddling with the set, had left it on at the right station, and as soon as the ex-service men's concert started, it naturally came through. That cheery roar of voices did not come from a party of picnickers in the hut. As the convict had supposed, it came from somewhere a hundred miles away. He he he, chuckled Billy Bunter. Really, it was lucky for Billy Bunter that he had not been able to eat what Bob Cherry had carried in the back. Uh, the fourth chapter, Bunter tells the tale. Hallo, 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 roared Bob Cherry. I say, you fellows, gasped Bunter breathlessly. Harry Wharton and company had explored the summit of the tor. Now they were coming down the rugged path on its side, 
when they sighted Billy Bunter coming up. They had not expected to see the fat owl again until they reached the hut at the foot of the tor. But there he was, clambering and pulling and blowing, with beads of perspiration and his fat brow. Every now and then, as he clambered, he paused to turn his head and blink over a fat shoulder. He gasped with relief at the sight of the famous five. Coming up to the top, asked Harry, We'll go up again, if you like. Bunter shuddered at the idea. No fear, he gasped. Evidently Bunter was not keen on climbing the tor. Why he had started at all was a mystery to the famous five. I say, you fellows, can you see him? Asked Bunter whom, and which? Asked Bob. The kick, 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 kick. Stuttered the breathless owl. The kick, kick, convict. He blinked round uneasily. Is he gone? You've seen him, exclaimed Nugent. Oh dear, yes. I, I thought he might be after me again. Gasped Bunter. He ran for it. But I thought, sure you can't see anything of him. Not a sign said Bob. Mean to say he showed up while we were gone up the tor. Oh dear. Oh. Yes. Oh. From where they stood now, halfway up the tor, the juniors could scan a wide expanse of Blackmore. A turret of Hilton Hall could be seen in the distance, but there was no sign of any living thing. Sure you saw him? Asked Wharton dubiously. Oh. He collared me. Asked Bunter. Oh dear. I? I drove him off. Ha ha ha. There's nothing to cackle at, hooted Bunter. I can tell you I had a fearful struggle, hand to hand. I knocked him down. Go it, grinned Bob. I can see you knocking down a jolly old convict. Sort of thing you would do. Left him for dead, asked Frank Nugent. Ha ha ha. You can cackle, roared Bunter. I've had to fight for my life. Luckily, I was able to handle him. He had enough, and cleared. But, but I thought he might come back. So I came up after you fellows. I suppose Bunter fancied he saw something, remarked Johnny Ball. He wouldn't have started up the tour if he hadn't been frightened. Beast, well, come on, said Harry, laughing. If the convict's around, we'll jolly well collar him. Inspector Trevely would be pleased if we walked him into Oakham and handed him over. The chums of the remove went down the rugged tor, bunter gasping and gurgling after them. From below came a sound of music through the frosty air. Bunter had left the wireless turned on, and Foxtrot was coming through now, echoing over the moors and up the rugged slopes of the tor. You didn't scoff it, Bunter, grinned Bob. I rather thought you wouldn't when you found out what it was. I say, you fellows, it was jolly lucky that Wireless was there, gasped Billy Bunter, but for that that awful beast would have. What? Oh, nothing, said Buster hastily, remembering that he had defeated the man from Blackmore in single combat. The Wireless had nothing to do with it. You know, I knocked him out. Who? Roared Bob, the convict, you know. Fathead, that the fat owl of the remove had not the Blackmore convict out the juniors were not likely to believe. They did not, therefore, believe that he had seen the escape man at all. But as they came near the hut the signs on the trampled snow caught their eyes. All five were scouts, and knew how to read signs, and the sign in the snow was plain enough for anyone to read. My hut, ejaculated Bob Cherry. Somebody's been here since we went up the tor. It was the convict, hooted Bunter. He bagged my overcoat and jacket, and boots and socks, and all my money, and gave them back to you, grinned Bob. You've got them on now. You see, I knocked him out. I don't see. The seafulness is not terrific. Chuckled Hurry jumps at Rum saying this is where I struggled with him, said Bunter, stopping at the spot where he had rolled over, in the convict's grasp. It was a fearful struggle. He had me down, and I thought it was all up with me. So it would have been, if it had happened, remarked Johnny Ball. It did happen, shrieked Bunter. Bow wow. The juniors were quite puzzled. They picked up strange trucks leading to the spot, and leading away again. Somebody had been there. There had been some sort of a struggle. 
But that Billy Bunter had got the upper hand of a desperate convict in a tussle was rather too much for any fellow to believe. They were quite mystified. That's where I sat to take off my boots and socks, said Bunter. He was going to put them on, try them on, at any rate. When? When what? Oh, nothing. It wasn't the wireless, but... The wireless? Nothing of the kind. I jumped up and went for him, explained Bunter. I gave him right and left. He soon had enough, I can tell you. He bolted. The convict did, gasped Bob. Yes, ran for his life. Oh, my hat. The Greyfriars fellows examined the tracks. They were clear enough in the snow. The trail approaching the spot had been made by a man running. The deeper impression of the toes determined that. But the trail leading away from the spot had been made by a man not only running, but racing, running as fast as a man could run. The sign was unmistakable to any eye skilled in scouting. It was really amazing. Whoever had been there had fled at top speed from Bunter. Well, this beat Spanagha, said Bob Cherry. Whoever he was, he bolted as fast as he could go. Why, I jolly well frightened him off, said Bunter. He saw your face suddenly. Ask Bob, you silly ass, roared Bunter. Well, there's nothing about you except your features that could frighten anybody, argued Bob. It's jolly queer, said Harry. The fact is, this track looks like the convicts. We've seen it half a dozen times or more, in one place or another, and it looks the same to me. I was thinking the same, said Johnny Ball, but the convict wouldn't run away from Bunter. He did, roared Bunter. Bo, wow, look here, you ass, said Wharton. It's easily a week since the convict was seen, and it's not known whether he's still on the moors. If you've really seen him, it will have to be reported to the police at Oakham. Well, I have, and I'm going to report it to declared Bunter. If they get him, I shall put in for the reward. There's fifty pounds reward, and I think I'm entitled to it if... What about following the trail? Asked Bob. How long is it since your features frightened him off? Bunter, beast. It's about half an hour since I drove him off. Far enough away by this time, if it was the convict at all, said Johnny Ball. What about the sandwiches and the wireless? I say, you fellows, I'm fearfully hungry. You might have left the sandwiches with me. There would be a lot of them left if we had, grinned Bob. The juniors went into the shepherd's hut. The wireless on the bench was still going on. Packets of sandwiches were turned out of coat pockets. Billy Bunter grabbed the first that came to light. Bunter was almost as famished as convict now. Thirty-three by this time. Hello, hello, hello. What's that? exclaimed Bob Cherry suddenly. He shut off the wireless. From the moor came a deep, thrilling note that the juniors had bade before. It was the bay of a bloodhound. Uh, the fifth chapter, the Manhunters, Harry Wharton and company, rushed from the shepherd's hut. Billy Bunter lingered inside. The chums of the remove had not finished the sandwiches. Bunter proceeded to finish them. Far away, on the snow that covered the moor, the juniors picked up a group of dark figures. They recognized the thick-set, stocky figure of Inspector Trevely of Oakham. He had the hound in leash. Following him came two warders of Blackmore Prison, with rifles under their arms. The hound, straining at the leash, was coming directly towards the hut at the foot of the tor. The Oakham inspector breaking into a trot every now and then to keep up with him. It was plain that the hound was on a strong scent. They're after him, breathed Bob, and coming straight here, said Harry. Looks as if the convict has been here, after all. The lookfulness is terrific. The three men out on the moor sighted the group of schoolboys before the hut and stayed at them. They came on at a run. Inspector Trevely pulled in the straining bloodhound as he reached the spot. What are you boys doing here? He jerked. We've been up to H.E. Tor, said Harry. Have you seen anything of the man we want? Unless the hound's on a false scent, he came this way. The juniors exchanged glances. According to Bunter, the escape man of Blackmore had been there little more than half an hour ago. Quick.
Rap the police inspector, detecting that exchange of glances at once. You're wasting time. Well, Bunter says. Said Harry slowly, Bunter? Who is he? Oh, that fat fellow. Is he here? Call him, Bunter, roared Bob into the hut. Billy Bunter rolled out, his mouth full of sandwich, and a sandwich in each fat hand. Inspector Trevely glanced at him, and glanced past him into the hut. He spotted the portable wireless standing on the bench. What's that? He jerked. Wireless? Explained Bob. Hilton lent us his portable to try out here on the moor. We had it on. Master Bunter, if you have seen anything of Richard Pike, convict now. 33 of Blackmore. Rupp the inspector interrupting Bob. The hound was straining so hard that it was difficult to hold him in. Yes, rather. Chiruk Bunter. He gave the famous five a vaunting blink through his big spectacles. I collared him. What? roared Mr. Trevely, and the two warders stayed up Bunter. I mean, be collared me. Gus Bunter, you had better stick to the facts, young man. Snap, Mr. Trevely, you are dealing with officers of the law. Waste no time. Has the convict been here? Shop, yes. Gus Bunter, did none of you see him, if he was here? Rap Trevely, we'd gone up the tour, explained Wharton. We left Bunter here, and he says that while we were gone, did the man attack you? demanded Mr. Trevely, with a searching and very doubtful glare at the fat owl of the remove. It was evident that B would have preferred information from any member of the party rather than William George Bunter. He jolly well did. Gus Bunter, he bagged my coat and jacket, and made me take off my boots and socks and Inspector Trevely gave a grunt. As Bunter was wearing the articles enumerated, it did not sound probable. Then, why did he go without them? He snapped. I drove him off. What? I? I knocked him right and left. And he, he ran for it. The expression that came over Mr. Trevely's face as he heard that statement was quite extraordinary. He seemed bereft of speech. Bunter, you ass. Hiss Bob, for goodness sake tell the truth. Don't you understand that this is serious? Beast. Inspector Trevely gasped. You young idiot. Oh, really? You know. Tell me what happened, if anything happened. Or the angry inspector. You are wasting time, obstructing an officer of the law in the execution of his duty. You are liable to arrest. Oh, crikey. Mr. Trevely grasped the fat owl by a podgy shoulder. He shook him, till Bunter gurgled horribly. Some sandwich went down the wrong way, under that severe shaking. Now tell me the truth, roared Mr. Trevely. Speak, Gruog, have you anything to say? Arug, upon my word, I. Oh, Arug, give a fellow a chance to speak. Dusk Bunter, I tell you he collared me, Grug, and bagged my coat and boots, Garg. And then, Warg, then what? Hooted the exasperated inspector. Bunter paused a second. Truth did not come easily to Bunter, but the glint in Mr. Trevely's eyes daunted him, and he did not want another shaking. Then, then the wireless came on. Be gusped. The what? The wireless? Gusped Bunter. I'd put it on, but it hadn't started. And it started all of a sudden, a lot of men singing a chorus, and... And the beast fancied there was a crowd in the hut, and bolted. Oh, my hat! Gusped Bob Cherry. So that was it. Inspector Trevely stayed blankly at the fat owl for a few moments, but he caught on quickly enough. Which way did he go? He jerked. How long since? More than half an hour. And here are his tracks, sir, said Bob. He pointed them out. Inspector Trevely tramped away towards the trail of the running man that led away from the spot. That was the direction in which the hound was straining. The hound bayed again, the deep, musical note ringing far over the silent moor. Then he loped on, and the warders followed the inspector. They were going at a trot now, hot on the scent. Come on, said Harry. Follow on, you men. Bob Cherry hastily packed the portable into the attaché case, and the famous five followed the manhunter. 
Billy Bunter rolled after them. He finished the last of the sandwiches as he rolled. Nothing was to be seen of the hunted man, but in spite of the snow on the ground, the hound picked up the scent, and the trail was visible in the snow. It wound away across the wild moor, and to the surprise of the hunters led after a time in the direction of Hilton Hall, as if the fugitive had thought of making for that mansion. Then it swerved again to the open moor. Harry Wharton and co., keen to see the outcome, still followed on, but Billy Bunter came to a halt. I say, you fellows, you'll be late for lunch, he bawled. Even that awful risk did not seem to worry the famous five. They trumped on unheeding, and Bunter, with a snort, rolled off to the gates of Hilton Hall. Bunter, at all events, was not going to be late for lunch. For a mile or more the hound loped steadily on. Then, on the rugged bank of a frozen watercourse, it came to a stop, running up and down the bank, and howling. The hunted man had taken to the ice, and it looked as if the bloodhound was baffled. Harry Wharton and company gave it up and walked back to Hilton Hall, leaving the inspector and his companions still patiently trying for a scent, but they did not find it. Once more the hunted man of Blackmoor had baffled his pursuers. At the sixth chapter, the butler's brother, Billy Bunter, started. The sound of footsteps outside the door startled him. It was not a startling sound in itself. Had Bunter been in his own room at Hilton Hall he would have given no heed. But he happened to be in Harry Wharton's room, where he certainly had no business, at all events, no business that he could have explained. Not that Bunter was up to anything to which any reasonable fellow could have taken exception. He was simply selecting a pair of trousers for his own personal use. Surely quite a harmless occupation. They happened to be Wharton's best trousers. That, to Bunter, was a trifle light as air. But he was aware that the owner of the garments might take a more serious view. Bunter, as was his happy custom, had travelled light when he came to Hilton Hall. He had what he stood up in. When he wanted a change, it had to come from some other fellow's resources. So it was fortunate that the famous five were not travelling so light as Bunter. It was the day following Bunter's adventure with the convict and the wireless at High Tor. Bunter's clothes had been made rather muddy. He had decided on a change. After lunch he had heard the juniors talking about going out, so the opportunity seemed favourable. Now he was in Wharton's room, carefully selecting trousers. It was absolutely rotten luck, that just as he had decided on the pay he was going to borrow, footsteps came along the passage outside. Bunter started, listened, and scowled over his spectacles. Some of the beasts were coming up to their rooms instead of going out. If Wharton was among them, he would want to know what Bunter was doing there. There would be no borrowed trousers for Bunter, much more likely a boot on those he was already wearing. East, breathed Bunter, trousers in hand, he backed out of sight behind the window curtains. He was safe there, unless the beasts came to the window. If it was Wharton, probably he had only run up for a cup or a scoff, and would be gone in a few moments. It was Wharton, anyhow. Bunter heard the door open, and the voice of the captain of the Greyfriars remove, trot in, Walsingham. Bunter started again in sheer astonishment. Walsingham, the butler, had come up with Wharton. Why, was a mystery. Peering through the curtains, Bunter saw the portly figure of the Hilton Hall butler roll in. The five juniors followed. They were all there. Evidently it was not Wharton just running up for a cup or a scoff. Something was on. Wharton closed the door. Walsingham stood with a faint flush on his portly face, breathing hard. The five juniors were regarding him rather curiously. So did Bunter from behind the curtain. Well, go it, Walsingham, said Harry Wharton, who was apparently puzzled. You said you had something to say to us. Yes, sir breathed Walsingham. I, I decide to speak to you young gentlemen, sir, where other ears could not hear, and so. Well, nobody will hear us in this room, said Harry. Fire away. Bunter grinned behind the curtain. 
He was rather glad that he was there now. This was getting interesting. The flush deepened on Walsingham's portly face. He had something to say to the juniors which other ears were not to hear, and Morton had brought him there for him to say it. But he seemed to find some difficulty in giving it utterance. I, I, I. It is about the convict, sir, stammered Walsingham at last. Oh, said Harry. Inspector Trevely and some of the police and warders are now in the grounds of this establishment. Went on Walsingham. It seems that they were close on the man's track yesterday with the bloodhound, but he eluded them. They seemed to have the impression that he came in this direction after escaping them, and that he may now be in the vicinity of Hilton Hall. Looks like it, said Bob Cherry. The junior's faces were very grave now. The butler of Hilton Hall passed a hand over his forehead. You are aware of my secret, young gentleman, he said in a low voice. You were with Master Cedric that day a week ago, when he found me taking help to the wretched man. You heard me confess to him that the man known as Richard Pike, no, 33 at Blackmore, was in truth Richard Walsingham, my younger brother. Yes, said Harry quietly. Behind the window curtain, Billy Bunter's eyes opened wide behind his big spectacles. This was news to Bunter. Richard was not always what he afterwards became, sir, murmured Walsingham. It was a terrible shock to me. The night I saw his face at the window, I knew then that my wastrel brother had become a convict. No doubt, sir, I did wrong in aiding him, but blood is thicker than water. The juniors were silent. That the butler had done wrong in helping a crook who had escaped from a convict prison, there could hardly be any doubt. But the claim of blood was strong. Master Cedric discovered me. Went on Walsingham. You young gentlemen were with him. Master Cedric kindly consented to keep my miserable secret. Sir, on condition that I promised not to see Richard again or to give him any further help. You heard me make that promise. I'm sure you've kept it, Walsingham, said Harry, but he spoke rather sonally. The fact that the hunted man was still haunting the vicinity of Hilton Hall, that even now the hunters had tracked him to the grounds of the mansion, looked as if he still had a friend there, or, at all events, believed that he had. That is what I wish to say to you, sir, said Walsingham. It looks, you cannot help seeing that it looks as if the man is still receiving aid from some quarter, from this quarter. I could not help thinking that that doubt would occur to your minds, young gentlemen, and that you might suppose that, that Walsingham faltered, but he went on again. I have kept my word, sir. I have not seen Richard. I have not helped him since that day. I am aware that he does not deserve help, only too well aware of it, sir. Knowing what you do, it would be your duty to give information to the police, if you believe that I was still in touch with the convict. That is so, said Harry. But, but if you can take my word, sir, said Walsingham, with dignity. Certainly, said Wharton at once. That's all right, Walsingham. The takefulness of your esteemed word is preposterous, my venerable and ridiculous Walsingham. Said Harry Jamset Rum Singh solemnly, right as rain. Said Bob Cherry, I thank you, gentlemen, said Walsingham. That is what I decide to say, and I am very grateful. And Walsingham, with a stately bow to the famous five, retired from the room. The juniors exchanged rather curious glances. It's rough on the old bean, said Bob. No end rotten for him, in the servants' hall. If it came out that the convict was a relation of his, of course, he oughtn't to have helped the brute. But, well, we can trust his word to have nothing further to do with him. I must say it looked most likely that Ruffian still hopes to get help from him, and that's why he's hanging about Hilton Hall. Said Harry, I'm sure Walsingham is to be trusted to keep his word, to have no more to do with him. Huck, the bloodhound, Breathe Nugent. It was the bay of the hound from the grounds, quite near the house. The juniors rushed across to the window to look out. At a little distance, 
Among the frozen trees, they glimpsed three or four dark figures against the snow, one of them with a hound in leash. They recognized the ruddy face and white mustache of Sir Gilbert Hilton among the hunters. Let's get out, said Bob. As they turned back from the window, there was a sudden squeak of alarm and a howl of surprise from the famous five. Bunter, I, I say, you fellows, you fat villain, roared Wharton. I, I say, I, I wasn't listening. I, I never heard what the butler said, gasped Bunter. I, I came here for, for some trousers, squash him, hooted Bob Cherry. Billy Bunter flew out of the window recess. He bolted across the room to the door. In an instant, he had the door open and was fleeing for his fat life down the corridor. After him rushed the famous five. They forgot for the moment that they were at Hilton Hall and not in the removed passage at Greyfriars. Billy Bunter flew down the stairs as the exasperated juniors came whooping down the corridor. Bunter evidently had overheard what Walsingham had said, and it had to be impressed on Bunter's fat mind that he was not to tattle about it. And bumping him hard, and the polished oak floor seemed the most efficacious means. With vengeful faces, the famous five rushed in pursuit. Billy Bunter, in a state of breathless alarm, had just time to dodge into the billiards room and bang the door after him as they came scampering down into the hall. The seventh chapter. A hundred up, Cedric Hilton leaned over the billiard stable and took careful aim with his cue. Price, of the fifth, standing with the butt of his cue resting on the floor, watched him with a faintly sarcastic smile. The dandy of the fifth and his greyfriars pal spent a good deal of time in that apartment. Sir Gilbert Hilton was aware of that circumstance but he was quite unaware that his son played with quids on the game. How many quids had passed over from Hilton to his precious pal during the Christmas holidays, the dandy of the fifth did not trouble to remember, but Price knew that he was making quite an income out of his wealthy friend. They were having a hundred up now and Price had left off. Intentionally, 80. Price had an almost professional skill at the game, acquired out of bounds at Greyfriars during term, at the Three Fishers and such resorts. He could easily have given Hilton fifty in a hundred and beaten him, but it did not suit Price to display his powers. It suited him better to let Hilton fancy that he had a chance, and then beat him by a narrow margin. Generally Hilton was a rather careless player. Now, however, he seemed to be excelling himself. He owed Price five pounds on the play, and Price had proposed double or quits, which put Cedric Hilton on his mettle. They had the room to themselves. Outside, the wintry sun glimmered on frosty windows. Shaded lights burned over the table. Click. It was another cannon, with unusual skill and unusual luck. Hilton had made a series of cannons leaving the balls well placed every time. He looked round with a smile. What's that pricey? Eighty, by Jove we've tied. You're coming out strong, Cedric. Beating you this time, old man. Go it, and good luck, smiled Price. He did not think that Hilton would run out with another twenty, and as soon as he played again, he knew that he could score what he liked but his narrow face grew a little more serious as Hilton continued his game. He was having great luck, that was certain, but he was exerting himself to an unusual degree. The balls seemed to favor him. He was sticking to cannons, and they came off again and again. At ninety, Price had quite ceased to smile. He had proposed double or quits, in the certainty that it would spell double. Quits did not suit his book at all. At ninety-six he scowled. By God, what about luck? Smiled Hilton, as he carefully aimed for another shot. Just as he made it, there was a clatter as Price dropped his cue. Hilton gave a slight start, and missed the cannon. Sorry, said Price. Did it startle you, Cedric? Oh, that's all right, said Hilton carelessly, and he lounged back from the table. Rather a good break for me, Pricey. Fine agreed Price. He chalked his cue carefully, 
and began to play, Hilton watching him. Four times in succession the red went in, and a cannon followed, and another cannon. The score tied. Close finish, remarked Hilton. Price suppressed a grin. He was good for a break of fifty at least, if he chose. But it never occurred to Cedric Hilton that he had not the ghost of a chance in the game. Price made another cannon, leaving the balls nicely placed. Hilton gave a rather rueful laugh. Your game, Pricey, he remarked. Oh, you never know your luck, said Price blandly. He wanted only one more cannon to run out, and he could have made a dozen. But the unexpected happened, just as Price was taking his shot. The door was held open, and a fat figure rolled hurriedly in and banged the door shut after him. Beasts, gasped Billy Bunter, apparently referring to someone outside the billiards room. Price's shot went anywhere. He turned from the table with a scowling brow, and strode across to Bunter, grasping his cue. You fat dummy, he hooted. Bunter blinked round. He had been unaware that there was anyone in the room when he rolled in so hastily. Oh, really, Price? He gasped. Here, I say, beast. Keep that cue away, you rotter. Yaru. Hold on, Pricey, exclaimed Hilton, laughing, as Price lunged at Bunter with the butt of the cue, jamming it in his fat ribs. Yaru. Roared Bunter. I'll smash him, panted Price. Youp. Keep off, you beast, yelled the owl of the remove. Prancing frantically round the billiard stable, I say, Yaro, keep him off, Hilton, you hoop, bang, bang, bang. Stephen Price never had a good temper now, he had a very bad one. The presence of the removed fellows at Hilton Hall during the holidays was an incessant irritation to Price. Least of all did he like the presence of William George Bunter. Now Bunter had stopped his break, and he was wrathy. He pursued the fat owl round T.H. Billiard Stable, banging with the business end of the queue. Ha ha ha, roared Hilton. Go it, Bunter, put it on. Here we go round the mulberry bush. Yarrow, oh, bang. Whoop, ha ha ha, bang. Oh, help. Wow, oh, roared Bunter. He dodged behind Hilton and clung to him for protection. Keep him off, I say. Is this how you treat a guest, you beast? Keep that rotter off, Yarrow. Chuck it, Pricey, said Hilton, laughing. He pushed the enraged Price back, his hand on his chest. It was only a light push, but it made the weedy card of the fifth stagger. At indoor games, Price could beat Hilton hands down, but Hilton was the better man at outdoor games which developed muscle. Price staggered against the billiards table. Hands off, you fool, he snarled. His eyes glinted at Hilton with something very like hatred for the moment. He despised Hilton from the bottom of his heart, though he was generally very careful to conceal that fact, and it enraged him that the fellow he despised could push him about like a doll, without even exerting himself. Draw it, mild, old man said Hilton quietly. It was at such moments as this that he realized that his pal was a bounder and wondered what on earth had ever made him make friends with him. Let me get at that fat fool. Yarrow, keep him off. I'll smash him. Oh, let him alone, said Hilton irritably. After all, he's a guest here, of sorts. Leave the young fathead alone, Price. Guest, sneered Price. Would he be here at all if he hadn't pinched a letter belonging to you and held it over your head? Wouldn't you kick him out this minute? If you dared. Hilton knitted his brows. That's enough, he said curtly. Yeah. Hooted Bunter, safe behind the dandy of the fifth. I never pinched anybody's letter, as you jolly well know. I picked it up in the quad at Greyfriars, where Hilton dropped it and I only picked it up to do him a good turn. Suppose the head had found it. That will do, Bunter, said Hilton. Nice for both of you if the head had found it, snorted Bunter. A letter from a butler, about a fellow borrowing money of him, about a fellow being in debt. Debts that he couldn't tell his father about. If the head had seen that letter, shut up, or I'll let Price get at you again. 
said Hilton, beast. Bunter, however, shut up. From behind Hilton, he eyed Price suspiciously and morosely through his big spectacles. Bunter did not like being reminded of the very peculiar circumstances in which he had secured an invitation to Hilton Hall for Christmas. Cedric Hilton, with his usual callousness of mind, had almost forgotten it, and would probably quite have forgotten it, but for constant reminders from Price. Price, however, was not likely to forget it. If that telltale document came to light, it meant trouble for Price as well as Hilton. Let's finish the game, Pricey, said Hilton impatiently. I want to get out of doors for a bit. Turn that fat fool out. Then, growled Price. Get out, Bunter. Shan't, retorted Bunter independently. Price set his lips hard. But for the fact that Hilton stood between them, the fat owl would have got some more of the butt end of the queue, harder than before. Buzz off, Bunter, there's a good kid, said Hilton. Those beasts are after me, said Bunter. I'm staying here. I'll play you a hundred up, if you like. I'm rather a dab at billiards. Hilton laughed and chalked his cue to play. Price scowled angrily. That fool spoiled my shot, barging in. He growled. Cedric Hilton gave him a cool glance. You spoiled a shot of mine, dropping your cue. He said, I haven't made a song and a dance about it. I should have run out. Oh, play if you like. I don't care. Said Hilton, shrugging his shoulders. Run out and get done. I want to get done. I want to get out of doors. There was a tone in Hilton's voice that warned Price that his influence over the easygoing dandy of the fifth was in danger. That influence was worth more to him than the stakes on the game. Oh, rot, he said. Get on with it, Cedric. Hilton got on with it and ran out easily enough. It was rather a satisfaction to him to beat Price for once, and Price affected to smile agreeably, as agreeably as he could. Hilton put his cue in the rack. Coming out? He asked. No, I'll smoke a cigarette here. Hilton nodded and lounged out of the billiards room. Billy Bunter blinked uneasily at Price and followed Hilton as far as the door. But there was danger without as well as within for the fat owl of the remove. Bunter was between the devil and the deep sea, as it were. As he hesitated, Price called to him. Have a hundred up, Bunter. Bunter gave him a suspicious blink. No locks? He asked. Price laughed. It's all right. Play, old bean. Oh, all right. Said Bunter, reassured. And he picked a cue from the rack and began to play, while Price waited to make sure that Cedric Hilton was safe off the scene. Then he laid down his cue, suddenly grasped the fat and fatuous owl, and backed him against the billiard stable. Bunter's cue went to the floor with a crush, and he gave a howl of alarm. I say, quiet, said Price coolly. I've got you now, you fat scoundrel, and I want that letter. I'm going to twist your arm until you hand it over. Billy Bunter's mouth opened for a fearful yell. Price jerked the grubby handkerchief from his pocket and stuffed it in. Bunter gurgled horribly. Price gave his fat arm a twist. Where's that letter? He asked pleasantly, at the eighth chapter, rather a row, seen Bunter. Cedric Hilton smiled. He was putting on coat and hat to go out to join his father with the manhunters in the pock, when Harry Wharton inquired if he had seen Bunter. Looking for him, he asked. I thought he seemed rather pressed for time. Well, we rather want to see him, said Harry. He lowered his voice. The fact is Hilton... The fat brute was listening when Walsingham spoke to us a little while ago, and he's found out from what Walsingham said about that relation of his. We want to make him understand that he's got to keep it quiet. Hilton's face became very grave. I understand. You'll find him in the billiards room, he said. I left him there with Price. I think they're playing a hundred up. Right ho. Hilton nodded and left the house and the famous five headed in a body for the billiard room. As they reached the door, they heard a faint scuffling and gurgling sound from within, which was rather puzzling. 
If Bunter was playing billiards with Price of the Fifth, they might have expected to hear the click of ball and cue, but it was scuffling and gurgling that they heard. Wharton opened the door and the juniors stepped in. They stayed in blank amazement at what they saw. Billy Bunter backed up against the billiard stable with a handkerchief stuffed in his mouth and Stephen Price grasping him and pinning him there. What the thump? ejaculated Bob Cherry. Bunter Price? What the dickens? Price stayed round savagely. He had not expected to be interrupted by the famous five. They had hardly ever entered the billiard room during their stay at Hilton Hall. Bunter's eyes turned on them with a wildly appealing blink, and he gurgled frantically. Wharton closed the door and ran across to the billiard stable. His friends ran after him. They were there to handle Bunter, but finding Price of the Fifth handling him in this manner, they forgot their purpose for the moment and handled Price instead. The cad of the fifth was grasped by three or four pairs of hands and dragged back forcibly from Bunter. He turned on the juniors with clenched fists and blazing eyes. Bunter, staggering against the table, jerked the stuffed handkerchief from his mouth and spluttered, Grug, I say, you fellows, Oog, you young hooligans, hissed Price, get out of this, or... Or what? inquired Bob Cherry coolly. Looking for a scrap, Price, I fancy I could handle you fifth form man as you are. I'll try anyhow. Price unclenched his hands. He was boiling with rage, but he did not want a scrap with the removites. I, I say, you fellows, keep H.M. off, gurgled Bunter. I say, he's dangerous. I merely chook chook choked. What's the meaning of this, Price? asked Harry Wharton quietly. You were handling Bunter and you practically had him gagged with that hanky. Have you gone potty, or what? Price punted. You young rotters, you know what I want from Bunter. You're all in the game with him. Hilton doesn't believe so, but I do. Mad. Asked Nugent in wonder. The madfulness is terrific. If you're not hand in glove with him, make him hand over that letter. Snarled Price. What letter? Demanded Johnny Ball. You don't know. Sneered Price. Of course we don't know. Snapped Wharton angrily. If Bunter's bagged a letter belonging to you, we'll make him hand it over fast enough. I know it's just one of his potty tricks, but oh really, Wharton, have you been prying into a letter of Price's? Demanded Bob. No. Gusp Bunter, have you got a letter of his? Snap Wharton. Oh really, Wharton? I hope I'm not a fellow to sneak a fellow's letter. Yes or no, you fat owl. No, you beast. It's not a letter of mine, as I believe you know. Snarled Price. It's Hilton's, and Bunter pinched it at Greyfriars a day or two before we broke up for the Christmas holidays. If it's Hilton's letter he's got, I suppose Hilton can ask him for it, said Harry. No need for you to butt in that I can see. I knew you were hand in glove with him, though that fool Hilton can't get it into his head. Said Price bitterly. Oh, don't be a fool. Said the captain of the remove curtly. If you weren't a rotten cur, Price, you'd know that we had no hand in anything of the kind. Bump the cheeky card. Growled Johnny Ball. I say, you fellows, have you got a letter of Hilton's? demanded Wharton. You can search me, if you like, said Bunter with dignity, as the telltale letter was hidden in the lining of his cup which, of course, Bunter was not wearing at the moment. That was a safe answer. He's got it. Snarled Price, if you fellows didn't know before, you know now, but I jolly well believe you knew. You cheeky rotter. Ball Johnny Ball. Well, if you didn't know, why do you fancy that Hilton asked you here for Christmas? Sneered Price. Harry Wharton and company stared at him in blank astonishment. Hilton's invitation for Christmas had come at a lucky moment, when some other arrangements had fallen through, and it had come as rather a surprise to the removed fellows, but they had taken it in good faith and accepted it at face value. 
Bunter certainly had hinted a good many times that it was through him that the invitation had come. That, however, seemed improbable, if not impossible, that they had regarded it merely as the fat owl's customary gus. Indeed, so far from believing that Bunter could influence Hilton into asking other fellows home, it was a mystery to them how Bunter had wangled an invitation for himself, that the dandy of the fifth could possibly want Bunter at Hilton Hall in the holidays seemed very unlikely, and they could only conclude that the astute owl had somehow imposed on his easygoing good nature. Certainly they had never dreamed that Bunter had a hold over the sportsman of the fifth, and had made unscrupulous use of it. There was a long silence, of sheer astonishment, following Price's nearing words. Harry Wharton broke it at last. Hilton wrote, asking us here. He said, why shouldn't he, if he wanted to? Did he want to? Sneered Price. I suppose so, as he did it. What do you mean? I fancy you know what I mean. Wharton's eyes glinted. I don't know what you mean, Price, he said. But I'm going to know what you mean, and you're going to explain at once. You're going to explain, you sneering cad, or you're going to have the thrashing of your life, here and now. Thrash the cur anyhow, growled Johnny Ball. Price hacked away his step. Even upon his doubting and suspicious mind it was borne in that the famous five knew nothing of Bunter's trickery. Well, if you didn't know, I'm sorry, he said grudgingly. But that doesn't alter the fact that Bunter got hold of Hilton's letter and kept it, and made him ask the fat rotter here and you along with him. I say, you follows. Gasp Bunter, shut up Bunter, let's have this clear, said Harry Wharton very quietly. Say that Bunter picked up a letter of Hilton's at Greyfriars and kept it. Any ordinary letter wouldn't have been any use to him. What sort of a letter do you mean, then? Bunter can tell you, as he's read it, sneered Price. It was a letter from Walsingham, the butler here, if you don't know already. That doesn't make sense. How could Bunter hold that over Hilton's head? A letter from his father's butler. Price shrugged his shoulders. We had some bad luck towards the end of the term, he said. Hilton tried to borrow money from Walsingham, as he'd done before. That was in the butler's letter, a mention of other things, debts and things, which Cedric would have to explain to the head if it all came out. If Dr. Locke saw that letter it might mean the sack for Hilton, and most likely I should be dragged into it too. That's what that fat scoundrel was trading on. Oh, Gusp Wharton. Bob Cherry clenched his hands. His eyes were blazing. You rotter. Oh, you rotter, Price. You're saying that Bunter was practically blackmailing Hilton, and you fancied that we had a hand in it. What was a fellow to think? Sneered Price. I'm not sure yet. I'll make you sure you care, said Bob between his teeth. And he rushed at Price, hitting out right and left. Price's hands flew up in defense, but fifth form man and senior as he was, he backed away, driven headlong before the attack of the angry and indignant junior. For nearly a minute there was a fierce scrap in the billiards room of Hilton Hall, and then Stephen Price went down with a crash, Bob's eyes gleaming down at him. Get up, you cur. Get up and have some more. But Price of the fifth seemed to prefer the floor. He remained where he was, gasping and panting. Leaving him there, the famous five gathered round Billy Bunter and watched him out of the billiards room. At the ninth chapter, bad for Bunter, I say, you fellows. Billy Bunter blinked uneasily at the chums of the remove. Without a word, they had marched him upstairs to Wharton's room. Bunter was glad enough to get away from Price. So far as that went. But though the famous five had rescued him from Price, he was feeling very uneasy. He could not help suspecting that they had brought him there to deal with him quietly. How they were going to deal with him was rather a painful question to Bunter. Otten closed the door. With grim faces, the chums of the remove fixed their eyes on the alarmed owl. I, I say, stammered Bunter. Now we want the truth. Said Wharton quietly, you've got a letter belonging to Hilton of the Fifth, 
Oh, really, Wharton? Where is it? I, I, I've lost it. Gus Bunter will help you find it again, said Bob Cherry grimly. Oh, really, Cherry? There's something in that letter that Hilton would be afraid for the headmaster of Greyfriars to see. Asked Harry. Bunter grinned. Well, he naturally wouldn't want the head to know that. Don't tell us what's in it, you fat rotter. Answer my question. Yes, grunted Bunter, about his debts, and... That's enough. You found the letter, and read it, and kept it. That's the sort of thing you would do, I suppose. And you made Hilton ask you here for Christmas, and the strength of it. Well, look how you follows let me down for Christmas, said Bunter indignantly. Mowley too, and Smithy, and Toddy, let down all round, and you made him ask us. Well, naturally, I wanted my pals with me, said Bunter. I think you might thank a chap getting you invited to a magnificent place like this. There's such a thing as gratitude. You, you, you unspeakable idiot. Gusp Wharton, do you think we'd have come within fifty miles of the place if we'd known? Bunter grinned again. Well, one knew you were fussy, he said. I told Hilton that you were fussy and that he would have to put it nicely. He did, didn't he? Hilton can't have imagined that we knew anything about it, said Nugent. He's not a suspicious rotter like Price. Oh, that's all right, old fellows, said Bunter cheerfully. Hilton knew you never knew anything. I know you wouldn't come if you knew. I explained to him that you were fussy. Oh, kill him, growled Johnny Ball. That's what you call gratitude, I suppose, said Bunter. I've stood you a splendid Christmas holiday when you were let down by your own people. Haven't you had a jolly good time here? Yes, you fat idiot, said Bob. But if we'd known, well, as you never knew, that's all right, said Bunter. You see, I wanted my old Pauls with me. I don't mean that I wanted to borrow your clothes and things, though I suppose a fellow can borrow a shirt or a pair of trousers or a necktie from a pal. As for the few small sums you may have lent me during the holidays, you know perfectly well that I'm going to settle up every shilling as soon as I receive some postal orders I'm expecting. The famous five gazed at him. Why Bunter wanted their company at Hilton Hall during the halls was hardly a secret. Bunter was not in a financial position to travel on his own. When Bunter had any money, it always went the same way. Untuck. Friends with cash in their pockets were absolutely essential to Bunter when he was on his travels. All that was nothing new. They knew their Bunter and expected it of him. But the way in which he had wangled that invitation to Hilton Hall came as a surprise to the chums of the remove. There was one thing to be said in favor of the unscrupulous young rascal. He was too utterly obtuse to realize that wrongdoing was wrong. Even now that they had found him out, he did not seem to realize that there was any cause for wrath. He blinked round at their grim faces. I hope you fellows ain't going to cut up rusty when we're getting such a jolly good time here, he said. I hope you're not going to be fussy. Wharton drew a deep breath. We've got to see Hilton at once, you fellows, he said. We can walk over to the railway station with our bags. We won't trouble him for a car. The sooner we get out, the better. What ho, said Johnny Ball. Bunter stayed. You're not going. He ejaculated, you fat frousy owl, do you think we shall stay another minute here now? We know why Hilton asked us. Roared Bob Cherry, why not? The grub's good, warrant jolly good. Said Bunter warmly, I've never been in a show where the grub was better. Lots of it too, well the grub's all right. So everything's all right. As for Hilton, he can't boot you out, he durrant. Price can't do anything. So what are you worrying about? Harry Wharton burst into an angry laugh. It's not much use telling you what we're worrying about. Bunter, he said. Never mind that. We're going at once, and Hilton can explain it to his father how he likes. That's up to him, 
after the rotten trick he's played by asking us here. And you're going to hand me that letter to give Hilton? I'm jolly well not. Roared Bunter. Why, Hilton would kick me out if he got hold of it. More power to his giddy elbow, said Bob. Hand it over, you fat freak. Snap, Wharton, shan't. Howled the fat owl of the remove. All very well for you fellows. Hilton seems to want you here. He doesn't want me. He would give me the boot. I can jolly well tell you. Will you hand over that letter? No, mind your own business. Snorted Bunter. I got you a splendid holiday here. You're ungrateful. Well, if you want to clear, clear, and be blowed. I'm not going, and I can jolly well say. Yaroop, leg of my neck. Where's that letter? Oh, Lego. Wow, I, I haven't got it. There, there never was a letter, really. I never picked it up in the quad at school, and it wasn't from Walsingham, and there was nothing in it about Hilton owing money, and I say, yo oh, oh, oh wow, if you don't stop shook shook shaking me, you beast, you'll make my giggy glasses fall off, and if they get bubba broken, you'll have to pip pip pip. Shake, shake, shake. Pippi pay for them. Gus Bunter, I say, I never had any letter, and I've lost it too, and, and I gave it back to Hilton this morning. Honest in John, I, I hope you can take my word. Bang his head on the wall, suggested Johnny Ball. Hard. Good egg. I say, you fellows, you're worse than price. I say, whoop. Bang, Yaruo. Bang, bang. Oh. Beast, stop it, I say, you fellows, if you're going, it's time you started. There's a train from Blackmore at, you hoo hoo, oop, bang, oh crikey, I say, I'll get the letter. Gus Bunter, Lego, oh lor my napper, wow, it's in my room, wow. Come on, then, you fellows needn't come, I, I'll go and fetch it, I, I'll come straight back with it, of course. Take his other arm, Bob. Beast. With Wharton holding one arm and Bob Cherry the other, Bunter was marched into the corridor, the rest of the company. Following, he was marched into his own room. Now, shop. Snap, Wharton. I, I say, I, I forgot where I put it. Gasp, Bunter. Kick him. Yaro, keep off, you beast. I'm getting it, ain't I? Howled Bunter. He disinterred a crumpled cup from under the big cushion in the seat of an armchair. I say, you fellows, you might mind your own business. It's nothing to do with you. Not if you hadn't landed us here, you fat rotter, said Wharton. Now it is our business, and we're seeing to it. Where's the letter? Now, now I come to think of it, I, I left it at Greyfriars, whoop. If you kick me again, you beast, I'll yarrow up. I'm getting it as fast as I can, shrieked Bunter. He jerked open the lining of the cup, which he had pinned over the hidden letter. Wharton jerked the letter from his hand. A glance at it showed that it began Dear Master Cedric, and that it was signed Francis Walsingham. That was all it was necessary to see. It was the right letter. Wharton crumpled it in his pocket. The famous five walked out of Bunter's room, leaving the fat owl blinking after them with a blink of indignant wrath that almost cracked his spectacles. Time and again Price of the Fifth had attempted to get hold of that letter, and failed. But Bunter had lost it now. The power was gone from his fat hands. It did not look as if Bunter's stay at Hilton Hall would last till the end of the holidays. Beast, groaned Bunter. Harry Wharton and company went downstairs and out of the house. They were going to find Hilton, tell him what they thought of him, throw the letter in his face, and then shake the dust of Hilton Hall from their feet forever. The tenth chapter. Hand to hand, Hilton of the fifth paused in a frosty ride in the park to light a cigarette. He was looking for the party who were hunting through the park for the man from Blackmore, but he had not fallen in with them yet. Several times, and the wind that swept over the moors, the bay of the bloodhound had been wafted to his ears. The hunt was still going on in the extensive park, but it had drawn to a long distance from the house. 
Having lighted his cigarette, Hilton strolled on with his hands in the pockets of his overcoat, listening for sounds to guide him through the wood towards Inspector Trevely and his party. But the bay of the hound, when he heard it again, was far away, hardly heard from the distance. He walked on under the leafless, frosty branches of trees that extended and joined over the ride. Always careless, he was not on his guard. But had he been wary, he would hardly have looked up into the branches overhead for an enemy. He did not dream that from the branches of a beach beside the ride, a pair of fierce, sunken eyes watched him as he came sauntering along. Convict no. 33 breathed hard and shut his teeth at the sight of the handsome, elegant, well-dressed fifth former of Greyfriars, lurking in the dense pot the fugitive ruffian had heard, again and again, the bay of the seeking hound, and he had taken to the trees as a last chance of throwing the bloodhound off the scent, clambering from branch to branch of the closely packed elms, oaks, and beaches, it seemed that he had succeeded for the time, at least, for the hunt was now a good half mile from him, but it was only a respite. Escape seemed as hopeless as ever. Since he had received no further assistance from Walsingham, the convict's case had become absolutely desperate. Walsingham, if the butler could be forced by appeals or threats to aid him again, was his only hope. That was why he was there. But the chance was a desperate one, with the police and warders in the park, and the bloodhound baying on his trail, and the whole household watchful and alarmed. The sight of Hilton gave him a gleam of hope. With a change of clothes and money in his pockets, he had a chance of getting away from the moors. He was a slightly built man, hardly as sturdy in build as the fifth former of Greyfriars. It would be easy enough to weigh Hilton's clothes, if he could get them, and the Greyfriars senior looked as if he had money in his pockets. Convict no. 3.3 breathed hard and deep. His gleaming glance shot watchfully round him like that of a hunted beast. There was no one in sight, no one at hand. The manhunters were far away, and there was no sign of anyone following Hilton from the mansion, and the Greyfriars senior, utterly unconscious of danger, was walking directly under the branches of the beach. It was such a chance as the hunted man had hoped for, longed for, but never dreamed of getting. He swung himself out on a branch to drop into the puff below. Once his grip was on Hilton, the rest was easy. He was ready to beat the Greyfriars fellow into insensibility to prevent him from giving the alarm when he left him, after robbing him of clothes and money. In his present desperate straits there was little at which convict now. 33 was likely to hesitate. With a sudden spring he landed in the ride from the branch, only a low feet from Hilton. What the deuce? Hilton jumped back with a gasp of astonishment and alarm, the cigarette falling from his lips. He was no coward, but his face went white as he recognized the tattered, muddy, haggard figure of the convict and realized that he was alone in the lonely park with a man who was utterly desperate. Before he could decide what to do, before he could even think, the convict was on him with the leap of a tiger. By luck, more than design, Cedric Hilton warded a fierce blow, and the next moment, he was struggling with a convict. Hilton was slim and elegant, but he was by no means a weakling, and he had pluck. He had struggled manfully in that fierce grip, but the convict was stronger, and desperation lent him an added strength. Hilton reeled and staggered in his grasp. Help! He shouted. He was able to shout only once. Then he was down on his back on the hard, frosty ground, the convict over him. A fierce grip on his throat choked back the cry he would have uttered. The convict's eyes burned down at him like a wild animal's, with his left hand gripping the Greyfriars Senior's throat. To keep him silent, convict no. 33 drew back his right, clenched hard. Hilton struggled frantically. He knew that a crushing blow was coming. A blow that, if it landed, would stun him. That was the ruffian's intention. With a desperate effort he twisted his head aside as that savage blow came down, 
and it missed him, the clenched knuckles thudding on the frosty ground. There was a howl of pain from the convict, his knuckles were bopped, his hand almost numbed. Hilton, for a moment, had a chance. He almost succeeded in throwing the man off, and the grip relaxed from his throat. Help! shrieked Hilton. His voice came hoarse, husky, choked, but it rang through the frozen trees of the park. There was no chance of his wild cry reaching the ears of the men with the bloodhound. They were too far away, but someone else might be in the park. A keeper, perhaps. Help! A second time he shrieked, and then far grasp of the savage ruffian was on his throat again, choking him into silence. Crush came a knuckly fist, landing on his forehead and dazing him, but he still struggled gamely. There was a patter of feet on the ride. Five fellows came into sight from the direction of the mansion, running. Harry Wharton and co., looking for Hilton of the fifth in the pock, had heard his desperate cry. Hilton neither saw nor heard them. His senses were swimming. The patter of their running feet was soft on the snow that lay in the ride. The convict, his glittering eyes fixed on the Greyfriars Senior, was unaware of their coming. His brawny fist was drawn back for another blow, a blow which, if it had landed, would have stunned Hilton, if it had not done still more serious injury. But that blow did not fall. Harry Wharton and co., as they saw what was happening on the ride ahead of them, put on a desperate spurt. Wharton reached the convict just as the savage blow was descending. He plunged headlong, breathlessly, at the ruffian, grasping him, and bearing him back. The convict's fist landed in his ribs, instead of on Hilton's temple, and made him gasp. A snarl of rage broke from the man from Blackmore. He turned on the junior like a tiger, grasped him, and hurled him aside with a strength that Wharton could not resist. The captain of the Greyfriars remove went sprawling on the earth. It would have fared hard with him had not his comrades been at hand. But the company, at the same moment, came up with a rush. Collar him, panted Bob. The convict, snarling, leaped back and back again. The juniors followed him up with clenched fists and blazing eyes. Again be leaped back. Yet he seemed uncertain whether to fly or to attempt to tackle the whole bunch of them. But he seemed to realize the hopelessness of that. And he turned suddenly and ran into the trees with the fleetness of a hunted deer. Nugent ran to Wharton and helped him up. Hurt, old chap. He gasped. Wharton panted. Only a bump. Let's see to Hilton. The convict had vanished in the trees. The chums of the remove gathered round Cedric Hilton. He lay whole stunned on the snow, moaning faintly, his hand to his bruised forehead. They raised him to a sitting position and he leaned heavily, supported by Bob Cherry and Johnny Ball. Far in the distance, the fleeing footsteps of the man from Blackmore died into silence. The eleventh chapter. The vanished convict. You're hurt, Hilton, muttered Harry Wharton. Hilton grinned faintly. He was recovering himself now, though his head was aching terribly, and he was still too exhausted to rise, but he was getting back his breath and his coolness with it. I've had a bit of a thump, he drawled, by God, that blighter had a fist on him like a lump of iron, lucky he never got in a second knock, the juniors had quite forgotten the bitter and angry feelings with which they had been seeking the dandy of the fifth, they were not thinking now of telling him what they thought of him, the sight of the dandy of the fifth struggling in the desperate grip of the convict had quite driven that idea from their minds, now as he sat spent, with his handsome face disfigured by a blackening bruise, their only feeling was one of friendly kindness. The brute was in that tree, said Hilton. By gad, I've had a close shave. He was going to knock me out. Did you hear me yell? Yes, said Harry. I'm glad you were taking a walk just about this time, grinned Hilton. Wharton colored. The fact is, we were looking for you, he said. We asked Walsingham which way you had gone, that was how we came along this path. Had you wanted to see me, said Hilton, anything special? Oh, never mind now, said Harry, his color deepening. Let's get you back to the house. You want that lump seen too? Oh, my head's aching. 
muttered Hilton. Give me a hand up. I think I can totter now. The genius helped him to his feet. He stood unsteadily, his hand pressed to his bruised forehead. He was cool enough now, but he shuddered as he thought of what the result would have been had the convict landed that savage blow from which Wharton had barely saved him. Let's help you, said Bob. Hilton made rather a grimace. The fifth form man did not want to turn up at the house supported by juniors of the remove, but as he started to walk he staggered, and after that he was glad to let Bob and Johnny take his arms and help him along. All right now, he said, as they reached the terrace before Hilton Hall, and he managed to walk on unaided. If you're all right, we'll cut off and let Mr. Trevely know what's happened, said Harry. Do, said Hilton, tell the pater, if he's there, that I'm not hurt. Right-ho, said Wharton, with a smile. Hilton, with an effort, walked on alone, and the famous five turned back. From the other end of the pock, and the wind, came the faint baying of the baffled hound. They had news for Inspector Trevely, which the Oakham Inspector would be glad to hear, and they started off at a rapid trot, guided by the distant baying that came from moment to moment. This rather knocks things on the head, said Bob Cherry, as they trotted along under the frosty trees. I was feeling inclined to punch Hilton's face, but I suppose a fellow can't punch him now. Harry Wharton laughed. Hardly, he said. He's had enough punching, to judge by that lump on his nap. After all, he's been civil to us here, and we may as well be civil when we go. We shall have to get a later train, that's all. I'd rather have liked to stay to see the finish of that convict, said Johnny Ball. Can't be done, though. I can't quite make Hilton out. He seemed to make us welcome enough. But we'll kick Bunter again before we go. Said Nugent. Yes, rather. The kickfulness will be terrific. The juniors kept up a steady speed. From one path they turned into another, and another, and at length sighted the hunters. The bloodhound, with Inspector Trevely, holding the leash, was snuffing at the snow and seemed at a loss. The warders stood by with their rifles under their arms. Sir Gilbert Hilton was tugging at his white moustache. The whole party turned as the juniors came panting up. What do you schoolboys want here? Jerked Inspector Trevely, apparently not greatly pleased by their arrival. News for you, old bean. Grinned Bob Cherry. We've seen your man. Seen him? The inspector was instantly alert. Here, in the pock, about half a mile, lead the way, jerked Mr. Trevely. Tell me as we go along, this way. The convict got hold of Hilton in the pock, said Harry. He's not hurt, sir, he added quickly, as Sir Gilbert uttered an exclamation. Only a bruise or two, and he's gone back to the house. We happened to come along in time. Thank goodness for that said the old baronet. My son, in the hands of that desperate man, he shivered. You are sure, sure that Cedric is not badly hurt? He had a knock, sir, but he told us to tell you he wasn't hurt. He was able to walk in alone, said Harry. We came to bring the news. The convict jumped down on him from a tree. That's how he beat the dog, said Mr. Trevely. But we know that he's here. Only a matter of time now. They hurried on and reached the spot where Hilton had struggled with the convict. The hound strained at the leash, evidently picking up the lost scent again at once. Follow me, said the inspector, as the eager hound tugged him along. The early winter dusk was falling over Hilton Hall and the surrounding moors, but it was still light enough to see the way. Fast on the track of the hunted convict loped the hound, the hunters following. Harry Wharton and company followed on, keen to be in at the finish, if there was a finish, by path and ride and tangled coppice the hunt went on, till at last the trail led in the direction of Hilton Hall. The windows of the stately mansion were lighted now, and they gleamed and glimmered through the thickening dusk when the manhunters emerged from the park. Once more the hound was at a loss. He ran to and fro, snuffing and whining. Mr. Trevely set his lips hard. 
This time he had hoped for success, counted on it. But again the scent was lost, and the hunted man of Blackmore had eluded him. The Oakham inspector stood holding in the hound and staring towards the great facade of Hilton Hall. There was an expression on his face that made the juniors exchange glances as they read it in the dusk. They wondered whether Mr. Trevely was suspecting that the hunted man had a confederate within those stately walls. If so, his suspicions came too late, for the juniors were assured that Walsingham had kept his word and was no longer helping the fugitive. Yet it was strange enough that the trail had led them so near to the hall. He is not far away, I am certain of that, Sir Gilbert, said the Oakham inspector at last. But he shrugged his shoulders, the scent was lost and it was not likely that the skulking convict would be found now that the winter darkness was descending on Blackmore like a cloak. Harry Wharton and company had to give up the idea of being in at the death, and they went in to pack their bags. At the twelfth chapter, Harry Wharton's last word, trickle in, called out Cedric Hilton. There was a tap at the door of his den. In that handsomely appointed apartment the dandy of the Greyfriars' fifth form lay on a sofa before a crackling wood fire, his head resting on down pillows and he had a bandage over his forehead, except for the bandage and a pallor in his cheeks he looked much the same as usual. Price was with him. Lady Hilton had been with her son, but she left when Price came in, for which the cad of Greyfriars was duly thankful as it enabled him to light a cigarette. Hilton told him what had happened, Price listening, with a faint sneer on his face. No end heroic of the fags, he drawled. Oh, chuck it, said Hilton, with an unusual sharpness. What a fellow you are for sneering, Pricey. That brute might have cracked my skull if the fags hadn't come up and I can jolly well tell you that I don't believe you would have jumped right at that ruffian, as young Wharton did, so you can put that in your pipe and smoke it. Price shrugged his thin shoulders. The tap at the door interrupted him as he was about to reply, and Harry Wharton came in. Hilton gave him a cheery smile. Oh, you kid, he said. Take a pew. Nice of you to look in on the interest in invalid. Chuck that smoke away. Pricey, rot, said Price, and went on smoking. Oh, don't mind me, said Harry, with a glance of contempt at Price. I'm not staying a minute, do, said Hilton. He glanced curiously at the face of the captain of the remove, which was rather set in expression. Nothing up, I hope, kid. Well, yes, said Harry. We're going. Hilton gave a start and sat upright in his surprise. The movement brought a pang of pain to his damaged head, and he uttered a sharp yelp, oh. Better keep still, with that lump on your napper, Cedric. Yawned Price. Have a cigarette, old chap. Hilton did not heed him. His eyes were on Morton. Did you say you were going? He asked. Yes. Isn't that rather sudden? Asked Hilton. Of course, you're free to do as you like but I thought you were slaying on till near the end of the vac. If you mean that something's happened to upset you, gave it a name. Has Price. It isn't Price, said Harry. Well, what is it? Hilton spoke rather sharply. I've done my best so far as I know, and I don't think the pater and mater have been wanting in hospitality. If you've taken offense at something, give it a name. Getting a bit alarmed about the convict, perhaps suggested Price. Oh, don't be an ass, Pricey, said Hilton irritably. Look here, Wharton, explain yourself, and don't be a young ass. I'll explain, if you like, said Harry. We know now why we were asked here, and that's enough for us. That fat fool, Bunter, doesn't need to be wanted or made welcome when he bodges into a fellow's place, but I think you might have known Hilton that it wasn't quite like that with us. I don't see. I shouldn't have seen you before we left. Only I've got something that belongs to you, and that I must give you, said Harry. He drew the crumpled letter from his pocket and tossed it on the sofa beside Hilton. That's yours. What the merry deuce? ejaculated Hilton, in astonishment. 
He made no motion to take up the letter, but Price, with a very strange and startled expression on his face, pounced on it. By gum, Price's eyes sparkled with excitement as B grabbed it up. Cedric, it's the letter. What letter? Snapped Hilton. Walsingham's, what, the one that the butler wrote you at the school? The one you lost? And that fat rascal bunter found, gasped Price. Look at it. He held the letter up before Hilton's face, and the dandy of the fifth stayed at it blankly. Good gad, he exclaimed. The letter, oh, good luck, exclaimed Price. It's the letter, right enough. He gave the captain of the remove a glance. You've read this, of course. Orton's lip curled. I had to look at it to make sure that it was the right letter when I took it from Bunter Hilton, he said. I saw your name on it, and Walsingham's signature. I saw no more than that, whatever that cad may think. Who shut up, Pricey? said Hilton. Oh, let him run on, said Wharton contemptuously. I'm quite indifferent to the opinion of a run cow tider and rotter. Price laughed. Hot words break no bounds, he said. We've got the letter. That's the letter that Bunter has been holding over your head, Cedric. The letter that might have got you sucked from Greyfriars, if the head had seen it. And me too, perhaps. We've got it. Chuck it in the fire, said Hilton. Right ho. Price crumpled the letter in his hand and tossed it into the heart of the glowing logs. It flamed and was consumed in a moment. Price's narrow eyes danced. He was greatly elated. That danger was over. The danger of being up before the head of Greyfriars next term. That had been a very real danger if the letter had remained in existence. In the hands of the fat and fatuous owl of the remove. All his attempts to snuffle it at Hilton Hall had failed. And he had given up hope of success. Now it had ceased to exist. Cedric Hilton drew a deep breath of relief. He had not worried about that telltale letter so much as Price had. His nature was too easygoing and careless for that. But it was a weight off his mind to see it disappear into fluffy ash in the fire. Thanks, Wharton, he said. You've done me a good turn. Wharton stepped back. You might have guessed what we should do, if we knew how matters stood. He answered curtly. There's no more to say. Goodbye. Hold on. There's a lot more to say said Hilton. First of all, I want to know how you knew anything about that letter at all. I'm quite certain that Bunter never let you know. Orton shrugged his shoulders. You can ask Price that, he said. Hilton gave his pal a rather dark look. I warned you to say nothing to those fags, Pricey. I told you they knew nothing of Bunter's rotten trickery, and warned you. I know that, but I'm glad I did. As it's turned out, said Price coolly, I believed that they were hand in glove with the fat scoundrel. You would, said Wharton disdainfully. I admit now that I was mistaken, said Price. But I had to let it out, Cedric, when they came on me this afternoon in the billiards room, handling Bunter. I was going to get the letter off him if I could. And they, it was a good thing that Price let it out, said Harry. It let us know where we stood. As soon as we knew, we made Bunter give up the letter, as Price would have guessed if he hadn't been a howling cad himself. Thanks, said Price, laughing. You've acted rottenly to us, Hilton. Went on Wharton, with a tremor in his voice and a gleam in his eyes. You asked us here, and we took it in good faith. You'd no right to treat us like that. I don't see it said Hilton, flushing. I let that fat young rotter, Bunter, come here because he had that hold over me. I don't see what else I could have done in the circumstances, but you, Bunter, made you ask us. He wanted fellows here with him for reasons of his own, and he made you ask us. Wharton's eyes flashed. We were all surprised, but we took it at face value, and we came. And now, now we've found out. Oh, it's rotten. You ought to be jolly well ashamed of yourself for treating decent fellows like that. I never meant. No use talking. You're free to act as you like now. The letter's burned, and you're safe, 
said Wharton with bitter scorn. You can turn your guests out as soon as you like, but we're going to save you the trouble. My friends are packing their bags now, and we're going, I tell you. We came to tell you so this afternoon in the pock. Only that convict knocked you out, and we had to put it off. Sorry you were landed with us a couple of hours longer than was necessary, added Wharton, with sarcasm, but we're going now. Look here. Oh, chuck it, Cedric, said Price. Let them clear, and a good riddance to them. I'm sick of them here, if you're not. And shut up, Price, snapped Hilton. Look here, Wharton, listen to me. I, I'm done here, said Harry. And he walked to the door and walked out of the room, shutting the door after him with a snap. Hilton, with a hand to his aching head, stayed after him. Price laughed. Good, he said. If I'd known the young rotters would take it like this, I'd have put them wise before. I'm glad. I, will you shut up? Hissed Hilton. Oh, don't be an ass. Cedric, I suppose you don't want that crew of cheeky fags here. Snarled Price. You can suppose what you like. Hilton rose slowly from the sofa. His head ached, and it seemed to spin as he rose. He put a hand on the sofa to steady himself. Price stared at him angrily. Where are you going? He asked between his teeth. Find out. Look here, Cedric, said Price savagely. If those dashed fags stay here, now we can get rid of them. I don't. If they stay, I go. Please yourself. What? I said please yourself. And Cedric Hilton, with uncertain steps, went to the door, leaving Stephen Price with an expression on his face like unto that of a demon in a pantomime. The thirteenth chapter. To go or not to go. I say, you fellows, get out, shant, howled Bunter. The owl of the removed glade threw his spectacles in great wrath. The famous five were in Wharton's room. The company had packed their bags and had only waited for Wharton to come back after taking the letter to Hilton before they cleared. Wharton was fastening his suitcase. The other fellows were all ready to go, and he was nearly ready. Bunter was not ready. Bunter not going, if he could help it. Bunter, indeed, saw no reason to go. If Hilton... Now that he was safe, kicked him out. He had to go, short of that. The owl of the remove saw no reason whatever for departure from Hilton Hall. Whether Hilton would kick him out was, to Bunter's fat mind, the only question. He glared in great wrath at the chums of the remove. He had concealed the true circumstances from them because he realized that they were fussy. But really, he did not expect sensible fellows to carry fussiness to this extent. I say, you fellows, you're not going, he exclaimed. Yes, you blithering owl. What for? Asked Bunter. Kill him, somebody, said Bob. I mean, has Hilton told you to clear? Asked Bunter. I don't believe he would. I don't see how he can. How's he to explain it to his father? Shut up. Shan't. Look here, I think it's pretty thick. To let me down after I've got you a Christmas holiday in a splendid place like this. Exclaimed Bunter hotly. What about me, fathead? You see, Hilton may turn on me now, owing to the rotten trick you've played on me, bagging that letter and all that, said Bunter. I don't really trust the fellow. He may turn on me. Very likely, I think, grinned Bob. Well, you fellows stand by me, said Bunter. We're pals, ain't we? I can't stay here on my own, you see that. But if we all stick together, we can pull it off. Hilton can't make a row. He couldn't let his father know, could he? We've only got to stick together and stick it. And we're all right till the end of the vac. Don't you see that, idiot? The grub's good, said Bunter. Mean to say that you've got any fault to find with the grub? Ha ha ha. Really, it was not much use trying to explain things to Billy Bunter. Blessed if I see anything to cackle at, said Bunter warmly. I've never had better grub anywhere. Not even at Bunter Court. The turkey. Dry up. And the Christmas pudding. Ring off. And the mince pies. Ready, 
said Harry, rising and picking up his suitcase. We'll carry our bags down. Better get out as quietly as we can. It will be a bit awkward to run into Hilton's people, I say, you fellows. Oh, do shut up, Bunter. Look here, I'm jolly well not coming with you, declared Bunter. You're jolly well not, agreed Johnny Ball. I advise you not to come in reach of my boot, you fat frump, beast. Letting a chap down, said Bunter indignantly. It will be jolly difficult for me to stay and after you're gone. If we all stick together, it will be all right. At least, there's a jolly good chance. But if you let me down like this, I think, said Bob Cherry thoughtfully, that we'd better bump Bunter before we go. He keeps on asking us to, hear, hear. The bumpfulness is the proper caper. I say, you fellows, let go. Roared Bunter, as the famous five grasped him and appended him. Bump. Yaru. Bump. Whoop. Bump. Yaro. East. Lego. Go as soon as you like. Wow. Get out. Oh. Jolly glad to see the last of you. Yaru. Oh. Bump. Oh crikey. There. Gusped Bob Cherry. That will do. If you didn't weigh a blessed ton, we give you another. You who are hoop. Come on, said Harry, and leaving the owl of the remove sitting on the floor, gasping and spluttering, the famous five picked up their bags and went to the door. Hold on, said a quiet voice. An elegant figure with a pale face and a bandaged forehead blocked the doorway. Hilton of the fifth stood there. His face was very pale and his lips set with pain. In his present state even a little exertion told on him. He rested one hand on the doorpost as he stood looking in at the juniors. They stopped. You ask Hilton, said Bob. You oughtn't to be getting about in that state. You'll come a cropper. Your fault, said Hilton, with the ghost of a smile. If the mountain won't come to Mahomet, Mahomet has to come to the mountain. You've got to give me a chance to explain. Nothing to explain said Johnny Ball with a grunt. That fat rotter bunter made you ask us here, and it was rotten of you to do it when you didn't want us. Now we know we're getting out, but suppose I did want you, said Hilton. Oh, rot. Let me explain, said the fifth former. That fat young rascal bunter landed himself on me. He boggin' to bring other fellows with him. If he'd landed me with a crew of his own kidney... I should have felt pretty sick about it. Oh, really, Hilton? Gasped Bunter. Shut up, you fat freak. Growled Johnny, beast. But when I found it was you fellows, it was different, went on Hilton. My pater was glad to hear that you were coming, Wharton. Your uncle is his old war pal. I'm not saying that I'm frightfully keen, as a rule, and lower fourth society, but I was glad to have you here. You were all welcome, though Bunter wasn't. You see, you stand on rather a different footing. I asked you sincerely, I meant what I said. I mean it now. I'm asking you to stay on for the time arranged. I want you to. Can't you take a man's word? The juniors were silent. It was hardly possible to doubt Hilton's sincerity, for Bunter's hold over him was gone now, and he was free to do as he liked. Wash it all out, said Hilton. I'm not surprised that you've got your backs up, but get em down again, see. I shall feel frightfully sick if you clear off like this. I want you to stay on. Isn't that plain enough? Well, yes, said Harry doubtfully. But I say, you fellows, shut up, Bunter. Shrieked Bob, beast. Wash out the butts, said Hilton. Make it a go. And look here, one of you give me an on back to any room. My head splitting, is it a go? The chums of the remove exchange glances. They could see that the dandy of the fifth was in earnest. And they did not want to keep up a state of offended dignity for nothing. The bags plumped on the floor. Hilton smiled. That's right, he said. He leaned heavily on the doorpost, his handsome face very pale. Oh, my napper. Wharton ran to him. Two of the juniors helped Hilton back to his room. The other fellows unpacked the bags. 
Billy Bunter, gasping after his bumping, grinned while he gasped. The famous five had accepted Hilton's earnest and pressing invitation to stay and at the hall. So had Bunter. Hilton had not spoken to him or looked at him, but that did not matter to Bunter. So long as he was not kicked out, Bunter was going to stay. He was not kicked out, so he was going to stay. And he did. The fourteenth chapter struck down midnight. A wild wintry wind wailed over the old red roofs of Hilton Hall and rustled the ancient ivy, ridged with snow. Francis Walsingham, the butler, sat before the fire in his comfortable and well-lighted sitting room and listened to the wind, and perhaps for other sounds. His portly face was dark and troubled. He was thinking of the man who lurked on the moors, or in the frozen pock, the man who had been sentenced to Blackmore Prison under the name of Richard Pike, but whose real name was Richard Walsingham. The younger brother had always been a black sheep. As a valet, he had robbed his master. As a crook, he had gone from bad to worse. Yet it had been a terrible shock to the respectable, middle-aged butler of Hilton Hall to learn that his brother was a convict, that he was serving a sentence in the grim, Stonewalled prison only a mile or two away across the moors. He had not known it till the night of the convict's escape, when the sight of the haggard face at the window had given him the shock of his life. Blood is thicker than water and the butler had helped the wretched fugitive of the moors till Hilton, put wise by the suspicious price, found him out. The secret had been kept only on condition that Walsingham cut the connection on the spot and he had promised. He had kept that promise, hoping that the hunted man would make the most of the chance given him an escape. He had done for him all he could, more than he had had a right to do, but the man had not gone. Why he was lingering in that neighborhood, dangerous for him, the butler could guess. He still hoped, by persuasion or threats, to receive help from the brother he had disgraced and shamed. Walsingham was thinking of him, wondering if he would make some desperate attempt to reopen communication. It would surely mean the finish for him, for the mansion was watched. Police and keepers were abroad in the frosty park. Wild as the winter's night was, it did not cause Inspector Trevely to relax his vigilance. Walsingham sighed. He could have little affection for a relative who had been nothing but a trouble, an anxiety, a shame, and a disgrace to him. Yet he would have been glad to hear that convict no. 33 had got clear away, way where he would never be heard of again. He did not think of going to bed, he could not sleep, knowing that the hunted man was so near. The lights were out in the great mansion at that hour. If any light still burned, blinds and curtains hid it from the outside. The great building lay a black mass in the dark night. Cedric Hilton, in his den, was up late, his aching head banished sleep. Walsingham intended to go up once more before he turned in to see whether he could do anything more for Master Cedric. But he was not thinking of him now. He was thinking of a hunted half-famished, desperate man who lurked in snow and wind and darkness. He gave a sudden start. The door of his bedroom, adjoining his sitting room, opened quietly. Walsingham's eyes fixed, and it in startled surprise, a figure came through. A tattered, haggard figure in torn convict gob. Walsingham sat motionless, his eyes on it. His portly face was deadly pale. The hunted man of Blackmoor was not lurking in wind and darkness. He was within the house. He was here. Richard, articulated Walsingham, at last. He half rose and sank back into his chair again. The convict crept to the fire, stooped, and warmed his chilly hands. His sunken eyes were on the butler, watchfully, warily as a wolf's. Had Walsingham attempted to give the alarm, the desperate man was ready to spring on him, but the portly butler sat as if half-stunned, only gazing at him in horror. You're pleased to see me, Francis, asked the man from Blackmore mockingly. Richard, you hear, breathed Walsingham, here. The convict nodded and grinned. They lost me in the park. I beat the hound by taking to the branches, and then, I knew your window, old man. 
It was locked, but you may remember that I have always had skill with a lock, and I'm here. I've been hiding in your bedroom. Now, I heard the chime of midnight. They're all asleep. Allsingham nodded. He seemed unable to speak. We're safe. Then, another nod. Get me some food. I'm famished. Richard, Walsingham's voice was husky. You cannot stay here. You cannot remain a moment. You, will you refuse me food? Walsingham was silent for a long minute. Then slowly he rose from the chair. You shall have food, he said. Then you must go. The convict made no answer to that. He sat down in the armchair that the butler vacated and warmed himself at the fire. In the electric light, his face showed up white, haggard, thin and wolfish, but there was a gleam in his eyes that told of hope. The butler quietly went out of the room. He returned in a few minutes with a tray loaded with viands. It was set at the convict's elbow, and he devoured the food ravenously, locked the door. He muttered over his shoulder. Walsingham turned the key. He stood with a clouded and troubled brow, while the famished man ate and drank. A glow came into the haggard face of the convict. He finished the meal at last. That's better, he said. Now we can talk. You must not remain. Cut that out. I want clothes and money, and then you will see the last of me. Once I've got an outfit, I shall take my chance of getting away. By God, I shall be glad to get off the moors. He shuddered. I'd never have taken the chance of getting out of Blackmore. Only I know you were butler here, Francis, and I knew you'd help. I had no right to help you, muttered Walsingham. It was breaking the law, and you never deserved it at my hands, Richard. Now I can help you no further. I have given you food. I could not refuse you that. I can do no more. Go as you came, or, or what? Jeered the convict, or I shall give the alarm. Said Walsingham firmly, I will not betray my master's trust in me, I will not break my word to his son, and I will not break the law to help a man who deserved every day of his sentence, and more. I can do nothing more for you, Richard. I have done too much already. Go. There are clothes in your room, I think, said Richard. If you do not help me, I can help myself, but money, I have none. Said Walsingham, I do not keep money here, Richard. A few pounds, perhaps. A hundred would see me through. You are talking folly. Go while there is yet time. The convict tied him. You were always a fool, Francis. He said, you've thrown away all your chances. I dare say you feathered your nest in your own way. A few hundreds in the bank, what? I have five hundred pounds in the bank, Richard said Walsingham quietly, every shilling of it earned faithful service. If you can escape abroad and send me word, I will send it to you all to give you a chance to make a start in an honest life. Here I cannot help you. In Sir Gilbert's safe there is probably ten times as much. Silence. Let me speak. Listen, you fool. The convict bent forward with an eager face. Can't you see your chance? I've a master's hand on a safe. With your help, without, it, if you keep quiet, I can crack the safe. And silence, I say. Whatever there is, I share with you. All the blame can be laid on me. It will be known that convict no. Thirty-three did the trick. No one will dream of suspecting you. You will keep your place unsuspected. Safe with a few thousands. Walsingham walked to the window and unfastened it. The convict's eyes followed him savagely. What are you going to do? He hissed. Villain and rascal, answered the butler in a choking voice. I give you one minute to go. Then I shall alarm the house. I repent now that I ever gave you a helping hand. You are too vile to help. He threw open the casement. Go. Go while there is yet time, fool. I tell you, you have less than one minute. Then call for help. Said Walsingham, fool, fool, silence. The convict ran to the window. Walsingham stepped aside for him to clamber out over the low sill. Quick as a flash, the ruffian turned on him 
his clenched fist dashing out. The blow took the butler by surprise. It crushed on his temple, sending him headlong to the floor. Instantly, the convict shot the window, drew the blinds across it, and turned to the fallen man. His clenched fist was ready for another blow, if it had been needed. But the butler of Hilton Hall lay senseless at his feet. The 15th chapter. Getting America, you kid sleepy, asked Hilton with a smile. Not a bit, said Wharton. It's late. You have to sit up late to hear America, said Bob. Owing to the difference in time many beloved eras, it can't be helped. Bob was sitting at the electric wireless in Hilton's den. He was turning knobs and listening to silence. Hilton laughed. His bandaged head was still aching, and he was not in the least inclined for sleep. The famous five were sitting up with him. Bob Cherry had an idea of getting America on the wireless, which was quite an interesting proposition to the chums of the remove. Generally, the chums kept early hours in holiday time, as at school. Still, holes were holes, after all, and a fellow could stretch a point occasionally, and America could not be got before midnight, when the air was clear. Hilton of the Fifth was quite aware, however, that getting America by itself would not have kept the juniors out of bed till that hour. He was glad of their company, as he did not want to go to bed, and getting America made the sitting up interesting to them. Getting America, or sitting up with a fellow who had been knocked out, did not interest Billy Bunter. Bunter had gone to bed. Fortunately, nobody missed Bunter. In fact, he could not have done the other fellows. A better turn, Bunter was snoring in his room, his deep snore the only sound within the great building. There would be more sounds when America was got. But America was not got yet. Price would have been willing to sit up with his pal, with cigarettes and banker or nap as an accompaniment. But in his present state, neither cigarettes nor cards appealed to Hilton. So Price had gone off sulkily to bed and was missed no more than Billy Bunter. Hilton found the company of the five cheery juniors quite grateful and comforting. Lying on the sofa, with his head resting on a down cushion, Cedric Hilton was as comfortable as his aching head permitted him to be. And Harry Wharton and co., though perhaps a little sleepy, were quite merry and bright. On both sides, host and guests were anxious to wash out remembrance of disagreement, and they had had quite a cheerful hour or two with the wireless, till midnight chimed, and then Bob started for America. The chums of the remove had their own wireless at home, but nothing like Hilton's expensive and magnificent set. A Christmas present from his father, and the best radiogram that Cash could buy, Bob, who was very keen on the subject, just reveled in that wonderful set. Hello, 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 something's coming, said Bob. Squeak, squeak, squeak. Morse, said Harry, laughing. Well, Morse is rather interesting when you understand it, said Bob. It's jolly useful to be able to read Morse, you follows. Useful, but not what you call musical, said Johnny Ball. Shut his off. For goodness sake, Bob twiddled dials. Got it on the right station, asked Nugent. Well, it's TH Cincinnati station I'm after, said Bob. America can't be discovered without some trouble, said Hilton gravely. Look what a job Columbus had. The juniors laughed. Can I help? Asked Johnny Ball, getting up. Yes, old chap, there's something you can do, answered Bob. Well, what? Put some logs on the fire. It's going down, fat head. Johnny Ball dropped logs on the fire in the wide old grate, and a myriad of sparks leaped up. Bob Cherry cocked his ear to listen, but there was still no sound from America. Cincinnati seemed coy. Keep the fire going, remarked Bob. We shall be like that chap who sat up late to get Peru. What happened to him? Asked Hilton. The fire went out, and he got chilly explained Bob. I don't see how he got chilly if he couldn't get through, said Johnny Ball with a stare. And what difference did the fire going out make? Chilly. Hooted Bob. Chilly, chilly. He got chilly because the fire went out. Ha ha ha.
Oh, it's a joke, said Johnny, after some reflection, I see, and after a little further reflection he laughed. Ha ha, hallo hallo hallo, here it comes, exclaimed Bob, strains of music came through, Bob's yes gleamed with the light of success, this was the first time he had got America, his set at home was not equal to the strain, the twiddle of a violin came clearly through, by Jove that's plain, said Hilton, sitting up, it won't wake the house, asked Bob, thinking of that rather late in the day, as it were, hardly, doors and walls are thick in this old place, said Hilton, and we're a good distance from the other rooms, that's all right, sure that's coming from America, where else could it be coming from, said Bob confidently, it's America all right, we've got America at last, you men, fancy that coming all the way across the jolly old Atlantic, what, fine, said Harry, the fineness is terrifically preposterous, my esteemed Bob, said Harry Jumpset Rum Singh, listen, murmured Bob, when the piece is over, we shall hear a voice, listen for a gent talking through his nose, and guessing and calculating, the juniors listened, very keen to hear a voice proceeding from the United States, even if it talked through a nose, and guessed and calculated, the piece ended, and a voice came through, vous avez intendu, what the thump, ejaculated Bob, ha ha ha, roared the juniors, that wasn't America, ha ha ha, you've got a French station, chuckled Hilton, the expression on Bob's face made his comrades howl, he had been confident that he had got America, instead of which he had evidently picked up a belated French station a few hundred miles away, the silly ass, Booted Bob, with a red face, and he twirled a knob, cutting off the further remarks of the unknown French gentleman. Bother him, it's time they shot down over there. Ha ha ha, nothing to cackle at, you fatheads. I'm going to get America or bust. Go it, said Hilton, laughing. That is, if you don't want to go to bed, Hilton, added Bob, considerately. No fear, I can't sleep with this napper. You'll forget that when you hear America, said Bob, frightfully interesting to hear America, old bean, listen, squeak, 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 that rotten morse again, remorse, said Johnny Ball, who sometimes made a joke, that's the second time, so it's remorse, remorse for disappointing you, old bean, kill him, somebody, said Bob, we shan't be long now, you fellows, we're simply bound to get America. Any of you men getting hungry? Asked Hilton. You want another supper staying up as late as this? I thought Walsingham was coming up again, or I'd have had something here, but I suppose he's forgotten and gone to bed. The junior smiled. They had supped long ago, and not so heftily as Billy Bunter. Sitting up late, they realized that a certain inward emptiness was making it all felt. I'll go down, said Hilton. You won't, said Bob, getting up. You keen your old napper quiet. I'll go down, if you like. I know my way about. Lots of stuff in the sideboard in the dining room, said Hilton. Cakes and biscuits and candied fruits, if that will do. The pantry will be locked up now, but I could call Walsingham. Let him snore, said Bob. I'll go down and snuffle something from the dining room. You come and help me carry the plunder, Wharton. Bunter would be sorry he'd gone to bed if he dreamed what was on. Ha ha ha. I'll leave the wireless on 428 meters, added Bob. It may start any minute now. Leaving the wireless all ready for America. If America made up its mind to come through, Bob went out of the den with Wharton. He turned on a little pocket flash lamp and the two juniors softly and silently descended the stairs. They did not want to wake anybody up, at past half past twelve at night, and they tiptoed their way down by a glimmer of light. The sixteenth chapter. Caught, convict now. Thirty-three bent over the insensible butler, breathing hard. Walsingham stirred, and moaned faintly. A savage grin came over the convict's hard face. In a few minutes... The butler would return to consciousness. No. 
33 did not lose those few minutes. He snapped a blind cord and bound the butler hand and foot, knotting the cord with savage tightness. Then he forced open Walsingham's mouth and jammed a handkerchief into it. He tied it there safely, and the butler lay bound and gagged when his eyes opened dizzily. He stayed up at the convict. No. 33 of Blackmore grinned down at him. My turn now, Francis, he said. Lie there, you fool. Lie there and tell what story you like when you are found tomorrow. I shall be far enough away by then. Walsingham could not speak. He could not stir. He could only gaze at the desperate rascal, and the dumb appeal in his look had no effect on convict no. 33. Walsingham knew only too well what the rascal intended doing. A complete change of clothes, and convict no. 33 was going, but he was not going empty-handed. He needed money for his flight. And Sir Gilbert Hilton was a rich man. He bent over the butler. Where is the safe? In the library. He whispered the words. Nod your head for yes. There was no sign from Walsingham. The convict gave him a black and bitter look. Then he shrugged his shoulders contemptuously. I shall find it easily enough. I have the night before me. Fool. Did you think I should go with empty hands and empty pockets? Fool. I have a cunning hand with a safe, Francis, and the kind of safe they have here will not give me much trouble. I would undertake to open it with a cun opener. He laughed, showing his teeth. Wish me luck, Francis. By the time they find you here, tied up like a turkey, I shall be far away. Blackmore has seen the last of me. Walsingham made a frantic effort to speak, but he could utter no sound. The convict laughed again and went to the window, where he stood listening for some moments. Only the wild wind could be heard from without, but he knew, as Walsingham knew, that the frozen pot was still being combed for him. His pursuers were not far away. He still had to take his chance when he crept away from Hilton Hall like a thief in the night. But he was prepared for that. In the black darkness he would elude the manhunters, and once he was off the moor, once he was away from men who knew his face, there was nothing about him to excite suspicion. He could hire a car, the way of escape was open, only he needed money for his flight, and money was to be had for the taking. He crossed to the door, switched off the light, and stepped softly out of the butler's room, leaving the bound man in darkness. Shutting the door quietly after him, he crept softly away. In his hand was an electric torch he had taken from Walsingham's room, and he turned on a tiny beam of light. The interior of the great house was strange to him, but the crook who had been sentenced to seven years at Blackmore had been accustomed to finding his way about strange houses at strange hours. He had no doubt of finding the safe, of cracking it when found, of stuffing the pockets of his stolen clothes with stolen money. The whole thing was easy. It was half past twelve. All were sleeping. He had hours before him if he wanted them. Nothing could have been easier. He tiptoed in the great oak called hall with watchful eyes. He looked into room after room. The safe was most likely in the library or in Sir Gilbert's study. He had to find out. He swung open a great oak door which led into the vast dining room of Hilton Hall. He stepped in and stayed about him. A glance was enough. That was not the room he wanted. He stepped out again, pulling the door softly shut after him. As he did so, a faint sound of footfalls fell on his ears. Footfalls on the stays. Instantly he shut off the torch. He stood crouched back against the door he had just closed, his heart beating in throbs. A light gleamed on the staircase. Someone was coming down. More than one. One of them was carrying a pocket flash lamp. He caught the gleam of the light and glimpsed two shadowy forms. His lips were drawn back from his shut teeth in a snow like that of a cornered wolf. Who, at that hour, why? The light gleamed over the oaken banisters. It gleamed on a white, fierce, desperate face, staring up with glittering eyes, and the lamp nearly fell from Bob Cherry's hand. Hello. Hello, hello, yelled Bob. 
The convict? What? Gasped Wharton. Look, I saw him. I'd know his face anywhere. Look, roared Bob Cherry. Look. His light was directed full on the desperate face below. Orton gave one startled stare, and then jumped to the staircase switch and turned it on. Instantly, the hall was flooded with light. The convict, collar him, help, roared Wharton. The desperate man below was running. He was not thinking of the safe now. He dashed to the door, but the door was bolted and barred. He turned desperate, mad with rage, as the two juniors rushed at him. Help, yelled Bob. His powerful voice rang through the house, and as he yelled, he held himself a convict now. 33. Wharton's grasp was on the rascal at the same moment, and like the wild beast he was, the convict struggled and fought and scratched and tore, while on all sides came calling voices, flashing lights, hurried footsteps, the sounds of a suddenly awakened household, the 17th chapter, the last of convict now. 88. Help. Hilton leaped to his feet. Help. What? He exclaimed. That's Bob, panted Nugent. And Wharton, what the thump? Come on, you fellows. What had happened downstairs in the dock the juniors had no idea. But that yell for help, ringing through the house, was enough for them. They dashed out of Hilton's den and tore down the stays. Hilton of the fifth. Forgetful of his aching head, dashed all to them. The hall below was flooded with light. Three figures were rolling on the polished floor in a desperate struggle. It was well for Wharton and Bob that their comrades were up and awake and came so swiftly to their aid. The convict, fighting like a wild animal, was hard to hold, and he would probably have got the better of the two schoolboys in a few minutes. But it was in hardly one minute after the first call for help that Nugent and Johnny Ball and Hurry Jumpset Run Singh came racing clown the stays. They held themselves into the fray. Hilton was only a few moments behind them. Then he lent his aid also, though there were so many hands on convict now. Thirty-three now, that there was not much left of him to grab. Bag him, panted Bob. It's the convict, the convict gasped Hilton. Great Pip, we've got him. They had him. There was no doubt about that. Convict no. 33 was still trying to struggle, but each arm and leg was in a firm grasp, and an arm was round his neck. He still strove to escape, but he could only wriggle in so many hands. What is all this, what? Boomed the deep voice of Sir Gilbert Hilton, as he arrived on the scene half-dressed. What? The convict father, gasped Hilton, good God, here, gasped the baronet, hold him, secure him, John Thomas, William, Walsingham, where is Walsingham, call Walsingham, good God, we've got him, sir, hunted Harry Wharton. The gotfulness is terrific, got him safe and sound, gasped Johnny Ball. It's the jolly old convict all right. Yes, rather. Good God. Gasped Sir Gilbert. Here, in my house, while the police are actually watching the building. Open the door, Walsingham. Call them in. Where is Walsingham? Why is he not here? John, call Walsingham at once. Thomas, open the door. The great door of Hilton Hall swung wide, and light blazed out into the winter night. A stocky figure in uniform appeared in the light, staring in. Inspector Trevely had not been far away. Here's your man, old Bean. Called out Bob Cherry. We've got him for you. A New Year's gift. Inspector Trevely trumped in and stayed at the convict in utter wonder. But in less than a second, wondering as he was, he had the handcuffs snapped on the wrists of convict now. Thirty-three. Two prison warders followed him in. They took convict now. Thirty-three by either arm, panting, breathless, the ruffian could only snarl. That's the man. Jerked Inspector Trevely. He's given us a long run, but we've got him at last. Take him away. The man from Blackmore was marched out. Between two warders, 
Outside, others gathered round him, handcuffed, surrounded by his captors, convict no. 3.3 disappeared into the night, on his way back to Blackmore Prison, where the Iron Gates climbed on him, hardly had the door of Hilton Hall closed on the convict, then a startled yell from John the footman drew everyone to the butler's room. John had switched on the light there, revealing Walsingham bound hand and foot on the floor. Walsingham, exclaimed Sir Gilbert, what how Inspector Trevely bent over the butler and removed the gag. Walsingham panted for breath as the Oakham inspector cut the cords that bound his limbs. The convict, he gasped, we've got him, said Mr. Trevely with grim satisfaction. I suppose he fixed you up like this. Yes, yes. Is he? Is he? He's on his way to Blackmore now, with the Dobbies. Um, said Mr. Trevely. He's had his run, but it's over now. Walsingham panted, but said no more. Harry Wharton and co. And Cedric Hilton knew what was in his mind, but his secret was safe with them, and it was safe with convict now. Thirty-three, behind iron bars and stone walls at Blackmore. Listen, exclaimed Bob Cherry. The excitement was over, the household had gone back to bed, and the famous five had gathered in Hilton's den again, coming up with cakes and biscuits and candied fruits for a very late supper, which would have delighted the heart of Billy Bunter had he been there. But Bunter was not there. Bunter was the only occupant of Hilton Hall who had not been awakened. His snore had gone on steadily through the disturbance and was still going on, for which the chums of the remove were duly thankful. The famous five had forgotten the wireless, even Bob, for the moment, had forgotten America. They were discussing the startling happenings of the night, and the capture of the Blackmore convict, when they came aware, and a mutter, and a voice with a nasal twang, that was quite startling. Listen, Bob Cherry dropped his cake. We've got it. What the thump? exclaimed Hilton. America, cheer up, Bob. Oh, my hat. Another French station, asked Johnny Ball. Shut up, Farthead, and listen, hooted Bob, my esteemed Bob. Shut up, the juniors grinned and shut up. Bob jumped to the wireless, he gloated over it. It was not a European station this time. An announcer's voice, speaking through the announcer's nose, came clearly through through the nose and 3,000 miles of space. It was followed by a burst of music. Hurrah, chuckled Bob. We've got America. He chuckled again. Worth sitting up for, what? Well, we shouldn't have got the convict if we hadn't been sitting up. Oh, blow the convict. We've got America. Chuck that cake away and shut up and listen. Ha ha ha. Evidently Bob was more pleased by getting America than by getting the Blackmore convict. However, the chums of the remove had got both, that eventful night, and they were feeling very satisfied when, at last, they got to bed. The end.